You are now tuned into Then Radio. If you enjoy our videos, we ask that you consider joining our Patreon to support our channel. Don't forget to like and subscribe so that you never miss a new video. We hope you enjoyed today's episode, and as always, thank you for watching. I don't want any trouble from you, here. We got you cold for breaking and entering, and I could put you in jail and keep you there forever if I wanted to. You'd be an awful sorry guy if you did, Sergeant Heath. You coop me up before I get a chance to talk to the district attorney, and you'll be awful unhappy. The district attorney's got nothing to do with this case. You broke into a joint, we caught you, and we're going to send you up. But you did send for Mr. Markham, didn't you, Heath? Yeah, yeah, I sent for him, only he ain't going to be happy being brought down here unless you got a good reason. I got a great reason. Wait till he hears what it is. Hello, Heath. Oh, hi, Mr. Markham. You asked me to come down here. I'm here. Suppose you tell me what this is about. D.A., this punk here, he's Joe Farrell, said he had something hot to tell you. What is it, Farrell? Well, D.A., uh, I uh, want you to go easy on me on a kind of, uh, I got a trade to make. What kind of a trade? I don't like crowds, D.A. This room is uh, too crowded with Heath here. Huh? Uh, ask him maybe if he'd like to hop into the other room for a minute. Okay, okay. But this stooge better have something to say to you. I'll be right next door, Mr. Martin. Thank you, Sergeant. Well, Farrell? Dear, listen. The cops have got me cold on a burglary rap. Okay, I uh, ain't looking to crawl out of that. Only I want him to go as uh, light as possible. I should think you would. I uh, got information I'll hand you if there ain't too much pressure put on me by Heath. We can't make any trades with criminals, Farrell. Although, if you know something that might help us, perhaps the judge might be lenient if you throw yourself on the mercy of the court. Yeah, that's okay by me. Uh, listen, Markham, here's the dope. You know the city museum? Very well. Okay. Well, uh, the museum uh, gets a big shipment from some foreign country. I ain't sure where. Uh, and it comes in this afternoon. It comes from some collector who died and willed the whole thing to the joint. Well? Well, uh, one of the things that the museum is going to get ain't what it seems to be. It uh, looks like something, only it ain't what it looks like. You understand? No, I don't. Uh, okay, I'll hand it to you this way. Uh, there's maybe six or eight things in that collection, uh, mostly statues and stuff. Only there's something about one of the statues. Really? What? I don't know. It's uh, junk as far as I could find out. All I know is this, that there's guys in town that want that statue, and they want it bad enough to kill for it. Come in. Come in, sir. Master, it is here. It is here. Well, talk, man. Talk. Uh, Tell me everything about it. Uh, uh, Mr. Peters, I... I wait in the museum until the crates are open. I see it. I see it with my own eyes. It is here, Master. The Bonji, the idol my tribe worshipped. We will get from the museum, no? Three years I've trailed that statue from one end of the globe to the other. Now it is within reach. The Bonji, sit down, Ringa, sit down. Yes, Master. We make plans to get the Bonji. Careful plans, Ringa. The most careful plans man ever made. This is the high point in my entire life. Understand that. Uh-huh. Nothing must go wrong. We will plan well, carefully, and quickly. It is good. Soon my tribe will be at peace within themselves. Soon I bring back to them the bungee. Tonight, we will get it, Ringai. Right now, I'm sure I'm going to need this. What do you get from the drawer, master? This. Ringai. The Bonji is a thousand years old. Stolen from your country. Yes. I will return this ancient masterpiece to your people, Ringai. But to do that, it is quite possible that I will need this very modern weapon. This automatic...
esto. All day I do nothing but open these crates. I'm supposed to be the curator in this museum, and all day I... What are you doing here? Excuse me, Mr. Jasper. You are Mr. Jasper? Yeah, sure, my name is Jasper. Who are you? What are you doing in the museum? No one's allowed in here at this hour. I've done a lot of things in my life that no one has been allowed to do, Mr. Jasper. My name is Carter, Enid Carter. Well? I want that statue in the corner. That ugly copper thing, the bungee. I'm sorry, it's not for sale. You've got to leave here, Miss Carter. Regulations. I have no interest in regulations. I want that statue, do you understand? It's thousands of years old. It's been worshipped by generations of natives. I must have it for my collection. I'm sorry, Miss Carter. There's nothing I can do for you. I can't sell it to you. It just isn't for sale. And you'll have to leave here now. I've got to get the rest of this stuff uncredited before I can go to bed. And I'm tired. Listen, Mr. Jasper, listen closely. I want that statue, the bondry. I must have it. I'll pay you for it. More money than you've ever seen in your whole life. I don't know why everybody wants the bonji. It's only an ugly piece of copper. Uh, who else wants it? Tell me, man, who else was here asking about the bonji? A fellow named Peters called up on the phone about it a little while ago. You know him? He mustn't have it. Whatever you do, you mustn't sell it to him. Miss Carter, I can't sell it to anybody. It belongs to the museum, and the museum has decided it is not for sale. I don't care what the museum has decided. I'm going to have that statue before Mr. Peters or anyone else gets it. I'm going to have it, and I'd just like to see anyone stand in the way of my getting it. Coming! Coming! Will you stop banging on that door at this hour of the night? Hurry, please, hurry. Well, what is it? What's the idea of waking me up at this hour? You're Mr. Jasper, the curator of this museum? Yes, what about it? You woke me up. Do you realize that? I tried to wake you. I've been banging on the door for 20 minutes. I sleep upstairs. What do you expect me to do? Apologize for not being awake at this time of night? What is it you want? Oh, Mr. Jasper, I'm Maurice Abbott, the art dealer. You know my gallery on Madison Avenue. Yes, well... You have an ugly copper statue here, valueless, except as a relic of native rituals. I want that statue. You mean the Banji? That is correct. I just heard it arrive today, and I came down here to, to make a deal with you. I don't make any deals, Mr. Abbott, and you can't buy the Banji in any event. It isn't for sale, and you're the third person tonight who's tried to buy it. Well, I'll offer you more than they did. I'll top their best Look, bid. please, go away and let me sleep. The bungee is not for sale. At least let me look at it. Let me see it. Go away. Good night, Mr. Abbott. Come around in the morning when the museum will be open. Don't, don't close this door on me. I want to talk to you, Mr. Jasper. Not tonight anymore, you don't. I'm going to bed. Going to bed, you see. Uh, I trust his sleep is not interrupted. <laughs> Hello, Vance speaking. Vance, Markham. Well, hello, Markham. I've been wondering when I'd hear from you. This isn't a social call, Vance. The way I feel about you, Markham, and about your job as district attorney makes it questionable to me whether I prefer your social or professional calls. That's quite complimentary, Vance. Uh. <laughs> Perhaps the purpose of this call might return that compliment. There's been a murder down at the city museum, and we need help. Delighted that you do, Markham. Who was killed? Well, Vance, it seems that a native idol was delivered to the city museum yesterday afternoon. Uh -huh. The curator of the museum, a Mr. Jasper, had reported an art dealer named Abbott unusually interested in it. Yes, go on, Markham. The statue was called the Banji, a small copper figure. Sometime during the night, an art collector named Enid Carter was found murdered near the statue. Enid Carter? Not the social registrite. The same, Vance. She was shot to death. Well... Now, what she was doing there, or who killed her, we don't know. Is there anything about the case the police do know, Markham? Yes. A stool pigeon Sergeant Heath picked up yesterday told me that he knew there would be an attempt to steal one of the pieces in the museum. Really? Well, perhaps Miss Carter interrupted someone's plans, and in the interrupting met her death. Well, that seems reasonable, Vance. Will you meet me at the museum? Will I, Markham? I assure you nothing can keep me from keeping that meeting. <laughs> Come 
come right into this room, please, Mr. Jasper. Mr. Vance would like to talk to you. Yes, Mr. Markham, of course. Hello, Mr. Jasper. Please sit down. Thank you, Mr. Vance. I've been looking over your papers on that shipment that came to this museum yesterday, Mr. Jasper. I think the statues, or rather one statue, has a direct bearing on the death of Miss Carter. Uh, she probably broke in here last night after the museum was closed, Mr. Vance. I know there was no one here when we locked up. How she got in or why, Mr. Jasper, may or may not be important. Uh, Markham, did you ever hear of the Bonji before today? No, Vance, I'm sorry, I didn't. If Mr. Jasper will correct me if I go too far astray. Yes, of course. The Bonji was a native idol stolen from a tribe many years ago. According to these papers which arrived with the Bonji, it is copper, stands three feet high on a base a foot square... It weighs 3,500 pounds. Hmm, rather heavy, I'd say. Copper is quite heavy. Have you anything to add to what I've said, Mr. Jasper? No, I think not. Except that Mr. Abbott, the art dealer, was very insistent on purchasing the bungee. I've already told Vance that. And now, Vance, I know you haven't seen the statue yet, but have you anything to tell us? I think so. I think I can tell you why the bungee was wanted... And in so doing, tell you the reason Miss Carter was killed. You know that, Mr. Vance? Vance, you can't possibly. You haven't even seen the statue or the body. That's true. I didn't look at the body because Sergeant Heath had already examined it. And Sergeant Heath is very thorough. I didn't see the bungee because there was no need to see it. You see, I know that it wasn't copper at all, but solid gold. You know the bungee is gold, Vance. How could you possibly know that? By the weight, Markham. A statue three feet high and one foot square makes three cubic feet of statue. Copper weighs 500 pounds a cubic foot. Then if the bungee were copper, it should weigh 1,500 pounds. That's right. But the bungee weighs 3,500 pounds. Therefore, it isn't copper. Gold weighs approximately two and a half times as much as copper. Hence my deduction. Vance, when will you ever stop astounding me? Never, I hope. <laughs> now let's look at the bungee and see whether... What's that? Shots undoubtedly. Sergeant Heath or his men are shooting at something. Come on, Vance. I'm right with you, Markham. Window firing at something on the outside. Yes, I know. Heath, Sergeant Heath, what's happened? Oh, they got away, DA. Hello, Vance. Hello, Heath. Who was it got away? Search me. Two guys must have been hiding in this joint. Thought they saw a chance to sneak out the window a couple of minutes ago. I spotted them, yelled to them to stop, but they wouldn't, so I fired at them. Did you hit them, Heath? No, I don't think so. I think they made it okay. I saw them get in their car and beat it. Well, things certainly are getting complicated on this case, aren't they, Vance? Quite a bit. Complicated for you, Vance? <laughs> what should I say? Wait till the papers hear about this. Imagine what happens to me when I gotta tell them that Miss Carter's murderers were here, sneaked right out under my nose, and I can't find them. Well, if that's all that's troubling you, Heath, forget it. Huh? When the reporters ask about the shooting, tell them just one thing, and they won't annoy you any further. Huh? What's that one thing? Mr. Markham can probably tell you. Can you, Markham? Why, yes. Only for the life of me, I don't know how you can do it. Uh, Heath, tell the reporters that Philo Vance can produce the two men who just escaped from this museum. Uh, is that right, Vance? Yes, Markham. That is precisely what I want Heath to tell the reporters. This is District Attorney Markham. The idle murder case began before there was a murder. It seems that several people, among them Maurice Abbott, an art dealer, and Enid Carter, wanted the bungee, a native idol supposed to be copper, but which actually is gold. Philo Vance reasoned it was gold, and subsequent tests proved him right. After Miss Carter was found dead, two men were seen fleeing from the museum, and Vance announced that he would produce them despite the fact that he hadn't even seen them. <laughs> Only Vance could possibly make a statement like that. And it is some time later, and he's gone to his office. Vance and his... Read it again, will you please, Miss Deering? What's the matter, Vance? My diction bad or my voice so pleasant you just like to hear it? I'd like to be absolutely certain of what the newspaper says, that's all. No criticism, no compliment. That's my boss. Mm -hmm. Okay, here we go. Just the headline and the subhead will do. Right. It says... Police say Philo Vance can produce mystery men. Subhead. Famous private investigator believed to know identity of two men who fled from city museum in hail of shots. Period. More? No, that ought to be quite sufficient, thank you. Vance, since when have you become mysterious? 
If you knew who those men were, why didn't you tell Mr. Markham? They're probably the same men who killed Miss Carter. Possibly. Well, then why don't you tell who they are? I never said I knew who they were, Miss Deering. I said I could produce them, and I can. In fact, I think they'll produce themselves right here in my office. I'd like to bet they don't. Uh Uh-uh. That's off. It wouldn't surprise me if those were the two men, Miss Deering. Let them in, please. I'll be in my private office. I'll do it. Only I have a hunch I'm going to be sorry. Forgive me, my dear, but uh, this is the office of Philo Vance. Yes, it is. Come in, please. Thank you. Come in, guy. Yes, master. My dear, I must see Mr. Vance. Is he in? He's not only in, but unless I'm mistaken, he's expecting you. Go right into his private office. Go right in. Thank you, my dear. Thank you very much. Oh, it's all quite all right. All part of a day's work. Uh, Wait out here, Ringa. I shan't be long. Yes, master. Hey, you're not going to leave him out here with me. I assure you, my dear, you're quite safe. Wait for me, Ringa. Yes, master. Mr. Vance. Come in, sir. Mr. Vance, you know me, sir? I know who you are. Perhaps the formalities of an introduction might be in order, though. Please sit down. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Mr. Vance, I am Jonathan Peters, world traveler, lecturer. Authority on native art. I know of you, Mr. Peters. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Mr. Vance, according to the newspapers, you knew it was I who was seen fleeing from the city museum early today. I've come to ask you, sir, to implore you not to reveal my identity. You realize that a young lady was murdered in the museum you were seen leaving? I had nothing to do with her death, I assure you, sir. And I have here my personal check made out to you for $25,000. The check would be in lieu of my not revealing your identity to the police. Exactly. For the sake of your conscience, you might know that my friend and I did not kill Miss Carter. We were in the museum to see the Bonji, and then she was shot. But the alarm was sounded so soon. The officer on the street came in so quickly we could not escape. We waited our chance and tried to get out while you were in the museum. Apparently, you saw us. We'll let it go at that. Your story may or may not be correct. But tell me something, Mr. Peters. Do you know the history of the Bonji? Of course I do, sir. It was stolen many years ago from a native tribe. I have pledged to return it to the natives, one of whom accompanied me here. That's the only story you know about it. Precisely, sir. The only one. The fact that it's supposed to be copper but is actually solid gold means nothing to you. You know that, sir? You're a brilliant man, Mr. Vance. I'm brilliant enough to telephone the police and have them take you in, Mr. Peters. Put down that phone, Mr. Vance. Put it down, please, sir. Excellent backing you have for your instructions, Mr. Peters. This gun? Obvious. But like myself, Mr. Vance, purposeful. Helps me get into places and, as now, out of them. Please don't move, sir. I'm sorry to have to leave like this. But before I go, I beg you to reconsider calling the police. Will necessitate a return visit to you from my friend, this gun, and to me. You're a clever man, Mr. Vance. Be a smart one, sir, I beg of you. Do not call the police. Do you deny, Mr. Abbott, that you threatened the museum curator, Mr. Jasper, when he would not sell the bonji to you for your gallery? Well, do you? I have nothing to say, Mr. Markham. You will have something to say, I'm sure, Mr. Abbott. Mr. Jasper here is ready to swear you first tried to bribe him... And then you threatened him when he told you he could not sell you the bonji. Yes, he did. I swear he did, Mr. Markham. Very well, I did try to bribe Jasper here, and I did threaten him. I wanted that statue. No doubt you did, Mr. Abbott. Oh, hello, Vance. Hello, Markham. Mr. Jasper, Mr. Mr. Abbott. Mr. Vance. Well, Markham, we're approaching what in Western moving pictures is generally referred to as a showdown. You see, I know who murdered Miss Carter and why Mr. Abbott's interest in the bungee was so acute. You're not going to frame me for this. You're not... Grab him, Jasper. You're nearest him. I'm coming to help. help. Hold on. Now, Mr. Abbott, I think you'd better be better off sitting down and telling us all about this before Vance does. Feel like talking, Mr. Abbott? No. No, I don't, and I never will. 
Go ahead if you can't prove I killed Enid Carter. I dare you. Try to prove I murdered her. Well, Vance, that's the city museum right ahead of us. Yes, it is. You didn't ask Sergeant Heath and me to come here with you, merely as bodyguards, did you? No, Markham, I didn't. Well, I'm glad of that. I'd like to put this body of mine in a big bed and guard it with a couple of blankets. No lullaby, Heath. Oh. Vance, why did you have the city museum closed to the public for the past few hours? Obviously, because I wanted no one to be there except whoever it is who will try to steal the bungee. Somebody's going to try to steal that statue tonight? Perhaps. They know the museum is unguarded, and I believe that time is a factor, and the attempt will be made tonight. You have the door key, Markham. Yes, of course, right here. Open it quietly, please. All right. If I'm not mistaken, we are about to interrupt the theft of the bungee. Hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. You can't know that. I don't know it, Heath, but I merely think it. I believe I saw a flashlight hit a window a second ago. A flashlight carried by somebody inside the museum. Well, Markham? I'm a little slow because I'm trying to do this as quietly as possible. There. Here we are. Vance. I see it, Markham. The flashlight at the other end of this hall. Close the door, Heath, please. Quietly. I've got my finger on the light switch. Right. What's that noise, Vance? Winches, Markham. The bungee is heavy and unwieldy and has to be raised mechanically. Well, Heath, I think we're about to catch our thief. The same guy who murdered that Enid Carter dame? Perhaps. Ready, Heath? He and my gun are both ready. Throw the switch, Vance. Here goes. Stand where you are, whoever you are, or I fire. Come on, Markham Vance. Who is it, Vance? Can you make him out? I know who he is. But that body on the floor in the corner. Okay, you. Get your hands up and turn this way. Get him up. All right, all right. Oh, they don't shoot. It's Jasper, the curator of this museum, Vance. I knew that. I'm much more interested in this body. Markham, it's Jonathan Peters. What? He's still breathing. Heath, keep Jasper covered. All right. Come over here, Markham. I'm with you, Vance. He's dying. I know he's dying, but I didn't kill him. I swear I didn't kill Shut him. Shut up, you. We got you cold trying to steal the statue, ain't we? Yes, maybe you have, but that man is dying. Only I didn't kill him. I found him that way when oh. I came down here oh. a little while ago. All right, Jasper, we'll get to you later. Something. I think Mr. Peters is trying to say something, Markham. Oh. Bend down here with me. Right. right. I can't. Hello, Mr. Peters. How are you, Vance? You find me in a sorry state, sir. Sorry, state indeed. Who did this to you, Mr. Peters? That native boy I had with me, Ringai. He found I was trying to obtain the bungee, not for his tribe, but for myself. We'll pick that boy up in a hurry, Vance. Is there anything we can do for you, Mr. Peters? For me, sir, nothing. This is not quite the idea of the way I should prefer to die. So near. To a fabulous fortune. So very near. But fate has made a decision. And I shall abide by it, gentlemen. Yes. I shall abide. He's gone, Markham. Yes. And I believe you can charge Mr. Jasper here with murder. I? Well, you know I didn't kill him. He told you that. I heard him. You, you don't believe I killed him, do you? You can't. I didn't say you killed him, Mr. Jasper. I said you could be charged with murder. You see, I've known all along you killed Enid Carter. Look, Vance, if you think I'm going to ask you a single question, you're nuts. Very well, Sergeant Heath. Suppose we leave it at that. Ah, uh, wait a minute. J just one minute in... Uh, maybe one question. <laughs> How did you know Jasper killed that Miss Carter? Well, Heath, I'll tell you. To begin with, he knew the weight of that statue, the bungee. Knowing it, he knew it wasn't copper, but gold. And as such, worth a fortune. Mm. Well, that still don't tell me where Miss Carter comes in. Or that Peters guy in his stooge either. Or Abbott. They all come in together, Heath. They all wanted the bungee. Miss Carter wanted it so much that the night of her death, she came to the museum to make a deal with Jasper to steal it. But apparently she came into the museum while Mr. Jasper was trying to do that very thing for himself. And she caught him at it. Yeah, but Peters and the native were there, too. That's right. But fortunately for them, they hadn't gotten into the room where the bungee was kept. They were in another room when they heard shots. A policeman came tearing in, discovered the body, and they couldn't get out until the next day. You see, they were hiding in the museum. Yeah, but if they couldn't get out, how could the murderer? He couldn't either. That's how I knew it was Jasper. His living quarters were upstairs. 
He got up there in time to be presumably awakened by the police. Mm. And Abbott, the art dealer? Completely innocent, although he was working for Peters. And Peters had threatened his life if Abbott revealed Peters' identity to us. Uh That accounts for his attitude while we were questioning him earlier today. I guess it does. (laughs) <laughs> hey, Vance, I promised you I wouldn't ask any questions, and I bet I asked a million, huh? <laughs> it's all right, Eve. I enjoyed answering them. I like to make statements, you see. Statements such as, This is the end of the idol murder case. <laughs> Tell me, Roger, please. There must be something else you see in the crystal ball. I've never heard anything so wonderful of the things you've been able to see. Patience, Miss Stone. Patience. Yes, there is something. Uh. Only this is not so pleasant. Oh? You wish to hear it? Of course. I can't understand how you knew the things you've told me. It's incredible that you should know them. And I want to know what it is you see now. Very well. Attend, if you please. Miss Stone, there is someone whom you trust. Someone very close to you. Someone who is violating that trust. Take notice. I think not. No. No, that is not the name. The initials are... uh, P... Let me see. P.G. The name is blurred, but it is coming through more clearly now. The name is Peter Golden. What? That is it, Peter Golden. Mr. Golden? And he's cheating me? But he's my guardian. He has all my money. Tell me more, Roger. Please, more. No, no, I cannot. There is nothing more now. Tomorrow, perhaps, but not now. I am sorry, Miss Stone. That is all. Well... Here's the hundred dollars we agreed upon, Rasha. I'll be here tomorrow, and and thank you. Thank you very much. Tomorrow, then. Good day, Miss Stone. Come out, Mr. Novus, please. It worked, didn't it, Rasha? She believed what you told her. As much as I told her. You realize I've tried to tell her this myself, but she wouldn't listen. I require no explanation as to why you see fit to give me information to be passed on to Miss Stone. No, maybe not. But I just wanted to make sure my conscience was clear. You see, I work for Golden. He's been stealing from Miss Stone for months. I am quite sure that is so. Well, there had to be some way for her to find out about this, Roger. I couldn't tell her, but if he keeps up his swindling, she'll be penniless. Which would mean that you would be marrying a penniless young lady. Yes, yes, I suppose so, only... Well, that isn't terribly important. No? No, I love Kay. I love her very much. And I'm greatly indebted to you for being the means whereby she knows about Golden. (laughs) At a hundred dollars a visit, it's no trouble, I assure you. Thank you. Only suppose this doesn't work. 
Suppose Golden convinces Kay that he isn't cheating her. Then what? What? Well, that might call for a visit from me to Mr. Golden. Only, Mr. Novice, that visit will cost a good deal more than a hundred dollars. Novice, Mr. Golden. You asked me to come to your office. Come on in. Hello, Mr. Golden. Sit down, Novice. You know, one of the reasons I put your office at the other end of this floor is that you wouldn't get too close to me. I don't think I understand. You will. The point is that when I hired you, I didn't want you to know everything about my business. But apparently you found out regardless. I still don't know what you mean, sir. No? No. Well, you see, I just received a call from Miss Stone. She said a lot of things nobody would know about. Nobody but me, and apparently you. I haven't told her a thing about your mishandling her money. She found out some way, I guarantee that. She's not sure, mind you, just suspicious. Right now, your job is to keep Miss Stone's mind off my business, Dick. Make sure you do. And what if I don't? What if I won't stand by and watch you swindling my fiance? You will. There are a few things about you that she might like to know about where you spent the five years before you came to this city. You know about that? Certainly. And make no mistake about it. I'd tell her in a minute if you don't do things my way. Why, you low, underhand this rat. This gun makes up for the difference in our age and physical abilities, Novus. It doesn't scare me. I've got to convince you that telling Kay about my past would be a very wrong thing for you to do. A very wrong thing. Don't come any closer to me or I'll shoot. I'll shoot, Victor. Uh, shoot, will you? I think not. I'll just take that gun away from you before you get into trouble with it. There. You'll be sorry about this, Novus. Very sorry. You'll be the sorriest man alive. Just as long as you stay alive. <laughs> You were Philo Vance, the private investigator? Yes, of course. Please sit down, Miss Stone. Thank you. And thank you for your promptness. I imagine you're busy, Mr. Vance. I said on the telephone I'd be here at three. Yes, you did, and it's three now. So suppose you tell me why you think you need my services. A very important reason, Mr. Vance. Do you know anything about me? Only that you were left a sizable fortune when your father died, and that the money is being invested for you. Supposed to be invested for me, you mean? Peter Golden is my guardian and the executor of the estate. He's been cheating me. Really? How do you know? A fortune teller told me. <laughs> oh, don't laugh, Mr. Vance. I, I know it sounds silly, but he had facts and, and amounts and dates. He's fantastically accurate. He is, eh? Who is this great mystic? His name is Raja Ramoy. And I went to see him today for the first time. If what he says is true... I'm practically penniless. You believe what a fortune teller says, Miss Stone? Implicitly. My fiancé, Dick Novus, recommended him. I... Dick works for Peter Golden in the Standard Building, but the Raja told me things even Dick couldn't know. Nobody could know. He's psychic, Mr. Vance. Terribly psychic. If you're so sold on him, Miss Stone, I think you made a mistake coming to me. You see, I don't happen to believe in anyone being able to call on the spirits for information whenever he finds it convenient. Or, shall I say, profitable. But, Mr. Vance... I'm sorry, Miss Stone. I deal in facts, not fancies. My suggestion would be for you to allow this Rajah to settle your problems. I'm sorry I can't take your case. All right, if that's the way... Excuse me, please. Of course. Hello. Hello, is uh, Miss Kay Stone there? Why, yes, she is. Uh, just a moment, please. For you, Miss Stone. Oh, that must be Dick. I left a note for him telling him where I'd be. You Thank are. you, Mr. Vance. Hello? Hello, Kay. I got your message to call this number. Where are you? Uh, I'll explain later. You're at the office, Dick? Yeah. Where's Golden? In his private office down the hall. Why? Uh, where are you? Uh, with a friend, Dick. I'd like him to talk to you. His name is uh, Brown. Okay, put him on. Please, Mr. Vance. But I don't have anything to say to you, Mr. Novus. Well, please, Mr. Vance, just as a favor. All right. Oh, thanks. Dick, here is Mr. Brown... Uh, Mr. Brown, Mr. Novice. 
Uh, hello, Novice. Hello, Brown. I really don't know what I'm supposed to say to you. I've just told Miss Stone I can... Novice, are you there? Yes, I'm here. That shot came from Golden's private office down the hall. Hold the phone. I'm going to investigate. What happened, Ben? I'm not sure yet. I'll have to wait until Novice gets back. Well, where did he go? Down the hall to Golden's private office. But he was talking to you on the phone. That's right, but you see, there was a shot fired. What? Novice is sure it came from Golden's office. He's gone to find out. A shot? That's right. What? Impotent feeling, isn't it, Miss Stone, to have to stand here and hold the telephone while a murder might have been taking place? You think that... Just Hello, Brown? Yes? Brown? Yeah, uh, I just come from Golden's office. He's lying face down on the floor, and there's a bullet wound in his head. I think I heard footsteps racing down the stairs, but I was afraid to follow whoever it was. Uh, well, what shall I do? Leave everything just as it is. I'm sending Miss Stone to her home. You meet her there. I'll want to talk to both of you later. Right now, I'm going to call District Attorney Markham and invite him to a murder. <laughs> We meet in strange surroundings, but in a familiar circumstance. Mr. Golden is quite dead, the medical examiner assures me. I never doubted that, Markham. His private office is furnished rather well, don't you think? Yes, in fine taste. And his murderer had the bad taste to leave us practically clueless, as usual. Lack of obvious clues hasn't deterred us on other cases, Markham. <laughs> hasn't deterred you, you mean. <laughs> I'm just old-fashioned enough to want a lead to a killer. So do I. Only it isn't necessary for it to be out in the open. For instance, Markham, this tells me a lot. Vance, what in the world did you climb in that chair for? I wanted to take a look at the wall. Closer look, that is. Very interesting. A wall is interesting. Now, Vance, you... It provided me with a possible clue, Markham. How? It's an ordinary wall. There's a little accumulated dust or something up where you look, but what's that? That is the clue to our killer, Markham. Oh, no. Imagine the murderer would rather believe your remark than mine, but I'll stick with my theory for a while. I don't think I'm not glad you're going to. Uh, Vance, who was this golden fellow, anyhow? He was guardian for the money left to a girl named Kay Stone, for one thing, Markham. She was in my office when we heard a shot over the telephone. You were talking to the dead man? No, to Mr. Novus, Miss Stone's fiancé. Oh. I took the liberty of sending Miss Stone to her home and of asking Mr. Novus to meet her there. I don't see where that was such a liberty, Vance. Novus couldn't have been guilty if he was talking to you over the telephone when the shot was fired. That doesn't seem possible, does it, Markham? Of course not. There are some things, Vance, which even I am willing to bet can't be done. That may be, but if I were you, my friend, I wouldn't say this was one of them. There isn't anything we can do, Dick, except sit tight and wait for the police to get here to question us. Uh, you know why I introduced Philo Vance to you over the telephone as Mr. Brown. Well, I understand why you did it, only it was a little ridiculous. Well, maybe, in view of what followed. Oh, excuse me, sir. Well, certainly. Hello? Miss Stone? Yes? This is Roger Ramoy. Oh. I have something very important to tell you. Well, not now. Oh, but definitely now. It seems that I have done you quite a favor, and I don't want it to be wasted. What do you mean? Haven't you heard? Peter Golden is dead. Killed. It is important I see you. I'll call you back. Please do. I went to a great deal of trouble. I would rather it were not done for nothing. Goodbye. Goodbye. Who was that? That fortune teller you took me to. He has something to tell me. Okay, listen. That, that man's a fake. What? Everything he told you, I had told him. I wanted you to know about Golden. You don't have to see the Raja anymore. You don't have to go near him again. I don't know, Dick. He seems to feel that I do. And somehow, so do I. This is Miss Stone's home, Vance. Is this the place where our mystery comes to an end? Perhaps. All I can do is hope. There's one thing I don't understand, Vance. Then you're lucky. There are a lot of things that I don't. <laughs> one thing I do understand, however, is that this is a bell. And if we're going to get in to see Miss Stone and her fiancé, we ought to ring it. There. Vance, I've never known you to be so mysterious before, so reluctant to tell me anything. That could be for an excellent reason, Markham. You mean you don't know anything about this case? Well, let's say I don't know enough. Oh, Miss Stone, may we come in? Hello, Mr. Vance. Please do. Thank you. This is District Attorney Markham. How do you do? How do you do? Oh, Mr. Novus is in the library. 
You uh, wanted to talk to him, Mr. Vance? I most certainly do. And I wonder if you'd mind waiting out here in the hall with Mr. Markham. I don't think I understand. Neither do I, Miss Stone, but I imagine it might be a good thing for us to do. Thank you, Markham. I won't be long. All right, Vance. We'll be waiting. In here, Miss Stone? Yes. Thank you. How do you do? I'm Philo Vance. Oh, yes, I imagined it would be you. What do you want with me, Vance? A little cooperation, for one thing. Well, now, let's talk straight. You're going to find I have a record that I served time in jail years ago. You know, I was down, down the hall in my office when Golden was murdered. Now, what do you want with me? You were down the hall, you say? You know I was. I was talking to you over the telephone when we heard the shot. Kay told me you were Mr. Brown. That's quite right. And now, and as much as you were on the telephone when the shot was fired, you want to know what I want with you, is that correct? Yes. It's very simple, Mr. Novus. You see, two people are involved in the murder. You might very well be one of those two. <laughs> This is District Attorney Markham. The Golden murder case opened with the finding of the murdered body of Peter Golden, executor for the estate of Kay Stone. Philo Vance has discovered that Golden was cheating Miss Stone, and that that fact was known to Dick Novus, Golden's assistant and Miss Stone's fiancé. He has also found out that Miss Stone had been to a fortune teller named Raja Ramoy before going to his office. And it was while she was in his office and Vance was talking on the telephone to Novus that a shot was heard, and Novus, investigating, found Golden murdered. Vance is of the opinion that two people are involved in the murder and has gone to see Raja Ramoy, who, I have been told, at the moment has another visitor, Kay Stone. It should be... Well, Raja, what is it? Miss Stone, my crystal ball shows me... Let's forget me... that crystal ball stuff, Raja. Oh? You said you had something to tell me about Peter Golden's death. I think I know what it is. Very well. Then suppose you tell me. You wanted to tell me you killed Golden and that you expect me to pay you. Who's that? I don't know, but I shall find out. Come in. It's Vance. Good evening, Miss Stone. Uh, this, evening. I imagine, is the eminent Raja Ramoy. You are Philo Vance. What is it you want? I understand you have a remarkable crystal ball, Raja. I would like to see it. See it? Of course you can see it. But it'll tell you nothing. No, I don't suppose it will. Perhaps you'll tell me, Raja. It seems that Miss Stone was in my office at 3 o'clock yesterday afternoon when we heard a shot. Yes? Look in your crystal ball, Raja. Or better still, perhaps you'd better have a more tangible witness. Because you see, very shortly, you're going to be called upon to say where you were at 3 o'clock yesterday. <laughs> Markham. If that's you, Vance, I'm in here in the murder room. Right, Markham. You shouldn't be too difficult to find. And you're not. How are you? As well as can be expected and just about as perplexed. Vance, I've gone over this room with the proverbial fine-tooth comb, and I can't for the life of me see what you've made seem like a clue. I'm prepared to tell you very shortly, my friend. Have you anything to tell me? Not especially. Is the medical examiner's statement about the death of Mr. Golden. I don't believe it's terribly enlightening, though. Bullet entered the head, death instantaneous, that sort of thing. Mind if I see it? No, not at all. Here you are. Hmm. And what, may I ask, are you humming about? Nothing important. That's what I said. There's nothing terribly exciting in that information. What would you call terribly exciting, Markham? Well, for one thing, knowing who killed Peter Golden. Oh, I'm pretty sure I know who killed Peter Golden, Markham. What I want to know is, who fired the shot? <laughs> You and Miss Stone understand now why it is imperative I came here so we could have this chat, Mr. Novis. Yes. Yes, I suppose so, Raja. What I suggest is very simple, is it not, Miss Stone? Very. Oh, it isn't so simple for the one of us who had nothing to do with the murder. Let us not split hairs, Mr. Novis. Let me put it even more simply than I have done. You came to me originally to have me tell Miss Stone several things about Mr. Golden. Well, that's right. But I've already told her I did that. Yes. Uh, wait, please. You're too hasty, Mr. Novis. It is possible, of course, that Mr. Golden knew, as I know... But you are an ex-convict. Are you dirty? Never mind, Dick. I knew that. It didn't make any difference before. Don't see to it that it does now. Go ahead, Raja. It's so simple. Philo Vance thinks one of us killed Golden. So far, I do not think he knows which one. That is, if one of us killed him. 
Personally, I have an alibi for my whereabouts at 3 o'clock the afternoon Mr. Golden was killed. Well, so have I. I was on the phone talking to Vance. And I was in his office. Vance knows something which we do not know. Let us assume, then, that none of us three killed Mr. Golden. In view of that, let us keep what we know about each other and about him away from the police. I already told Vance that Golden was cheating me. That was not wise. Why not? I had nothing to hide. No, Roger, I want no part of your plan. I'm going to answer any question they ask And that goes for me, too. Well, that leaves me no alternative but to do the same. Unfortunately for one of you... I'll answer that. Hello? Hello, is that you, Miss Stone? Yes. Who is this? Philo Vance. May I invite you to a reading of Rajah Ramoy's crystal ball? What do you mean? I mean that I would like you and your fiancé to be at the Rajah studio in an hour. Oh, Dick is here with me now. I'll tell him. Thank you. Oh, by the way, I happen to know Rajah Ramoy is there with you, too. Please tell him that he also is cordially invited to be at his place, then. Draw the curtains, please, Markham. I want the room quite dark. Right, Vance. You're going to use my crystal ball, Vance? It works equally well in the light, believe me. Perhaps it won't for amateurs like myself, Roger. What do you expect to see in the crystal, Mr. Vance? The murderer of Peter Golden. Oh, uh, you see, Miss Stone, perhaps Golden did deserve to die for cheating you out of your money. But the decision to take life does not rest with any of us. Do you agree, Mr. Novus? Forget about me, Vance. Go ahead with that foolishness. Very well. Please, everyone, keep very quiet if you don't mind. Of course. We certainly uh, Before I start this experiment, Raja Ramoy, do you have a gun? Why, no. No. It seems to me that at police headquarters this morning, I saw a license issued to you giving you permission to possess a firearm. Oh, that. that that's a... Blank cartridge pistol. I use it in my act when I appear on the stage. You are seated at my place at this table. There's a drawer right in front of you. The pistol is in there. But believe me, it is loaded with blanks. We'll see. Yes, here it is. I'd like to fire it now. Vance. Not at anyone in particular, Markham. Just at this wall. <laughs> yes, it shoots blanks all right, Vance. There's no bullet in the wall. I wanted to be sure. And now for the experiment with the crystal ball. I see in it many things. Hatred for his employer for several reasons by Mr. Dick Novus. Why should I hate him? He knew about your past and he was cheating your fiancé. I also see in it a visit by the great Rajah Ramoy to Mr. Golden's office. If I'm not mistaken, he was about to sell him some information. What information, Mr. You Vance? were going to ask him how much it would be worth if you did not tell Miss Stone all the details of his swindling. I was? I think so. And I think that inasmuch as you knew that what you were doing amounted to blackmail, you brought your gun, your blank cartridge gun, along with you. Why would I do that? Just in case Mr. Golden resented being blackmailed. You'd use the gun merely to threaten him if he seemed bent on throwing you out of his office. That perhaps is so. But it means I did not kill him, doesn't it, Mr. Vance? After all, what I had was a blank cartridge pistol... You can't kill with that. No, but you could fire the gun to create an alibi which you could explode any time you liked in the event the person you were alibying for refused to pay you. I should never have allowed you to use my crystal ball, Vance. Apparently it works as well for you as it did for me. What else do you see in it? I see a young lady named Kay Stone who could conceivably have gone temporarily insane when what? she found that the man she thought was a friend had made her penniless. That means you think I killed him. What I've tried to show was that all three of you had motives. Good motives. We all have good alibis for the time he was shot too, Vance. Don't forget that. No. Pardon my correcting you, Mr. Novus. You all have alibis for three o'clock, the time the shot was heard. But Mr. Golden was killed before that blank cartridge gun was fired. And the name of his murderer... Yes? Yes, Vance, the name. The name of his murderer is... Tell us if you see it. Tell us. Turn that last lamp out, Markham. I can read it more clearly. Right. Well, that's better. In absolute darkness, one light remains. The light in this crystal ball. And it tells me that the name of the killer of Peter Golden is... K. Stone. Light, Markham. Right. She, she got away, Vance. She got away. Not very far, Mr. Novus. Apparently, my pretending to read the crystal ball was too close to home. But we have several policemen downstairs prepared to seize anyone fleeing from this room. No, she didn't get away. Believe me, she didn't. She didn't get away from us or with murder. I, K. 
case tone of my own free will and volition, confessed to shooting Peter Golden in his office. I shot him and went directly to Philo Vance's office. Have you taken that down, Mr. Pace? <laughs> yes, I have, Mr. Markham. You killed him because he stole that money from you, didn't you, Miss Stone? That was the reason, Vance. And you went to Vance's <laughs> office so that you'd have an alibi, having been there when Vance heard the shot over the telephone. No, no, I knew nothing about any shot. I went there to ask Vance to investigate Golden and, and my fiancé. I knew he'd find Golden dead, but would suspect Dick when he found out about his jail record. How little she knew you, Vance. <laughs> But what about this business of the shot you heard? Didn't she really know about that? Quite possibly not, Markham. You see, what happened was this. Of course, I wasn't reading any crystal ball, but just as I said at the Rajah's house, the Rajah did go to see Golden, but he found him dead in his private office. Then he heard Dick Novus speaking on the telephone to Miss Stone and then to me, and he thought he'd give either one of them an alibi. Either one of them? Whichever one had killed Golden. Oh. You see, he didn't know which one at the time. But he figured that later on, one of them would be good for a little blackmailing. So he fired his blank cartridge gun into the wall while Novus was on the phone. But how did you know that? That smudge on the wall. The one I investigated the first time we went up to Golden's office, Markham? Yes. That told me a blank cartridge gun had been fired and had left powder marks on the wall. Well, I had to build the rest of this case from that. You built it too well, Vance. Too well to suit me. It had to be you, Miss Stone. You told me you left a note for Mr. Novus. And that was the reason he was telephoning you at my office. If you left a note, you had to have been at his office. If you were at his office, it is very conceivable that you killed Golden. Well, that's what happened, all right. I did go up there. And when I saw his smug face looking at me, laughing at me after he cheated me out of hundreds of thousands of dollars, I fired. And that was the end of him. No question about that, Miss Stone. And Markham. Yes? There's no question about the fact either that this is the end of the Golden murder case. got something to talk to you about. Couldn't wait until we're at the airport this afternoon? Seems to me you're my co-pilot on the Center City flight, aren't you? That's right. Only I'm doing you a favor by not talking about this where anybody else can hear. I want you to keep away from Sue Gordon. Oh, you do? Well, what do you know about that? I don't kid about it, Greg. You're only giving her a run around and she's taking you seriously. And you don't like your girl taking me seriously. Selfish, aren't you? I wouldn't mind if she meant anything to you, but she's too nice a kid for you to be... Look, Johnny, I'll see Sue, and she'll see me, just as often as we like. And there isn't a thing you can do to stop that. Understand? Not a thing. Oh, no? 
I don't like the way you said that. Well, I've got something to say you're going to like even less. If you don't stop seeing Sue, a certain party is going to learn about you and that certain party's wife. What certain party? You want names? Yeah. Okay, you'll get them. The woman's name is Sylvia Crane. Oh. And her husband is Millard Crane. How do you know about Sylvia and me? I made it my business to find out. And I can make it my business to keep quiet about it, too. If you keep away from Sue. We're going to be a very swell crew when we fly this afternoon, aren't we? <laughs> my co-pilot is ready to cut my throat over the hostess on the ship. Never mind about what happens when we get in the plane. What happens from now on is what I want to know. I don't think it over, Johnny boy. I'll scram out of here while I take a shower and get dressed. I think we can make a deal about the Sylvia Crane situation. Good enough. I don't want to hurt her. All I want to do is keep you from hurting Sue. I know. You said that before. Goodbye, Johnny. I'll see you at the airport. Yeah. Hmm. Seems to me that maybe Sylvia ought to know something about this. Yeah. Certainly thinks she should. Send a city in two. I'll be back before you know. <laughs> but I like the idea of you missing it. It's good for my ego. If you knew how much I miss you, you'd never be able to get your hat on. Ooh, that reminds me. One hat. Oh. In the closet, there, please. Sure. Hope you close the deal, darling. Won't be any trouble. I still don't see why you don't send one of your men. That's what they're for, isn't it? Here's your hat. Thank you. Yes, I have salesmen and good ones. This is one thing I'm going to take care of myself. All by myself. Hurry back, darling. And please take care of yourself. No, oh, I will, Sylvia. Don't worry about that. And I'm not only going to take care of myself. I'm going to take care of somebody else, too. Flight 22 for Center City, now loading at gate 7. Flight 22 for Center City, now loading at gate Good afternoon, seven. Miss. Hello. Hope you have room for one more on this plane. Certainly, sir. Just take any seat at all. I'm Sue Gordon. I'll be your hostess on this trip. How do you do? My name is Crane. Go right in, Mr. Crane. I think you'll find most of the other passengers already aboard. We're about to take off. Yes, I see the pilot and co-pilot coming now. Thank you, Miss Gordon. I'll see you on the pilot. Right-o, Mr. Crane. Hello, Johnny. Hi, sweet. Customers all on board? It's practically a full house. Well, open me, Sue. Of course, Greg. How are you? Leave her alone, Greg. I warned you about bothering Sue, didn't I? She's the only one who knows whether it's a bother or not, Johnny. She knows. Believe me, she knows. Hmm. I don't like the way she said that. Come on, Johnny. Let's get this plane started. Okay. I'll see you in a little bit, Sue. Do that, Johnny, please. Tuck your head, low bridge. Don't worry about me. You're going to have enough trouble looking out for yourself. Come on in. Tell me all about it, lad. What's going to scare big bad me? Skip it. Let's get the plane warmed up. Thanks for telling me my business, but... Go ahead with the checking. Left and right engine. Gas, electric valve set. Check. Control tabs. Set. Mixture control. Idle off. Props. Low pitch. Gyros, altimeters. Set. 
Battery switch? On. Hold it. Ring hell, boy. Ring hell. Okay. Ignition switch. On. Here we go with engine number one. Like a kid. Engine number two. Uh oh. Listen to that. Give me that microphone. Will you, Johnny? I'll get this first from the control tower. Yeah. Thanks. Flight 22 to control tower. Pilot, flight 22 to control tower. Engine missing badly. What do you want us to do? Over. Control tower to flight 22. Inform passengers there will be delay while we transfer them to another ship. Inform passengers they will be transferred and the flight will be delayed one hour. That is all. Well, Johnny, my boy, cut the engine. And tell your girlfriend we'll lay that little information to the customers, will you? Tell them we're leaving in an hour. Okay, Greg. Only I wouldn't be so sure that all of us were going to be leaving in an hour. What I want to know is this, Miss Deering. Are you happy in your work? In my work? Yes, Vance, I'm very happy. A job with the greatest private investigator in the country? Who wouldn't be happy? You'll forgive me for momentarily reveling in that compliment and secondarily questioning the sincerity of it. Your face sort of belies that happiness. You said you might call me last night, Vance. What happened? Did Markham call you about a murder? No such good luck, Miss Deering. I haven't seen the district attorney in days. Seems that I became involved at dinner over a discussion concerning the merits of modern as against medieval architecture. Quite interesting. <laughs> so interesting that you forgot all about the fact that I was waiting for your call. You didn't wait too long. You went to the movies, and not later than 9 o'clock. Who told you? Nobody. There's a single ticket stub from the Kingsway Theater in your bag. The date is on it, and your purse is open. The last feature at the Kingsway starts at 9 o'clock. So, you see? Yes, I see. All right. <laughs> Vance, does anything ever escape you? Of course, my dear, many things. Now, inasmuch as I have explained how I knew you didn't wait too long for me... Am I excused for last night? You were excused last night for last night, and you know it. <laughs> oh, there you two. Oh, oh apparently I'm interrupting something pleasant. How are you? Hiya, Markham. Welcome to our little city. I hope I know why you're here. Yes, you do, Vance. Who was it this time, my friend? What puzzles me is that you don't know. You always seem to be able to anticipate everything. It was an airlines pilot, Vance, a man named Gregory Allen. I was on my way to the airport and dropped by to pick you up. I'm glad you did. What are the particulars, Markham? Well, from what we've been able to gather so far, this Allen was kind of a ladies' man. Oh? He had a romance going with the airplane hostess, Sue Gordon, and this was resented by her boyfriend, his co-pilot, Johnny Taylor. Mmm, that sounds like a nice, happy group. Remind me to travel by train here. Oh, that isn't all. The dead man also was going around with a woman named Sylvia Crane, and her husband was aboard the plane. You're going a little too quickly for me, Markham. Was Mr. Gregory Allen killed in the plane? No. It seems that when he was about to take off, one of the motors went bad, so everyone was to be switched to another plane. That would have meant a delay of about an hour. So Allen went into the pilot's room in the administration building, and that's where his body was found. In the pilot's room, with the lights out. Hmm. The murderer probably turned them out to delay the finding of the body. When did all this happen, Markham? Not 15 minutes ago. I've had all the passengers held, although they're all quite anxious to get to their destinations. Good. You had the co-pilot and the hostess held, too, I imagine. Of course. Sergeant Heath is there now. In that case, Markham, I might say that within a half hour, we should be there, too. Good day, Miss Deering. I have the co-pilot and the hostess outside, Vance, just as you asked. Are you ready to question them now? Not at the moment, Markham. I want to look around this murder room a bit. Of course. This room was built for tall men, Markham. The top shelf on that bookcase is out of the reach of an ordinary-sized man. Pilots are generally tall, Vance, and only pilots were permitted in here. Yes, I know. That light switch is back pretty far and very high on the wall. And even the easy chairs seem to be built to accommodate long-legged individuals. No question about that. Tell me, Vance, how long do you want the passengers held? Some of them are complaining about being held up. Well, I don't believe I'll have to see them all, Markham. Although I'll know better after I talk to the co-pilot... Ask him to come in, will you please? The hostess, too? Might as well. Right, Vance. Uh, the co-pilot's name is Johnny Taylor, and the hostess is Sue Gordon. I'll tell them to come in. Oh, Mr. Taylor. Yeah? Miss Gordon? Yes? Yeah. Please come in here. It's all right, dear. I'll handle everything. Vance, this is Mr. Taylor and Miss Gordon. Philo Vance. How do you do? All right. 
Miss Gordon, tell me something. Were you ever in this room before? No, neither hostesses nor passengers are allowed in here, Mr. Vance. Only pilots. That means that you've been here, Mr. Taylor. That's right. Vance, you're wasting your time with us. We don't know anything about who killed Greg. No? What makes you think I ought to believe that? Because there's somebody being held outside who had a real reason for killing him. Millard Crane. Greg was fooling around with his wife. Oh? Well, that's very interesting. Markham, would you ask Mr. Crane to be out in the hall in a moment, please? Certainly. I'll get him there, Vance. I understand the late Mr. Allen also liked you, Miss Gordon. Yes, I believe he did. But you are supposed to be Mr. Taylor's girlfriend. She is my girl. The only reason I told you about Crane was so you'd know who your real suspect is. Is that so? Yeah. You'd better stop, Mr. Taylor, because you're beginning to sound like my real suspect at the moment. Oh, Vance, Millard Crane, the man you wanted to see, is right outside the door. Good. Come on, Miss Gordon. All right. Mr. Taylor. All right. Thanks, Markham. Right. Uh, right this way, everybody. Okay. Mr. Crane, I want to see you. And I want to see you, too, Vance. I understand it's because of you that we're being delayed. The delay will only be temporary. Mr. Crane, I've just been told by Mr. Taylor here that your wife and the dead pilot were quite friendly. You were told that, were you? Yes. Well, if they were friendly, Mr. Vance, I didn't know a thing about it. I don't believe him. You're the young man who told that to Mr. Vance, aren't you? That's right. What about it? You really ought to have proof before you make a Don't talk to me about the proof. Both of you. I was under the impression that I was conducting this investigation. Let me understand something. Are all three of you going on that flight to Center City? I'm co-pilot on the plane and Sue's the hostess. And I've got to get there on business. Very well, then. Go ahead, all three of you. You're all free to go. Come on, Sue, let's get out. Vance, I don't think I understand why you let them all go. They were your principal suspects. That's right. And they're all going to Center City. But they'll all be back. Markham, would you see what you can do about getting me a reservation on that plane? You think you can find out something about this murder in Center City? Possibly. Besides... I haven't been to Center City in almost a year. murder case opened when airlines pilot Greg Allen was stabbed in the pilot's room at the airport. Final Vance's suspects include Sue Gordon, airlines hostess, her boyfriend, co-pilot Johnny Taylor, and Millard Crane, whose wife was friendly with the dead man. Vance took a plane trip to Center City with all three suspects, but has returned to town where he is again in the airline's administration building, questioning Johnny Taylor and Sue Gordon. You see, Mr. Taylor and yes. Mr. Gordon, yes. there isn't anything I can ask you that would help me. But I am quite certain that there is something that you can tell me that will be important. I don't know who murdered Greg, Mr. Vance. If I did, I'd tell you. Believe me, I would. At the moment, I'm not quite as anxious to have you tell me who murdered him as I am to have you supply me with some proof. What does that mean, Vance? It means I think I know who killed Mr. Allen. Where are you going, Miss Gordon? Stop! So They can't make me talk. I won't let them. I'm going to get out of here. She had nothing to do with the murder, Mr. Vance. She's just scared. That's all. Honest, that's all it is. That might be the reason she left here so suddenly. It isn't terribly important, though. I can have Markham pick her up almost any time. Mr. Taylor. Yeah? What can you tell me about Mr. Millard Crane? I told you about Greg and Crane's wife. What else could I tell you? You might tell me that you saw Crane fooling with one of the motors on the plane that was originally scheduled to take him to Center City. But I didn't. And besides, what would that prove? It would prove that Crane wanted Flight 22 delayed so he could murder Greg Allen while the new plane was being ready. That means you know that Crane killed Greg? No, but I can understand how you... Oh, I see what you mean. Look, Vance, maybe I was sore at the way Greg treated Sue. But I wouldn't murder him for that. No. There have been murders for a less reason, Johnny. In fact, this might be one of those murders. You haven't told me anything about your trip to Center City, Millie, darling. Was it successful? 
very silky, dear. Very successful. I'm glad. There was a little delay at the airport before we got started, but it's on. Delay? What sort of delay? Oh, one of the engines on the plane went bad, and we had to wait around an hour. Oh, well, that wasn't too bad, was it, dear? No, but it seems that while we were waiting around, the pilot on the plane was murdered. The pilot? Yes. Did you read about it? Or hear it on the radio? I've been out all afternoon shopping. What pilot was it, Millie? Oh, dear, please, don't be so upset. Of course, it was too bad. After all, he was a stranger. He was a stranger, wasn't he, Sylvia? Who was it, Millie? What was his name? Pilots? Greg Allen. Greg! Oh. You knew him? How unfortunate for him. Billy, did you know I knew Greg Allen? Did you? Maybe. You did know it, Billy. You killed Greg. Now, please, dear. You're hysterical. Of course, I'm hysterical. Greg did. You killed him. You killed him. I wouldn't say I killed him. While Vance and the police have three suspects. Of course, I'm one of them. But the other two, Johnny Taylor and Sue Gordon, both have pretty good reasons for killing him. I don't care how good their reasons were. They didn't kill him. You did. Sylvia, dear. You were the principal motive if any of the three of us killed your friend Greg. And if, as you believe, I killed him, it would be only a self-preservation for me to kill you, too. You yeah, I'll tell... Oh. Yes, dear? You were saying? Nothing. I'd better answer the door. I think you'd better control yourself and wipe away those tears. Oh. Don't you? I'll be in the library. Good evening. Mrs. Crane? Why, oh, yes. Mrs. Crane, I'm Philo Vance. Is your husband at home? Why, oh, yes. Would you please tell him I'm here? All right, I... Uh, just one moment, Mrs. Crane. Yes? I notice you're upset. I hope not too upset to corroborate one fact. What is that? Were you and a man named Greg Allen friendly? Uh, I'll tell Mr. Crane you're here. Thank you, Mrs. Crane. And thank you for answering that question by not answering it. Millard. Millard, dear. Come in. I didn't mean to interrupt you, dear, but Philo Vance is here, and he wants to speak to you. Well, I can come in. I have nothing to hide. Come in, Mr. Vance. Hello, Mr. Crane. Sorry to have to drop in on you like this, but it was important. Yes, Mr. Vance? Mr. Crane, you took a plane to Center City today. Why? I have business there. That's the only reason? Of course. Did you transact your business, Mr. Crane? Yes, as a matter of fact, I did. Why? Mm, nothing. Except that it's very strange where business is being transacted these days. What do you mean? Well, after you left the airport at Center City, I followed you. Yes, I know. You knew that, did you? Did you also know that I was in back of you when you went to a movie in Center City? Never forgive you for that, Crane. Bad picture. So I went to a picture show in Center City. And unless that's illegal, Vance, I'm afraid I'm going to have to ask you to leave. It isn't illegal, and you may invite me to leave if you like, of course. But may I extend you an invitation, too? Would you meet me and District Attorney Markham at the airport in exactly two hours, please? Bring in that airplane hostess, Miss Williams, and then come back here to take notes, please. Yes, Mr. Markham. Miss Gordon, come in, please. Very well. Sit down, Miss Gordon. There, that's better. Now then, I have a list of several questions I want to ask you. Miss Williams will take down your answers, so please remember to tell the truth. What do you want to know, Mr. Markham? I've already told you why I ran away from Mr. Vance at the airport. I was afraid he'd have me arrested, and I didn't want to be arrested. You're not arrested, Miss Gordon, merely held for questioning. If your answers are satisfactory, you may be released. Now, tell me. Were you ever in the room where Greg Allen was found dead? Never. That room was only for the pilots. Nobody else was allowed in. I told Mr. Vance that. I just wanted it on the record, that's all. Now, another question. Did you hate Greg Allen because his intentions were not serious? No, I didn't. I couldn't hate him. Mm, I imagine Johnny Taylor knew that, too. What's that? Uh, nothing, nothing. Just thinking out loud. Mr. Markham, what's the reason for these questions? The real reason, I mean. You want the truth, Miss Gordon? Of course. Well, then, ask Philo Vance. We're going to meet him at the airport now, and I have a hunch that this case might hang on your answers to these questions. Oh, Markham. Markham. Hello there, Vance. Hello, Mr. Vance. Well, I brought... 
brought Miss Gordon to the administration building, just as you asked. Thank you, Markham. I brought Mr. Johnny Taylor. Sue, have they done anything to you? Of course not, Johnny. Everything's going to be all right, believe me. I invited Mr. Crane to be here, Markham. In fact, that should be the gentleman in question coming now. And it is. Hello there, Mr. Crane. Well, let's get this over with. I'm here. Somebody please tell me why. I will, Mr. Crane. Now, listen, everyone, please. We're standing at the door of the pilot's reading room. In this room, Greg Allen was stabbed to death. Is that supposed to be news, Vance? Hardly. For purposes of my own, I find it necessary to bring you all here. The lights in the pilot's reading room are off. I'm going to open the door leading to it now. <laughs> now, this is beginning to be funny, Vance. I wouldn't start laughing just yet if I were you, Miss Gordon. I ask you all to look into the room from this doorway. That's a good trick if you can do it. The room's pitch black. You can turn on the lights if you like, Mr. Crane. All right. You want the lights on? There. Thank you. Now, Johnny, would you go in and turn them off? Sure. Is that all you want me to do? There. Close the door, Markham, please. Of course. Now what, Vance? Now, Markham, I have proof to convict the murderer of Greg Allen. Markham, you can arrest Mr. Millard Crane. Ready, Miss Deering? With eagerness, anticipation, and everything else the secretary's supposed to have. No curiosity. Oh, that's standard equipment with gals, Vance. You know that. <laughs> By the way, I think I know how you knew Crane was guilty. But I don't know what proof you finally got. Tell me first how I knew it was Crane. Oh, well, I think I followed that. He had no reason to go to that airport in the first place, inasmuch as his business trip was a phony, which you found out by trailing him to a movie in Center City. That's correct. And now you want to know about the proof. Well, for the purposes of our records, yes. Well, then, if that's the only reason, the explanation isn't important. After all, he has confessed, you know. And so has the mechanic he bribed to fix one of the engines on the plane Greg Allen was to fly. Vance, you know I'm dying of curiosity. <laughs> <laughs> that's different. In that case, listen... Who was allowed in the pilot's reading room? You mean where Greg Allen was killed? Mm hmm. Nobody but pilots, of course. Everybody kept insisting that all through this case. That's right. But still, today, when we were out at the scene of the crime, and I asked Mr. Crane to please put on the lights, he walked into the dark room and, without a second's hesitation, snapped them on. Which meant that he'd been there before. Correct. The light switch was in an unusual position, way back on the wall. He'd been there to kill Allen. After he killed him, he snapped off the lights to delay the discovery of the body. Mm -hmm. When he turned on the lights for me, well, that was all the proof I needed. Now, well, this was an unusual case, Vance. The principal suspect turned out to be the killer. Mm -hmm. The whole thing was awfully simple, though, wasn't it? Not that it isn't always after you explain it. Thank you, Miss Deering. For that, you may have the rest of the day off. Oh, thank you, sir. Of course, it's after 9 o'clock, but thanks just the same. I think I'll go wash up. Inasmuch as Mr. Miller Crane is all washed up, and so is the flying murder case.
in the waiting room, Doctor. Can you see him now? In a moment, Miss Lee. I just want to sharpen the burr on this drill. Didn't we get those new ones we ordered? No, Doctor. The company said they wouldn't send us any unless we paid our bill. They say it's six months old. So what if it is? I'm good for the money. What about the patient? Has he been here before? He's new to me. Says he had a toothache and saw the sign outside. All right, Miss Lee. Ask him to come in, please. Very well, Doctor. I'll tell him you can see him now. Would you come in, sir? Yeah, sure. Thanks, lady. Hi, Doc. Hello. Sit right down here, if you will, sir. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Doc. That's the telephone. Excuse me just a moment, will you, please? Yeah, sure. Hi, Doc. Hello? Hello, Michael. I just wanted to know if you'd be home for dinner. I hope I haven't disturbed you. Oh, I'll be home, Grace, but I have a patient in the chair, so I've got to cut this short. Oh, I understand. Goodbye, darling. Hurry home. Goodbye, Grace. Goodbye. Well, now, sir, we're ready for you. Yeah, sure, Doc. That, uh, that was your wife? Yes, why? She like it? Well, of course. I don't think I understand it. She wouldn't want nothing to happen to you, would she? Of course not. But then neither would I. What are you talking about? To tell the truth, Doc, I ain't got no pain in no tooth. <laughs> I guess maybe I'm going to be a pain in the neck. You see, uh, I uh, I work for Professor Powell, and he says you're going to give me 10,000 clams, or you ain't going to drill no more teeth. Get out of here before I call the police. Yeah, sure. I mean, I forgot to tell you. The professor, he's cute. You get dead, so it looks like by accident. See? I won't pay you or your professor a cent. Now get out of here. Yes, yeah, sure, sure. I'll, uh, I'll get out of here, but uh, remember what I said. You get dead. right. You promised to leave my money for me before you left this morning, and you didn't. When your husband are rich, why don't you pay me what you owe me? I'm, I'm sorry, Helma. I just don't happen to have the cash. I'll see that my husband, Dr. Butler, makes out a check for you as soon as he gets home. Well, you better. Fine people you two are. Hire a maid and then don't pay her. I don't like that, Mrs. Butler. Something better be done about it. I don't like being without ready money either, Helma. Something's going to be done about that, I promise you. so slow, Michael. I'm a little out of practice when it comes to serving. When's Helma coming back? She isn't. That is, she'll be in in the morning for her money. But she walked out this afternoon when I couldn't pay her. It was pretty embarrassing, Michael. Well, I can't be bothered with that right now. I've got other problems. Grace, my life has been threatened. What? A tough character came into my office and told me he worked for somebody named Professor Paul. He threatened to kill me unless I paid him $10,000. Oh, Michael, no. No? Oh, yes. He sounded like he... Oh, Michael, who can that be at the door? Th- Professor Powell? No, oh, no, it's probably Stanley James. He left word at the office he'd be here tonight. I'll go to the door. I'll get rid of him in a hurry. I know what he wants. Oh, please, Michael, you're upset enough. Don't do anything you'll be sorry for. I'll do something he'll be sorry for. Just because he's a dentist, too, he thinks I'm supposed to help him. Well, he'll find out. Hello, Dr. Butler. Well, Dr. James, what is it? And if it's about that money you want to borrow, the answer is no. Can't I even come in and discuss this with you, Doctor? It's really urgent. I said no to you yesterday, and I'm telling you the same thing now. What right of you to think I'll lend you money? I loaned you money when you were just starting. Dr. Butler, you've got to help me. You've got to. I do, huh? Well, that's your opinion only. I think differently. Good night, Dr. James. Wait. Don't close the door. Dr. Butler, you're going to wish you had loaned me that money. (laughs) Yes? Yes. Believe me, you are. Professor? Professor Powell? I'm in here, Frankie. Come in. Yeah, sure, Professor. Well, I seen him. 
the Doc Butler you sent me to, and I told him what you said. Well, did you now, Frankie? Excellent. And that means he'll pay. I, uh... I ain't doubting you, you understand, Prop, but what, uh, what makes you so sure? The fear of death, Frankie, my lad. The unreasonable but unqualified fear of being forcibly removed from this world. Do you understand, Frankie? Yeah, sure, sure, but, uh, what do you mean? Everyone has to die, Frankie. Not me. The few miserable years that may lie between the time fate dictates death, and I do, are cherished by ordinary men, cherished to a point where they will pay to ensure them. That's stupid, huh? From their viewpoint, no. For mine, yes. Personally, I fear no death. This enables me to work without conscience or fear of consequences. And now, Frankie, to the business in hand. Yeah. Did this Dr. Butler say he would pay my $10,000 fee? He, uh, he didn't say exactly. In fact, he practically tossed me out on my ear. Good. Good? Of course. He's the first man in this town whom we have approached. Doesn't matter whether he pays us or we kill him. If he pays, we have the money. If not, we have an object lesson to cite for the next individual we solicit. Now, let us ponder the problem of doing away with Dr. Butler. Final Vance is outside. By all means, Miss Williams, ask him to come in. I've been expecting him. Vance, it's a pleasure to see you. Come right in. Thank you, Markham. Thank you. Glad you called me. I hope I didn't get you here under false pretenses, Vance. When the district attorney sends for his friend, a private investigator, how could the pretenses be false? Well, for one thing, Vance, I have no case for you to work on. Oh. At least I don't think I have. My call was sort of a precautionary measure. Vance, did you ever hear of Professor Powell? Vaguely. Isn't he an extortion specialist who operates in the Middle West? He did, formerly. He's either in town now or on the way here. I received a wire this morning from the chief of police at Allentown saying he thought Powell was en route here. Hmm. I seem to recall this Powell made a specialty of getting money from professional men. Yes, according to the file we have on him. Avance, maybe this is coincidence, or perhaps Professor Powell has started operations here. But this morning, a dentist, Dr. Michael Butler, was found dead in his office. Really? What were the circumstances? Well, to be frank with you, they don't necessarily indicate murder. Oh? He was found lying on the floor of his office with no obvious indication of how he met his death. Is that so? The only thing strange is he had a loaded revolver in his pocket. Hmm. You know, Markham, it strikes me that there is a definite connection between this mysterious Professor Powell and the death of Dr. Buckler. I suggest we go to the doctor's office now. Would you close the door to the reception room, please, Markham? All right, Vance. I want to take a look around Dr. Butler's office. The body was found here, right? Yes, that's correct. And his dental instruments are in the sterilizer ready for the day's work to be started. Except for the fact that the body's been removed, nothing's been touched. I see. Hmm. There's a glass jar filled with alcohol. Many dentists use this for cold sterilization. Do me a favor, please, my friend. Open the sterilizer and see if there's a hypodermic syringe in it. Certainly, Vance. Yes, I see one. Oh, gosh, this is hot. In that case, I think Dr. Butler was murdered, all right. And I think I can tell you how. Oh, no, Van. Oh, yes, Markham. The fact that the hypodermic syringe within the sterilizer tells me it doesn't belong there. It belongs in this jar of alcohol. Otherwise, there'd be no reason for the jar of alcohol. I understand that, but not what makes you think this was murder. Or how you know how Dr. Butler was murdered. I think the murderer came in here, took this hypodermic, which is generally used to shoot Novocaine into a patient's gums, and filled it with poison. Then he used it on Dr. Butler and returned it to the sterilizer. But if the murderer got the hypodermic syringe from the alcohol jar, why return it to the sterilizer? Very simple reason, Martin. Our murderer was pretty clever. He thought putting it back in alcohol would preserve the poison, but that putting it in the sterilizer would destroy all traces of the poison. It was natural that the hypodermic be put into the sterilizer. That would cover up the crime beautifully, or so it was imagined. Well, Vance, it seems to me that if this is so, and I'm not doubting it, mind you that you have encountered Professor Powell and have won the initial victory. Perhaps, providing that the professor is responsible for this. Personally, I'm not convinced it was he. I'm going to Dr. Butler's home. He was married, you said? Yes, he lived alone with his wife. Well, I'm going to phone and ask if I may come out to see her. I'll be in touch with you as soon as I have something important to tell you. Vance, with you on the job, that won't be too long. I'll be waiting. <laughs> Mr. 
Mister, only there ain't nobody home. No? No. The reason there ain't nobody home is because they knew I'd be here to collect the money they owe me. I'm Helma. I was the maid here till yesterday. My name is Vance. I had an appointment with Mrs. Butler. I felt certain she'd keep it. I had an appointment with her, too. Get my money. Five weeks they owed me for. Kept me waiting with all that money they have. She owe you money, too? Hardly. I wanted something else. Information. It doesn't look as if I'll get what I came after, either. All I can tell you, Markham, is that I had an appointment with Mrs. Butler, but she wasn't at her house when I got there. So I came back to the office. Can't understand that, Vance, but I'm sure we can pick her up if we want her. I'd like to be assured of picking up Professor Powell, though. You'll get him, too, Markham. Well, thanks for letting me know that the medical examiner found that poison had been injected into Dr. Butler. It's nice to know I was right. Aren't you always? You know, the hypodermic left such a minute hole, it just wasn't detected until you asked that it be looked for particularly. Sometimes... Excuse me, Markham, for breaking in on something I know I'd enjoy hearing, but there's someone at the door and Miss Deering's out. I'll call you back. Do that. Bye. Bye. Come in. Mr. Vance? Yes? I'm Grace Butler. How do you do? I'm sorry. I, I wasn't home as I said I'd be. I, I just can't stay in that house anymore now that Michael... That's understandable. Please come in, Mrs. Butler. Thank you. May I... May I sit here? Please do. Mrs. Butler, when I spoke to you on the telephone, you told me your husband had been threatened by a mysterious Professor Powell. Mm. Mrs. Butler, was your husband very wealthy? Yes, I, I suppose you would say he was wealthy. And you inherit most of his money? Yes. You're not trying to... I'm not trying to do anything except establish a clear picture of this case. You also told me of a threat made by a Dr. Stanley James to whom your husband refused to lend money. Yes. He hated my husband. And my husband expected trouble, Mr. Van. Before he left home this morning, he put a loaded revolver in his pocket. Yes, I know. We've withheld that fact from the newspaper, but we found the gun. Now all that remains to be done is to find your husband's murderer. Attorney Markham. The Butler murder case opened with the death of Dr. Michael Butler. Final Vance reasoned that he was killed by an injection of poison into his body, and later investigation proved this correct. Vance's suspects include Professor Powell, an extortionist, Dr. Butler's widow, and another dentist, Stanley James. My secretary has told me that Vance is on the way into my office, and I have been waiting for him. Markham, my friend, how are you? Fine, Vance, fine. I imagine you have news for me. No, not yet. I took a cab here to see your notes on the routine questioning of suspects. I have an idea they're going to be very important. May I? Well, they're Sergeant Heath's notes, but certainly, Vance, they're right here. You are? Thank you. Hmm. Dr. Stanley James admits he left his house early on morning of murder. Claims he went to the library. No corroboration. Let's see now. Mrs. Butler, asleep when husband left house. Collapsed when asked to identify body and on recovery asked that she not be made to look at it. Permission granted. Complete check of her background and associates reveals no hint of trouble between her and doctor. Well, Markham, as usual, our friend Heath is quite thorough. Yes, he is. Oh, excuse me, Vance. Hello, Markham speaking. Mr. Markham, this is Dr. Milstead, room 420, Johnson Building. Yes, Doctor. Mr. Markham... A man who calls himself Professor Powell just telephoned me to be in my office at 8 o'clock tonight. And not to notify the police or, or what happened to Dr. Butler would happen to me, too. You, you've you got to protect me. We will, Dr. Milstead. Standing next to me right now is Philo Vance. When the professor calls upon you, Mr. Vance will be there, too. It's just 8 o'clock, Mr. Vance, and... 
And to be honest about it, I, I'm a little nervous. No need to be, Dr. Milstead. I'm quite sure I can handle our friend Professor Powell when he arrives. Oh, I, I'm sure you can. And thank you, Vance, for coming here. No trouble at all. I've been wanting to meet the professor for some time. Oh, that must be he now. Professor Powell? He did die, Doctor. Will you come in here, please? Well, thank you, Doctor. Thank you. I thought you had another patient in here with you, and I didn't want to interrupt. I think you might prefer talking to me, Professor. My name is Vance. Philo Vance. Philo Vance. Well, I have an odd compliment for you, Mr. Vance. You. The mere fact that you were in this city postponed my coming here for several years. Thank you. Of course, I realize it is no coincidence that finds you here in this office, Vance. Dr. Milstead. Would you leave Professor Powell and myself alone for a bit? Oh, of course, Mr. Vance. I'll, I'll wait out in the reception office. Thank you, Doctor. Not at all. Well, Vance, this is indeed a compliment to my intelligence. Apparently, you wanted to meet me, eh? Definitely. I'm rather glad about it, by the way. You see, I think you're a killer. And I'm going to prove it. Mm. You mean Dr. Butler, of course. Well, it's quite possible that I didn't kill him, you know. He must have found out by now about his wife and that other dentist who hated him. As a matter of fact, I have. My compliments on providing suspects along with your murders, Professor Powell, very considerate of you. By the way, what are your intentions in regard to Dr. Milstead? <laughs> there are so many other doctors, Vance, and after all, Dr. Milstead did bring us together. He's perfectly safe, believe me. I'm sure he will be, now. Well, Professor Powell, I'm certain that this is au revoir. But we'll meet again. Believe me, we will, Vance. But the next circumstance may not be so pleasant for you. Frankie, my boy, we yeah. must think of something completely different. Completely wonderful for our Mr. Final Vance. You do the thinking, Professor. That's your department. Uh, thank you, Frankie. Now, let me see. There must be something that Vance can't possibly suspect. Something that is completely foolproof. Ah, he's a clever man, Frankie. A very clever man. If he's that clever, let's leave him alone. No, no, no. He's so clever, I can't afford to. Ooh. It can't be anything ordinary. Nothing obvious. No. There must be something I work out in careful detail. Something I... Mm. Frankie, I have it. Hold on to it, boss. I never forget anything, Frankie. Listen. Yeah? This is perfect. I'm convinced Vance is a menace. A definite menace to my future plans. I must do away with it. Oh, it sounds like you're in my department now, Pop. Hardly, hardly. Although you'll be called on to help. Sure. Frankie, Vance drives a 1944 Stanton convertible, dark green. Well, a lot of people drive green Stantons. That's right. Therefore, it shouldn't be hard for you to get me a car like that. Eh? What do I do? Heist it or buy it? It doesn't really matter as long as you get it. I'll consider it gotten. What happens then? Then I'm going to take a photograph of the inside of Vance's car. Yeah? If there's a worn spot on the flooring, I'm going to duplicate it in the car you get me. Uh -huh. I'm going to check a speedometer and fix our car the same way. I'm going to duplicate everything in Vance's car. You, uh, you mean there'll be no way of knowing it ain't his own car when Vance climbs in? That's huh? exactly what I mean. Uh-huh. And then, Frankie? Yeah? After I make our car an exact duplicate of Vance's, I'm going to fasten an explosive device to the starter and switch our car with his... How about keys, boss? He's going to know it ain't his car from the keys. I think not. Huh? Vance has his car delivered from the garage. The keys are left in it. It would be a simple matter to put his key ring in our car. Hey, Professor, all I got to do is get a car like Vance's and this thing can't miss, huh? That's right. You know, Frankie, I'm not sure as to whether Fa uh, Vance subscribes to my theory about the fallacy of prolonging life. But it would be a very good thing for him at the moment if he were reconciled to it. Gee, Professor, I sure did a good job of getting a car that was just like Vance's and of fixing the inside just like his, didn't I? Huh? Yeah, take a look at that bus in front of his door there, the one we're in, and you couldn't tell him apart. I even put his own radio back in our car. You did an admirable job, Frank. Thanks. Now, all that remains is to wait here until Vance leaves the building. Uh, tell me once more what you did so I know there's no slip-up. Yeah, okay. After I drove the car to Vance's place and fixed the gimmick to the starter, like you showed me, mm -hmm. I drove Vance's own car up the block and called you. You hopped the cab and came down. Here we are in Vance's own car. Good, good. Very good, Frankie. Uh, 
Okay, here comes Vance and his friend, the district attorney, out of their building now. Yeah, boss, and they're heading for the car we gimmicked up. I don't think it would be wise for us to be in this vicinity after the explosion, Frankie. Perhaps it would be better if we left right now. Okay, boss, you say so. Well, here goes. On with the ignition. You better hurry, Frankie. Yeah. Vance and Malcolm are getting into this car. On with the starter now. Here we go. <laughs> I think Powell is still breathing. He is. Powell. Professor Powell. The doctor said Professor Powell would probably regain consciousness before he died, Vance. Looks as if he was right. Yes, it does. He shows signs of coming out of the results of that explosion. I'm going to talk to him. Powell. Professor Powell. <sighs> Hello, Vance. How did this happen to me? It was simple, Powell. I didn't fall for your trick of switching cars. So when your man here went to telephone you... I switched the cars back to their original status, pushing the rigged car and not using the starter. You, you saw what Frankie had done with the cars, Vance? Well, I didn't actually witness it, but I did look in what was supposed to be my car a little while ago. It seems your man forgot one detail. I didn't think you'd trust the actual work to an underling. No. No, I guess that was a mistake. But I do have the satisfaction of having committed a murder and not being caught. That is something, Vance. You killed Dr. Butler? Of course. I killed him. And you never knew it was I. You never would have been able to prove it. You weren't really so brilliant. Who are you, Vance? He's gone, Vance. Yes, I know. Well, his death did us a lot of good. We got rid of him and cleared up the Dr. Butler murder case. We know now that it was Powell who killed Butler. Do we, Markham? I think not. I think you'd be very wise if you arrested the real murderer, Mrs. Grace Butler. continually being embarrassed by lack of cash. When she heard about Professor Powell's threat to her husband, she decided to make sure the doctor died, knowing Powell would be blamed. That's reasonable enough. Of course. So she stole out of the house as he was dressing on the morning of the murder, came to his office, and waited for him with the hypodermic in her hand. She hid the hypo in her hand, put her arms around her husband as if to embrace him, and shoved the needle into him. Death was practically instantaneous. Yes. Then she went through the routine of putting the hypodermic into the sterilizer, trying to eliminate all traces of the poison. That's all very well, of course, Vance, but why did Professor Powell insist he kill Dr. Butler? The colossal conceit of the man was responsible, Markham. He wanted us to think that he had committed a murder which couldn't be pinned on him. If he left that thought with us, well, he was content to die. Yes. Knowing his philosophy, that isn't hard to understand. Now, one more thing, Vance. What made you suspect Mrs. Butler? Something very definite, Markham. She told us she was asleep when Butler left the house the morning of his death. She never looked at the body, yet she knew her husband had put a loaded revolver in his coat pocket. She couldn't have known it unless she did see him that morning. When she denied seeing him, it could only be for the purpose of covering up the fact that she killed him. Uh, tell me one more thing, Vance. How did you know that your car had been switched so that you in turn could switch it back? The cars were exact duplicates. Yes, they were, Markham. All except for one little detail. The gas gauge in my car wasn't working. It didn't register at all. When I got into the car in front of my door, turned on the ignition, and saw the register indicate it was half full of gasoline. I knew it wasn't my car. Oh, I see. Then I looked down the street, and there was my sin. So you figured out the professor's plan. Lucky for both of us, I did, don't you think? <laughs> Luck had nothing to do with it, Vance. Remind me never to commit a murder when you're around. You're reminded, my friend. And incidentally, while we're on the subject, you're also reminded that this is the end of the Butler murder case.
Exactly, Mrs. Wentworth. Perhaps a little sleeve alteration, oh, but... Miss Collins, could I see you a moment, please? Of course, Miss Payne. Oh, excuse me, please, Mrs. Wentworth. I won't be long. You wanted to see me, Miss Payne? Yes, I do. Would you please come into my office with me? Of course. I just saw the sales figures for last week, Miss Payne. They're up from the same week last year and the year before. Yes, I imagine they would be. The, um, the year before was the year you came with me, wasn't it? Yes, that's right. I'll be here two years this month. Yes, that's what I thought. Come in, Clay. Oh, thank you. You may uh, sit down if you like. Thank you. Now then, you were saying something about sales figures, Claire. About the fact that they're up. Yes. I imagine profits are up accordingly. How much would they be up if you hadn't been stealing from the shop? Miss Payne. Now, let's stop the pretense. I know all about your declaring yourself in on the profits, Claire. Well, I... The only thing I don't know is how you're going to pay back what you've stolen. According to these records, the amount is $12,465. I needed the money, Miss Payne, and I had to have it. I'll pay you back. Will you? Then there isn't any more to be said, is there? $12,465 by Saturday of this week. That is all, Claire. Saturday of this week? But I couldn't if possibly... If I don't have the money by Saturday, I shall turn the entire matter over to the police. You have until Saturday, Claire. I have until Saturday to get the money. That isn't very long, is it? But perhaps it does give me time enough to find another way out. Come in any time, Mrs. James, and I'm sure we'll have something that you'll like. Goodbye. <sighs> Come. Hello, Edith. Sydney. What do you want here? A job in the store, Edith. I need a job pretty bad. How the mighty have fallen. What do you think you could do around here? Anything. Anything at all. Stock clerk, maybe? Shipping room? Anything you wanted me to do. Hmm. You know, Sidney, if I ever needed any assurance of my success, your being here, asking for a job, would do the trick. What about the job, Edith? You'd better get used to calling me Miss Payne. You remember my last name, don't you? I remember everything about you. How you came to my shop, this same shop, five years ago, and asked me for a job. And how I gave it to you. Yes, yes, you did. As a stock clerk, $12 a week, with a chance for advancement. You certainly advanced, and quickly. Hmm. Before I knew it, I was depending on you for everything. And then one day, I found you had control of my business. That won't happen again, Sidney. The other way around, I mean. All right, you start as a stock clerk for $12 a week. And no chance for advancement. Want the job? It is... Nobody can say I don't remember my friend. Oh, excuse me, friend. Miss Payne speaking. This is Tom Henderson, Miss Payne. Oh, yes, Mr. Henderson. I own the Paris import dress shop on Fifth Avenue. I know. What can I do for you? I'll tell you what you can do. You can stop sending those snoopers of yours over to my store to sketch my imports so you can make them up cheaper. That's what you can do. Uh, so far as I've been able to find out, there are no copyrights on designs, Mr. Henderson. And besides, my designers just happen to think of the same models that you go to the expense of importing. Is that all? No, it isn't all. My business has been cut in half. I'm on the verge of bankruptcy because of your unethical tactics. But you're going to have to stop, Miss Payne, or I'll find a way to stop you. That is all. Hmm. <laughs> Very excitable man. <sighs> now, where were we, Sidney? You were offering me a job. At $12 a week. The same job under the same circumstances that I offered you five years ago. Not exactly the same circumstances, Sidney. You see, I was smarter than you are. And I still am. You want a job. You've got it. Now go on, go on, get out and tell the bookkeeper. Only leave me alone right now. I have troubles. Have you, Edith? I mean, Miss Payne. 
I don't doubt it. You can't push little people around without having worries. Yes, my dear. One little person can see to it that you have one big trouble. Taxi? Taxi. Good evening, Miss Payne. Oh, it's you, Sydney. Through for the day so early. Get me a cab, will you? All right, Edith. I mean, Miss Payne. But I think I'll have better luck down at the corner. It's only a short walk. Shall I try there? Might as well. Oh, I'll go with you. Well, how did you uh, like your first day in what was once your dress shop? I didn't mind. Too much. You shouldn't mind, you know. You asked for a job, and I gave you one. Incidentally, you forgot to thank me. I have a lot of things to thank you for, Miss Payne. Yes, well, I'd just as soon not hear about them. Well, here's the corner. What about a cab? Taxi! Are all the cabs taken? In my present financial condition, cabs don't represent much of a problem to me. A popular corner we stopped on. Mm, People waiting for the lights to change before they cross the street. Sydney, what about that cab? There should be one along in a minute. Well, somebody else had the same idea about taxi cabs in this corner, apparently. Look there in back of us. The rather tall man. The one in the striped trousers and dark coat? Who's he? Tom Henderson. You should remember him. He's one of our competitors. Only right now, he insists I'm putting him into bankruptcy by stealing his exclusive imports and copying them. Oh, silly fellow. Taxi! Oh, darn. Plenty of empty trucks, but not too many empty cabs. Oh, wait here, Miss Payne. I think I see a cab pulling into the compact there. All right, but hurry, will you? Well, come right into my private office, Markham. You alone? Yes, Miss Deering's out to lunch and my other secretary's on an errand, so I'm holding down the fort all by myself. How are you, Vance? Well, thank you. And my favorite district attorney. All right, thanks. Uh, how busy are you at the moment, Vance? Very. Unless there happens to be a murder my favorite district attorney wants investigated. There happens to be a murder. In that case, I'm completely at your service. Details, Markham. What are the details? Well, Vance, a woman named Edith Payne owned a very successful dress shop. Mm -hmm. She was standing on the corner of Fifth and Main waiting for a cab when suddenly she cried out. And an instant later, she was dead under the wheels of a truck. Well, I follow that, Mark. We got one break on the case, Vance. A newspaper photographer happened to be in the crowd. He heard her scream and managed to get a picture of her lying on the ground. Now, you can see the figures of the people who were in back of her, but not their faces. The camera was pointed down at the ground, is that right? Yes, Uh, Before I show you the print, Vance, I want to tell you what else we know of this case. Sergeant Heath made inquiries and found out that a man who admits being with Miss Payne, but claims he left her a moment before, once owned the shop, but was now working for her. His name is Sidney Taylor. And he was with her at the corner. Yes. Uh, Sergeant Heath uncovered another suspect for you, too. A man named Tom Henderson, who was being forced out of business by Miss Payne. Uh Uh-huh. He found out at the shop that he was intensely bitter about it. And, uh, well, that's all I can tell you. Now is the picture of the body of Miss Payne in the crowd. Hmm. Doesn't seem to tell us much, does it? People are pretty hard to identify when their faces aren't shown. But it can be done. It can? How? Clothes, posture, some idiosyncrasy of dress peculiar to a particular individual. Oh, I see. Yes, it can be done, Markham, and in this case, I'd say it had better be done. What's this? What's what? This figure in the front row of the crowd. The man wearing the double-breasted herringbone suit? Yeah. What about him? I don't know. But there's something peculiar about this suit. What's wrong with it, Markham? I'm sure I don't know. (laughs) It doesn't fit very well. No, 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 that isn't it. It's something else. may not be important, though. Markham, what kind of a man is this Tom Henderson? Well, from what I've learned, very stately, well turned out, and his store had quite a society clientele. Really? Then this conceivably might be his picture right here. Where? You see the cutaway trousers in the front row? Oh, yes. Henderson might well be wearing a cutaway in view of his ultra dress shop. Hmm. We can check that, of course. Mm -hmm. That uh, herringbone suit still puzzles you, Vance? Very much. 
I wish I could figure what was wrong with it. Well, Markham, I think we've spent enough time here. Let's go down to Miss Payne's dress shop and see what we can find out there. You say your name is Claire Collins and you're the manager of this shop. That's right, Mr. Vance. It was I who told Sergeant Heath about the trouble Miss Payne was having with Tom Henderson. That's correct, Vance. She also informed me of the fact that Sidney Taylor, who used to own this shop, was with Miss Payne. How did you know that, Miss Collins? Well, I saw them leave together. I go in the opposite direction, but I saw them walk toward the corner together. Well, that's logical enough. Uh, you may go if you like, Miss Collins. Only, please don't leave the store. You're an excellent source of information, and I'd like to keep you handy. <laughs> Glad to be of assistance, Mr. Vance. Oh, just one moment, Miss Collins. Hmm? Uh, would you take a look at this picture, please? Certainly. Well? Do you recognize anyone in this picture besides Miss Payne, of course? Well, how could I? There aren't any faces shown. Oh, I didn't think you'd be able to pick anyone out, but there was always a chance. Miss Collins, there was no bad feeling between Miss Payne and you, was there? Of course not. Thank you. You may go now. I'll send for you if I want you. All right, Mr. Vance. I'll be where I can be reached. Well, Vance... Attractive, isn't she? Yes, yes, very. Uh, I see you're looking at Miss Payne's daily calendar. Anything there? Not yet. Just routine appointments, I'd say. Mm -hmm. What's this? Mm, what's what? On this page. Take a look, Morgan. On the page reserved for Saturday of this week, there are these four letters. What do you make of them? Well, they look like... Well, that first letter looks like a P... The second is definitely an I, and the last two are two C's. P-I-C-C. -C. What does that spell or stand for? I don't know yet. Oh, but that first letter isn't a P, Markham. The first stroke is curved, not up and down. Well, perhaps it's code of some kind. No, no, I think I know what it is now. I'll give you this much of a hint. The C-C, those last two letters, unless I'm very much mistaken. Which you rarely are. Thank you. <laughs> Stand for Claire Collins, the young lady who was just in here. Oh. And the first two? They're shorthand symbols, Markham. Pittman shorthand. Transcribed, the notes under Saturday's date read, Last Day, Claire Collins. The Herringbone murder case opened with the finding of the body of Edith Payne, dress shop owner. She had apparently been pushed under the wheels of a truck, and a newspaper photographer passing by had snapped a picture almost immediately after the accident. No one in the crowd that surrounded the body was identifiable. Later, at the dress shop, Philo Vance discovered a memorandum concerning the store manager, Claire Collins, left by the dead owner. Vance has appeared puzzled by a figure in the photograph, the figure of a man wearing a double-breasted suit. He hinted there was something wrong with it, and in an effort to find out what, I have gone to a photography studio. Of course, Mr. Markham, you closed the coat. I'm sorry. Never do I photograph a man in a double-breasted suit with the coat open. Yes, yes. Always it has to be buttoned. Yes. Please. Of course, Mr. Verdi, of course. There. Now, remember, I don't want my face shown, just the suit. No face. No face. Forty years I have been taking pictures. This I never heard of before. Except perhaps if this is to be a, a fashion picture. Oh, no, 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 hardly. <laughs> Very well. You tell me what you want. I take the picture. Thank you. Hold still, please. I'm sorry. One moment and it will be all over. That's fine, Mr. Roberti. I have a great deal to do. And the sooner I get this picture, the sooner I may be able to show my friend Philo Vance some results. <laughs> Yes? Mr. Henderson, there's a gentleman in the outer office who wishes to see you. He says his name is Sidney Taylor. Taylor, huh? Fine. Send him in, please. Sidney Taylor coming to see me. <laughs> I wonder if... Yes, 
Mr. Henderson? Come in. Come in, Mr. Taylor. Sit down. Thank you. You know me, Mr. Henderson? I know about you. You once owned the dress shop Edith Payne was running. That's right. I had no love for her, Mr. Henderson. I have no feeling of remorse now that she's gone. Remorse? You mean you killed her? Mr. Henderson, how much do you think the police would like to know that you were on the corner in back of us when Edith Payne was murdered? If they knew that she was ruining my business, I imagine they would be very interested. If I were there. Well, if you were there, all right. I saw you. Only I have no intention of telling that to the police. No? No. And this isn't blackmail or a threat of any kind, Mr. Henderson. I just would like a job in your store. I know the business very well, and I could be valuable. Hmm. It isn't blackmail, but you want a job, or you will talk. That's right. Sorry, Mr. Taylor. If you'd come here an hour ago, I might have listened to your proposition. An hour ago? Yes. You see, Philo Vance was here. He seemed to know I was on that corner. Something he figured out from a picture. There's nothing you can do to me or for me, Mr. Taylor. I'm in this thing right up to my neck. just dropped into your office for a moment, Markham. I want another look at that photograph of the crowd at the death scene. Uh, that double-breasted herringbone suit still has you stopped, Vance? Well, I wouldn't say that exactly, Markham. What about that mysterious memorandum you deciphered from Miss Payne's calendar? The one that read, Last Day, Claire Collins. I'll get to that in due time. Vance, I'm quite convinced that you know more about the solution of this case than you're admitting. Why the reticence? I'm not holding back because I want to be secretive, Markham. It's true, I have a definite idea as to who killed Miss Payne. But you're the district attorney, and you're liable to become prejudiced against the person who I think is guilty. If you think he's guilty, Vance, I guarantee he is. That's just what I meant. I'd rather wait until I had proof. Just as you say. But I felt a little unhappy about that herringbone suited figure. You mentioned there was something wrong with the suit, so I had a picture taken of myself to compare with it. And you found that there was a difference in the way your suit was buttoned and the way the one in the group picture was buttoned. You knew that, Vance? I realized what was wrong with the herringbone suit after I left you, Markham. Sorry you went to the trouble of having a picture taken. <laughs> so am I now. Do you think that the herringbone suit is important, Vance, in the solving of this case, I mean? Important, Markham? No, I wouldn't say it was important. I'd say it was vital. <laughs> Vance, private investigator. Miss Gorham speaking. Miss Gorham, this is Mr. Vance. Is Miss Deering there? No, she's not. She's doing some research at the library. Can I help? Yes, you can, Miss Gorham. I'm going to give you the home addresses of two people, Sidney Taylor and Thomas Henderson. I want you to use some pretext or other and get into their homes. I want to know whether either of them owns a double-breasted herringbone suit. I'll try to find out, sir. Good. Oh, give me the addresses, Mr. Vance, and find the herringbone suit for you. Frankly, I hope you don't. Oh? You see, I'm going to see a man whom I don't know, doesn't know me, but who I think can supply the ending to the Herringbone murder case. Yeah? How do you do? My name is Vance. You don't know me. No kidding. Of course I don't know you. And I let you in on something. That's okay with oh, me. Just one moment, please. I'm not selling anything. That's good, because I'm not buying nothing. So suppose we start by you knocking on the door, and this time I'll ignore it. So long. Wait a moment. Just one moment. How would you like to make $50? Oh, I see. You're not selling anything. You're the one that's buying. That's right. $50 worth of the answer to one question. <laughs> Brother, this beats those radio quiz games. you got to work up to the big money question on them. Well, what is it? Do you own a double-breasted herringbone suit, and did you let somebody else wear it yesterday? That's really two questions, but I'll let it go on a corner. There's only one answer to both of them. The answer is yes. Yeah. Thank you. Here's your money. You've earned it. I have. Well, what do you know about that? Hey, call again, will you, Mr. Vance? Call again. <laughs> Vance, Mr. Markham. I'm not used to standing on street corners I'm like sorry, this. Miss Collins. Apparently, Mr. Vance has been delayed, but he'll be here, I'm certain. Why don't you join Mr. Taylor and Mr. Henderson? They don't seem to mind waiting. Look, I don't care what they mind. Well, all I can tell you is that Mr. Vance asked that you, Taylor, and Henderson be here. Hmm. 
Here comes a truck headed for this corner. I thought I left orders for no traffic to come through here. <laughs> Maybe the truck is getting restless, too. That isn't the reason. Look who's riding with the driver. It's Vance. <laughs> what happened, Vance? Couldn't you get a cab? Hello, Markham. Miss Collins. Sorry I was delayed a bit. Well, I see you have Mr. Taylor and Mr. Henderson waiting. Yes, Vance, I have. Uh, what's this outdoor meeting for? Well, you should know by now, Markham. You mean this is the payoff? You know who killed Edith Payne, and you're going to prove it. Make that I hope to prove it, and you'll be right. Um, call our two friends over here, will you, Markham, please? Of course, Vance. I'll go get them first. Oh, I hope you have a good reason for all of this, Vance. I have, I assure you. Now, you all want to know why you were brought here, don't you? Of course we do. You're entitled to that information, Mr. Henderson. This is the corner where Miss Payne was pushed under the wheels of a truck. I know you were in the crowd, Mr. Henderson. So please stand where you were at the time. Well, I'm not sure exactly where I was. I am. I studied the photograph taken at the scene a dozen times. You were immediately in back of where Miss Payne had been standing. Right there, please. All right. Thank you. Yes, but what am I doing here, Vance? You, Miss Collins? Yes, me. I told you I wasn't here when Miss Payne was killed. I'd gone the other way, to the subway. Yes, you did tell me that, didn't you? It must have slipped my mind. Uh, Mr. Taylor, you were right alongside of Miss Payne a moment before she was pushed, right? Yes. I was standing right about here before I went for a cab. Uh, Vance, what about our mysterious man in the double-breasted herringbone suit? Where does he fit in this? I'll show you in a moment. I brought a double-breasted suit coat with me on the truck. Uh, Mac, would you hand me that coat, please? Right. Thanks. Now, Miss Collins, will you put this on over your dress and stand right about there? <sighs> All right, but... I never heard anything so ridiculous in my life. Perhaps not. Oh, uh, button the coat, will you, Miss Collins? Certainly. There. Now what? Now, Miss Collins, I'm sure you won't give Mr. Markham any trouble when he takes you to headquarters. You see, you've just convinced me that you are the murderer of Edith Payne. <laughs> this in very small pieces, please, Vance. The explanation of how you knew Claire Collins pushed Miss Payne to her death, I mean. Certainly, Markham. First of all, you're entitled to know how I knew it was a woman. I go along with that. It was a herringbone suit, Markham. The double-breasted herringbone suit we saw in that picture. It was buttoned the wrong way. Yes, I know. Buttoned from right to left. A woman buttons everything that way, from a blouse to a top coat. And a man buttons everything from left to right. I'm beginning to understand your logic now. You were convinced that the herringbone wearer was a woman. You wanted to know what a woman would be doing at the scene of a crime wearing a man's suit. Right. She probably wore it so that if she had to skip in a hurry, witnesses would say a man was seen running away. She didn't have to run because apparently nobody saw her push Miss Payne. But Vance, any woman could have been wearing a man's suit. Why did it have to be Miss Collins? Markham, where would a woman get a man's suit? Hmm, rent it. Or buy it, I say. Renting it would be dangerous. The suit wasn't new, so it wasn't bought. Of course, it could have been a second-hand suit that was purchased, but fortunately, it wasn't. Well, how was it gotten? It was borrowed from a neighbor, just as I thought it would be. I went to Miss Collins' apartment house and questioned her neighbors until I found a man who'd loaned her his double-breasted suit. Then, when I rode up on the truck this afternoon, I had her put on a coat just to make sure she buttoned it as all women do, from right to left. Yes, yes, I understand now. Uh, Vance, do you know why Miss Collins killed Miss Payne? No, I'll admit I don't know the motive. Well, then, for a change, I can tell you something. It seems that Miss Payne had given her until Saturday to return the money she had stolen or be turned over to the police. She couldn't return the money, so she did away with Miss Payne and would have been in the clear if it weren't for you. <laughs> a lot of people must hate you, Vance. Most criminals do, I imagine. Uh, you're not included in that not-so-select group, are you, Martin? Me? Oh, no, Vance, I'm on your side. I'm one of the many who want to see you operate and wind up mysteries, just as you wound up the herringbone murder case.
this today's collection, Donald? Uh, yes, Mr. Miller. I opened the mail myself this morning. And all the checks are here? Hmm? Ah, fine. Tell me, what's the total? $12,450. All the checks are made out to consolidated charities, Mr. Miller. Of course. That's so that no irresponsible party can cash them, Donald. You see, people who contribute to our campaign want to make sure that the money goes to charity. I understand, sir. Would you be interested in the total we've collected so far? Yes. What is the amount? Uh, here it is. $130,000. Good. And our campaign is less than two weeks old. Everything is going according to plan. Oh, Donald, has Morton Gary phoned today? Uh, not yet. I imagine he will, though. He's very interested in knowing how the drive is coming. He is taking that business of being chairman of Consolidated Charities too seriously. Oh, you think he may be a problem? Perhaps. It's Gary is a very prominent man. We need him. His name on our letterhead assures the legitimacy of our organization. Mr. Miller. Yes? What happens if Mr. Gary finds out what's really happening to the money? You mean suppose he finds out that only a small percentage goes to charity and I pocket the rest? Yes, sir. I don't think he'll find out, Donald. I'll answer that. Hello? Mike, Elise Avery. Hello, Elise. I thought this was old man Gary calling in. What's going on? I just hit a big one, Mike. Some sucker just gave me a check for five grand. Good for you, girl. Bring it in with you. Sure. Just thought you'd like to hear the good news, that's all. See you later. Bye. Bye. Now, where were we, Donald? We were just talking about Morton Gary. And what would happen if he found out what we're doing and the money we're collecting? First of all, he isn't going to find out. No. No. And second, even if he does, it doesn't matter too much. He'll squawk, Mr. Miller. He'll take this up with the police, maybe with the FBI. After all, we're using the mails. Yes, that's true, Donald. We are using the mails. And the mails are bringing us in a fortune. But Gary won't talk. Believe me. And even if he does start to talk, he'll never finish what he's saying. You can believe that, too. with a check for 5000 The one you phoned about? Mm-hmm. Lay it right here, lady. I want to look at it. Here you are, chum. Pay to the order of Consolidated Charities. 5000. Endorse it, cash it, and it's all yours. <laughs> People sure are suckers, aren't they, honey? <laughs> $5,000. You'd think they'd investigate a charity before they start giving their money away. Sure. But there are lots of legitimate charities, thank goodness. That makes our job that much easier. Oh, uh, Mike, let me take a look at that list. What list? The list of guys who've kicked in and the amounts. I need some dough. Thought maybe you'd give me a check for my commissions. Well, uh, I'll have to get it for you, Elise. Okay, but uh, while we're waiting, suppose you give me my cut of this five grand I just brought in. Uh-uh. Gotta wait till the check clears the bank, baby. You know, you've been dealing with suckers all day. Kindly remember that I'm not one of them. Me either, Mike. That's why I want my commission on the dough I've already brought in. You'll get it. Donald is figuring out what I owe you. He'll have the figures in an hour. Then, if you're a good girl, I'll give you a check. Kid, if I was a good girl, I wouldn't be in this racket. But uh, bad or good, I'll get that check. You're pretty sure you'll get it, hmm? If I don't get it, Mike, you'll get it. Right in the neck. <laughs> I beg your pardon, miss. Yes? I'd like to see the district attorney, please. My name is Morton Gary. Oh, yes, Mr. Gary. You telephoned for an appointment, didn't you? Uh, Yes, I did. Uh, Well, just a moment, sir. I'll find out if Mr. Markham can see you now. Thank you. Yes, Miss Williams. Uh, Mr. Morton Gary to see you, Mr. Markham, uh, by appointment. I ask him to come in, please. Would you go right in, Mr. Gary? Right through that door there. Uh, this door here? Uh, yes. Yes, that's the one, Mr. Gary. Oh, thank you, miss. Thank you. Mr. Markham? Uh, come in, please, Mr. Gary. How do you do, Mr. Markham? Mr. Gary, please sit down, sir. Oh, thank you, thank you. 
Mr. Markham, I have come to ask you to investigate a very unscrupulous man, Mr. Michael Miller. Miller? I don't believe I know the name. I didn't either until a few weeks ago. He's not from this city, Mr. Markham. He claimed to be very philanthropic and was forming an organization to be known as Consolidated Charities. Yes, Mr. Gary. He induced me to lend my name to the organization, which I did. Uh, Many of my friends have contributed to it. And now I have reason to believe the entire thing is a fraud. I see. He's collecting money but not turning it over to charity, is that it? Oh, I believe he is turning over a small percentage of the money to legitimate societies, Mr. Markham. But I've asked to see statements of monies collected and dispersed, and Mr. Miller has refused to allow me to see any records. Mm, I begin to understand your suspicions, Mr. Gary. Michael Miller, you said the man's name was? Uh, That's correct. His officers are in the Lions building. Well, I'll investigate this at once, Mr. Gary, and thank you for calling it to my attention. If your suspicions are correct, we'll put a stop to this racket, but fast. Nine, three, one. Philo Vance speaking. Uh, Vance, this is Markham. Well, my favorite district attorney calling me at home. Thank you. Sounds important, Markham. It is. I called your office and they said you'd left for the day, Vance. I'm in the office of the Consolidated Charities in the Lions Building. How soon can you get here? At once, if it's important. It's very important. We had a complaint late this afternoon about a Mr. Michael Miller, who was the head of the supposed charity organization. Actually, it was a racket. Go ahead, Markham. Who made the complaint? Morton Gary. Oh. You know him, Vance? Yes, I do. Very honest, very wealthy, and very gullible. Well, when I got to this Miller's office a little while ago, Vance, I found Miller dead. He'd been shot twice, once in the heart and once in the calf of his leg. Really, Markham? How strange. And there are no records of any kind here, Vance. Apparently, the murderer took them with him. All that was here when we broke in was the body. The lists are missing, eh, Markham? Yes. Hmm. Apparently, we have a listless murder case. Well, just to generate a little action in it, suppose I describe Miller's killer for you. Describe him, Vance? You haven't even seen the body. You don't know any more about this case than I've just told you. You, How can you possibly describe Miller's murderer? I'll explain that to you later, Markham. Right now, all I'll tell you is to look for a murderer with a bruise on his cheek or a black eye. I'm on my way down to meet you now. Vance, I have Sergeant Heath out searching for someone who has a connection with this case and who also has a black eye or bruised cheek. Now, tell me why. One of the nicest things about you, Markham, is that you do things that I suggest without demanding an explanation. Hmm. Let us retain that fine point in our association until the proper time, shall we? I know your reasoning, Vance. You believe that if you were to explain why you think the murderer is bruised, I'd be prejudiced immediately against any suspect we turned up who did have such a mark. Exactly. Yes. And up until now, I'm quoting only theory, Markham, not fact or proof. Good enough, Vance, good enough. Uh, By the way, if you can table your theory temporarily... We have a suspect for you. Really? Who? A girl named Elise Avery. She's in the next room now. It seems that she came into the Consolidated Charities office while I was waiting for you. She admits she worked here, but denies any knowledge of the shooting of Mr. Miller. Nobody makes our job simple anymore, Markham, do they? That should make you very happy, Vance. You and your theory about the bruise on the killer's face. Do you want to go in and see Miss Avery? Do you think I should? Uh, She's very attractive. I should. I'll report any development to you, Markham. Do that, Vance. Do that. I'll be here somewhere trying to find some records of contributions. They must be around unless the murderer took them with him. Which is not at all unlikely. See you in a little while, Vance. Right. I'll go in and talk to Miss Avery now. My, um, hello. Hello. Miss Avery, I'm Philo Vance. Really? You're not at all the way I pictured you, Vance. No? Mm Mm-mm. Should I be flattered or ashamed? Oh, I didn't know you were so uh, distinguished looking. I am ashamed of those newspaper pictures. <laughs> oh, I like that. You're either very easily pleased, Miss Avery, or very anxious to cater to my vanity. In either case, there are several questions I want to ask you. Oh, I'll uh, save you the trouble of asking, Vance. I've got the answers already. Oh, yes? Yes. My name is Elise Avery. I worked for Consolidated Charities soliciting contributions. I got a salary. I had no idea this was a racket, and I don't know who killed Mr. Miller. Very interesting, very informative, and very pat. 
Miss Avery, you know that Mr. Miller was killed by a bullet in the heart? Yes, I do. Mr. Martin told me that. He also told me about a bullet in the calf of his leg. Oh, I don't see the connection, if any. I believe there is one, Miss Avery. Vance, may I confess something? Not the murder. No, of course not. Then go right ahead. I've uh, wanted to meet you for a long time, Vance. Ever since I first saw your picture in the papers and began reading about you. We went through this flattery routine a while ago, didn't we? Oh, I don't want anything from you, Vance. I'm not looking for any favors for what I'm saying. That uh, just happens to be the way I feel. And so, I'm saying it. Well, I find this most enjoyable. Please continue. All right. I've often wondered what kind of a man you were, uh, uh, where a woman was concerned. Oh. Mm -hmm. Most of the men I've known were dull. You look different. You uh, sounded different in the stories I read about you. And yet in person... You're still different. Attractively different. If you believe that I'm not merely trying to return a compliment, I might say that you're different too, Miss Avery. And very attractive. Oh, then what's keeping the two of us so much apart? Come uh, closer, Vance. Hmm? Courage is one of my strong points, Miss Avery. I'm here. How much uh, courage do you have, Vance? Adequate amount, I'd say. Enough to come still a little closer? Hmm? This is what I like about a murder case. You never know what's going to turn up next. <laughs> right now, it should be my toes. Oh, no, I never felt quite like this before. Vance, let's not talk about a murder case. That suits me. Concentration is one of my weak points. Vance... <clears throat> I was just thinking of that myself. And what are we waiting for? Nothing that I know of. Vance. Vance, darling. Vance, I just... Oh, oh. oh I... Oh. <laughs> I beg your pardon, both of you. Oh, Markham, well, come in, please, come in. I guess I'm supposed to say I hope I'm not intruding, but I guarantee all three of us know I am. <laughs> you're not kidding. Oh, but you're not really intruding, Markham, honestly. Although it's true that you did interrupt me while I was embracing Miss Avery. Oh, after the way you've kissed me, my name is Elise. Very well. Well, Markham, it's true that you did interrupt me while I was embracing Elise. But that embrace was in the nature of an experiment. Not an experiment? Really? Yes, Elise, an experiment. An experiment that tells me whether or not you killed Michael Miller. <laughs> This is District Attorney Markham. The listless murder case began with the finding of the body of Michael Miller, who headed a racket organization he called Consolidated Charities. The firm was reported to me by prominent Morton Gary, who was being used as a dupe by Miller. And subsequent investigation disclosed Miller was shot with bullets in his heart and in the calf of the leg. Philo Vance is under the impression that the murderer has a bruise on his face or a blackened eye, but has refused to indicate why he believes this. Vance has already questioned Elise Avery, who worked with Miller, and has told me he had an appointment with Morton Gary the following day. He should be with him about... Nice day for walking, isn't it, Mr. Gary? Yes, very, Mr. Vance. Only I wish they weren't so much on my mind. That's the reason I decided to take this walk rather than discuss our mutual problem in your office. Uh, it's very mild out, this is a very secluded street, and we're quite alone. I can't quite get over my being used as a cover-up for that Miller and his gang. So many of my friends donated money to his mythical charities. Mr. I Vance. can understand that. Perhaps something you might tell us will give us a lead to his killer, though. Well, I told you all I could. But apparently I haven't been much help, though. I wouldn't worry about that. You may think of something which seems unimportant, but which might solve this entire case for us. I believe you... Drop to the ground. What happened? Put it in that car. Put it in that car. Oh, Vance. Vance, what is this? Who is that in the car? I don't know. I didn't see the license. It was covered with some sort of rag. Oh. The car's gone. I think it's safe to get up now. All right. Oh. You get very dirty, Mr. Gary? No. No, I don't think so. You pulled me down on top of you. But how can you be so calm, man? Don't you realize somebody just tried to kill you? Somebody did shoot, but after all, he missed. So what's there to be excited about? Oh, I've, I've heard things like that about you, Vance, but I didn't believe them until this very minute. Oh, you're quite a man, sir. Thank you. Only I suggest that we go somewhere else to finish our talk. 
I don't believe we ought to give our assailant another chance. That's very sensible, Mr. Gary. I wish there was some way of chasing after him or of identifying that car. Well, apparently, you've made more progress on this case than you think, Vance. There's no question but that the killer feels you're getting close to his trail and tried to prevent that by killing you. Really? Well, Mr. Gary, if I were you, I'd appeal to Mr. Markham for police protection. You would, Vance, but why? Why? Because I believe those bullets were meant for you. All right, Vance, you came down here to tell me you believe someone tried to kill Morton Gary. Why would anyone want to do that? And what's more important, who was it? Sorry, Markham, I can't tell you. Well, suppose you clear up that first mystery, then. No sense in having two unexplainable remarks by you go unanswered? You mean, why do I think the killer would have a mark on his face? Yes. Suppose you take your top coat off, sit down, and let me have the details on that one. Hmm? I'm not staying long enough to sit, Markham. But I will tell you why I think as I do. All right. You mentioned to me over the telephone that Michael Miller had a bullet wound in his heart and one in the calf of his leg. That's right. It's the bullet in his leg that leads to my line of reasoning. I think that the killer fired from the floor and his first shot struck Miller in the leg. In other words, he was lying on the floor, Miller was standing over him, probably about to kick him, and the killer shot. Yes. His first bullet struck Miller in the leg. Miller staggered back. The killer got up off the floor and shot him in the heart. Hmm. Well, that still doesn't explain the bruised face. Doesn't it? Well, isn't it logical if the killer were on the floor that Miller had knocked him down first? And if he knocked him down, wouldn't it seem as if there should be a bruise? Yes, yes, it would. Uh, Vance, while you're in a true confession mood, why not explain why you were embracing Miss Avery yesterday? Well, certainly. There was no bruise on her face, Markham, but her makeup might have been used to cover it if she did have one. What? While I was ostensibly kissing her, I was actually trying to rub off as much of her makeup as I could. Oh, I see. And as there was no bruise, that relieves her of suspicion then, I suppose. I wouldn't go that far, my friend. I could be completely wrong about this. Personally, I don't believe you are. But as long as you've been so cooperative, Vance, here's a piece of news for you. There were three people in Miller's charity racket. Miller, Elise Avery, and a secretary, a young fellow named Donald Stone. Uh, we've overlooked him, haven't we, Markham? Well, I think we can do something about that. Miss Avery knew him, of course. Yes, she did. Well, perhaps I'll call her on the telephone and ask her something about him. I want to know. Come to think of it, there was a memorandum at my office saying that She'd phoned earlier today. Oh, I wonder what she wanted. From the tone of the message she left, apparently she didn't believe what I said in her office, that the embrace between us was merely an experiment. She seemed to regard it more as a sample. You know, I'm beginning to get an idea about you, Elise. An idea I don't like. Now I know why you called and wanted to come up here. Anytime you get an idea, Donald, that's news. Now, shut up and let me think. I'll let you think, all right. I'll let you think about me. Vance called me. You know that he suspects I killed Miller? Does he? I've got news for you, kid. Vance never suspects anybody. He knows who killed Miller. Then what makes you so calm? Now, wait a minute, you punk. Don't you even think I had anything to do with killing the boss? No, why not? He was holding out your cut on you. You had all the reason in the world to kill him. Look, lad, just don't let me lose my temper. And talking about people who had reason for knocking off Miller, what about you? You knew he was going to get rid of you when this campaign was over, didn't you? He was going to kill me? Sure. He didn't trust you. He was afraid you'd talk if anybody put the heat on. You were new with Miller. Remember that. Oh, so he was going to kill me. He didn't, did he? That's all you have to worry about. Now, um, what did you do with the money in the sucker list that was in the office? I want my share of the money. I don't know what you're talking about. No? Well... Suit yourself. Maybe Vance will know. You've got one more chance, chum. I want half of the dough you must have taken from Miller. Well? Okay, if that's the way you want it, it's okay with me. I'll be seeing you. So long. Wait a minute. Now you're getting smart, Donald. Where's the money? Here in my desk drawer. It wasn't too much cash, just $20,000. Well, hand over 10. And, uh, by the way, how'd you get that nine, cut on six, your chin? Seven, hmm? eight, nine, ten thousand. Here's your half, and I got the cut on my chin from shaving. Oh, thanks for the money, Donald. You're being smart. The less Father Vance knows about you, the better you should like it. You said he knew who killed Miller. Knowing and proving are two different things, friend. And since you've seen the light, we'll just keep Vance in the dark. <laughs> Shh. 
Vance speaking. Hello, Vance. Yes? This is Elise Avery. I had tried to reach you earlier today. I know. I got your message. I'd like to see you, Vance. So your message said. It isn't what you think, Vance. I'm trying to help you. I can tell you about Donald Stone, who was Miller's assistant in that charity racket. He has a prison record, and I happen to know he stole at least $20,000 from the office after the murder. That's so? Mm-hmm. What happened? Did he refuse to give you a cut of it? What do you mean? I mean, you must have had some reason for waiting this long to tell me that, Miss Avery. The chances are you were waiting for a chance to blackmail him. No, that's not true, Vance. I just want to help you. That's the only reason I've told you about Stone. In that case, Miss Avery, thank you. But believe me, I don't believe you. Hello, Mr. Vance? Hi, Miss Williams. Mr. Markham in. Uh, No, he's not. Why don't you take your hat and coat off, Mr. Vance? uh, He won't be long. Thank you. I'll do that. All right to lay them on this chair? Certainly. Thank you. Why, Mr. Vance, what on earth is that on your shoulder? Paint? No, Miss Williams. Looks like paint, doesn't it? Actually, it's something I'm preserving rather carefully. It's the clue to the murderer of Michael Miller. That spot? That's right, Miss Williams. And I think that perhaps I'd better not wait for Markham. I have some things to do, but would you ask Mr. Markham to have Miss Avery, Mr. Donald Stone, and Mr. Morton Gary in my office in an hour? Well, yes, of course. Tell him that I'll be ready to name Mr. Miller's murderer then. All three of our suspects are in my outer office, Markham? Yes. Good. Would you ask them to come in, please? Of course, Vance. Miss Avery, Mr. Gary. Yes. Donald. Yes, sir. Mr. Vance would like you all to come in now. Oh, very well. Thank you all for being here. I thought you'd all like to know who killed Michael Miller. You, Donald Stone. No, Vance, it wasn't me. I swear it wasn't. I didn't say it was. I think, though, that it was you who fired those shots at Mr. Gary here and myself this morning before you realized that I knew you were Miller's secretary. You think I shot at you? I know you did. And I know why. You wanted to kill Mr. Gary because he could identify you as working for Mr. Miller. According to Miss Avery, you have a prison record. Why, you didn't want to be linked with this case. So she told you, did she, about me? Yes. Well, I'll tell you a couple of things about her. Nothing I don't know already, believe me, Mr. Stone. Mr. Gary. Yes? This is the young man who shot at you. What do you think we ought to do with him? Lock him up. He's dangerous, Vance. By all means, lock him up. He's dangerous because he shot at you and me and missed. What would you do with someone who didn't miss, Mr. Gary? I'd see that he went to the chair. That's what I'd do. Well, in that case... I hope you are reconciled to it. You killed Michael Miller, Mr. Gary. I? Why should I kill him? When you found out he was running a racket using your name, you were so blinded by rage that you attacked him. He knocked you down. While you were on the floor, you shot. All right. I did. But he was going to hit me with a chair while I was lying on the floor. He would have killed me. Perhaps. That, of course, we'll never know. Vance, there's something I'd like to know. Yes, Markham? How did you know it was Gary here who killed Miller? I'll tell you, Markham, later. I'm listening, Vance. You knew Miller was killed by Gary. How? Remember, Markham, my theory about the killer having a bruise on his cheek? Yes, but Gary had no bruise. Oh, yes, he did. It was covered with makeup, so we couldn't see it, but it was there. But if makeup covered it, how did you know? Your secretary noticed a spot on my shoulder today. I'd wondered earlier how it had gotten there. But then I realized that there was only one way. And that was? That was when Gary fell against me on the street when we were both walking and the shots were fired. It was mild and I wasn't wearing a top coat. Oh, I get it now. When you realized how you got the makeup on your shoulder, you realized Gary would have only one reason for wearing makeup. To hide a bruise. That's right. Vance, you're wonderful. Come now, you're beginning to sound like Elise Avery. You better stop. I will, I will, if you'll tell me what happened to the list of people that contributed to Consolidated Charities and gave this case its name. That list? Donald Stone probably destroyed it. He found Miller dead, stole whatever money was around, and tried to hide the fact that the Consolidated Charities was a racket. Yeah, a pretty low racket, Vance. I'm glad we ended it. And I'm glad we ended the listless murder case. <laughs>
on, Al. Come on. I don't have all day. I'm just brushing some lint from your dinner jacket, Mr. West. I won't be a moment. How much time do we have? The curtain goes up in half hour. Plenty of time, Mr. West. You don't make your entrance until five minutes after it's up. That doesn't mean I have to wait till the last minute to get dressed. Step on it, Al. I'm just about through now, Mr. West. There you are, sir. Didn't I get any mail from California today? No, Mr. West, not a thing. Fine agent I've got. Go east, he says to me. Get a part on Broadway. Then the movie companies will want you back. Did you hear from him? <laughs> Neither did I. How's my makeup? Looks fine, sir. Though if you'll forgive my saying it, I think you could put just a bit more dye in your hair, though. There is the slightest bit of gray showing. There is? Where? Right about... Yes, the... yes, yes, I see it. I'll fix that right away. Richard. Uh, well... That's quite a pretty picture you make in the doorway, my dear. Very dramatic. Now, come in and shut the door. Tell him to get out of here, Richard. I want to talk to you. Go ahead, Al. You heard the lady. Yes, Mr. West, of course. I'll be in the wings. What do you want, Jean? You can see I'm busy making up. I go on in half an hour. You will go on in half an hour only if I change my mind about you, Richard. Well, well, what's this? Did anyone ever tell you that you're really a rat? <laughs> Now, Jean, please, compose yourself. Uh, sit down. I don't want to sit down. All right, all right. What's that pretty blonde head of yours troubled about? You, that's what. What did you promise me, Richard? Come on, tell me what. You tell me. What did I promise you? A part in this play. A chance at pictures afterwards. You swore you'd get both of them for me. I should have known better than to believe you. You should have known better than to break into my dressing room, too. But you didn't. Now... Lie away somewhere, Jean, until after the show. Oh, no. I came here for one purpose, Richard. And I'm not leaving until I do what I came for. What are you looking for in that handbag of yours? Mirror? You don't need it. You've acted the part beautifully, my dear. Mirror? You call this a mirror? It's a bottle, Richard, and you know what's in it? Acid. A face. Yes, that face of yours is never going to see another girl. Give me that bottle. Get away from me. You take your hands off of me. I'll never give you this. Stop. That... You're breaking my wrist, Richard. I'll take that little bottle, darling. There. That's better. Now run along somewhere and play. Run along somewhere and play. I'll run along. But I'll be back to see you, Richard. And then I'll really play for keep. You ordered a soda, Jean. Why don't you drink it? I'm thinking about... About Richard West? <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's not very complimentary, is it, Dolly? Thinking about him when you're with me? I hate him, Bob. Oh, no. Too much venom, Jean. It'd be more convincing if you weren't making such a definite effort. Matter of fact, I hate him, too. Not like I do. Why not? He promised you a part in the play he's in. He didn't deliver. I had the part he's playing now until he stepped in. Same reason. <laughs> Say, Jean, you know who's casting? Who? George McCready. Let you and I go over to his office now, huh? Oh, I don't feel like it. Oh, you'd better feel like it before word gets around this soda fountain that McCready is listening to readings. Did you ever see so many actors and actresses out of work in your life? That includes us, you know. Not if we get over to McCready's in time. You know how word flies around in this place. <laughs> in two minutes, the whole mob of them would be flooding McCready's office if they knew. Oh, forget McCready for now, will you, Bob? All right, for you, I'll forget it for now. Bob... What would you say if I told you that Richard West hurt me... hurt me more than I can tell even you? Bob, I hate that man so much I won't rest while he's alive. You claim you love me. You've said there isn't anything you wouldn't do for me. Well, honey, you, you know how fellas say things like that. You meant it, Bob. I know you meant it. Look what Richard West has done to you. He took that stage job because he knew you were first in line for it. Knew that a young actor could be a star in that part. It was a honey of a part. I could have played the heck out of it, too. Sure you could. You could have been great. The notices would have been all for you. It would have made you, Bob. And just because West knew I liked you, he took the role. He killed you professionally, Bob. Don't you realize that? He killed me professionally. Yeah, I guess he did. 
Maybe that gives me an idea of what I've got to do to him. That's all, that's all. Leave the curtain down. No more calls. I'm going to my dressing room. Now, wait a minute, West. Wait a minute. Oh, Mr. Adams, how are you tonight? Well, it's pretty good before I saw this performance. I want to talk to you, West. More people want to talk to me. It's just that attitude I want to talk to you about. I've got a lot of money tied up in this show, West. I lose a fortune if it goes under. Hmm, well, what's that to me? When you produce and back your own shows, you're taking a gamble. I know, but I like a fair shake. You practically begged for this part after I had young Bob Davis all set for it. So? So I gave it to you because I thought your name would help at the box office. Well, it doesn't mean a thing. And I'm paying you a lot of money. We've got no advance sale, none at all. This thing's a turkey. That's why nobody's coming to see it. We could be breaking even or showing a profit if you'll be reasonable about the money you're getting. Look, don't bother me, will you? I want to go to my dressing room, take off these clothes and relax. I'm not taking any cut. And uh, whatever talking you must do, do it tomorrow. I'll talk to you about it tonight. I'm giving you this straight, West. The way I feel about you, you won't be around tomorrow to be talked to. <laughs> Markham. Markham. Oh, there you are, Vance. I'll be right with you. Well, the great Philo Vance is now acting as my personal chauffeur. I'm getting up in the world. How much higher can a district attorney get? <laughs> get in, Markham. Thank you, Vance. I suppose you know why I phoned and asked you to pick me up. No, I don't know, but I suspect, and I'll be duly grateful if my suspicions are correct. You're right, as usual, Vance. It's a murder. And not an ordinary murder, or the police department could handle it very well, I'm sure. No question about that, Markham. Which way do you want me to drive? Uh, straight ahead, Vance. I'll tell you all about this as we go along. And I'll let you know where to turn. Good enough, my friend. Suppose you start from the beginning, eh? Well, the beginning and the end of this case, as much as we know about it, that is, are very close together, Vance. Did you ever hear of an actor named Richard West? Former leading man in pictures, now on Broadway in a play. That's the man, Vance. Well, it seems he's dead. Actually or professionally? As I understand it, he'd been slipping professionally for some time, but I'm speaking of him as a person. He was found shot to death in his apartment several hours ago. And that's where we're going now? Yes, Vance, that's where we're bound for. We've done quite a bit of work on the case already, although we haven't any results to speak of. Well, let's talk about the results you can speak of, Markham. Well, it seems that West took the job in the play he was in, and a lad named Bob Davis didn't like that. Bob was set for the role before West came along. Hardly a murder motive, Markham. Oh, there's more to it than that. This Davis had a girlfriend, a beautiful blonde, from what Sergeant Heath tells me. Her name is Jean Carey. And it seems that West did more than kick her around a little. And you think that Bob Davis might have resented that? I think Jean Carey resented that, Vance. According to Heath, she's quite an excitable person. She had a motive, and she is a blonde, you know. Well, that factor isn't terribly important, Markham. Some of the least murderous people I know are blondes. Well, <laughs> that's possible, of course. The point I started to make was that Sergeant Heath has rounded up Miss Carey and is holding her at the apartment of the late Richard West. He has also, as I understand it, notified B.J. Adams, producer of the show West was in. Very thorough of Heath, Markham. I must remember to thank him. Anything else? Yes. The gun was near the body. No fingerprints, as usual. Uh, turn here, Vance, and then straight ahead. Very well. Straight ahead, you say? Yes. I hope it's straight ahead to the solution of this murder. <laughs> I'll let you come near me. Oh, no. I know what you'll do if I put down this gun. Stand back, I said. Way back or I'll shoot. I mean it, I'll shoot. Don't try that old trick of looking over my shoulder as if there was somebody there. I know there isn't. Your number's up, Tony. Way up. What are you smiling for? Maybe there is somebody in back of me. I'd better look. No. No, don't shoot. No, no. Okay, Davis, that's fine. Fire it up. Did you, did you like it, Mr. McCready? Do you think there's a part in your play for me? I'll let you know. Keep in touch with the office, Davis. Everybody go now. It's all readings for today. Thanks. Thanks very much, Mr. McCready. Uh, wait a minute, Davis. Huh? Oh, oh, it's you, Hank. Yeah, that's right. Hank Gale, best actor's agent in the show with us. Uh, I'd like to talk to you, Bob. Yeah, about what? About getting your part in this play McCready's doing. I can handle that guy, Davis. No, no, nothing doing. I know all about you and your shady deals, Gail. Wait a minute. 
Bob, don't be in such a hurry. Take your hands off my coat. I got to get out of here. You shouldn't be in such a hurry, Davis. You really shouldn't be. I got angles in this town. Lots of angles about lots of things. What are you talking about? Murder. I got angles about the murder of Richard West, for instance. Uh, don't you think maybe you ought to be in my office tomorrow morning? Huh, kid? <coughs> Your name is Jean Carey, is that correct? That's right, Mr. Vance. And in answer to your next question, I wasn't up here at Mr. West's apartment at all today until Sergeant Heath brought me here a little while ago. You're anticipating my questions, Miss Carey. Perhaps you'd care to answer the next one. I haven't asked that either. Well, you're going to want to know how it is that there are two champagne glasses on this end table and why it is that one of them has lipstick marks on it. You're doing fine, Miss Carey. Now, how about answering your own question? I don't know how it is. Mr. West had other girlfriends, I suppose. Oh, I don't smoke that brand of cigarettes, Mr. Van. You mean this stub in the ashtray I'm looking at? That's right. It has lipstick on it, hasn't it? The same lipstick, I'd say, as there are indications of on the champagne glass. Well, it's not mine. So you say. This lipstick is sort of light, isn't it? Looks like it might be orange. Mr. Vance. How long are they going to hold me? That's entirely up to the district attorney and Sergeant Heath. Until the murderer of Richard West is caught, I imagine. Why? In a hurry to go somewhere? I'm in a hurry to go anywhere as long as it's away from here. You think this is fun? Hardly. Especially to the police, Miss Carey. The police don't like unsolved murder cases. In fact, the only person that likes a murder less than the police is the victim. (laughs) Very funny. Well, what happens to me now? Am I to be held here or in prison until you find out either that I didn't kill West or who did? I think the police will release you, Miss Carey, as soon as I'm through with you. You know, of course, that Sergeant Heath is trying to locate your boyfriend, Bob Davis. That shouldn't be too tough. I can tell you where to find Bob. Oh, really? And you wouldn't mind turning him over to the police? Why should I mind? He didn't do anything. He and I were together at the time of the murder. If he knew the police wanted him, he'd be here with bells on. What would he have to lose? I don't know. Is it true that B.J. Adams, the producer, was going to star Bob Davis in a play before Richard West appeared on the scene? Yes. Bob's a good actor. He would have been great in the part. Hmm. I wonder how good he was in playing the role of a murderer. Why, Bob wouldn't kill anybody. Even for me or himself. He couldn't. He isn't the type. According to you, that is. But don't forget, Miss Carey, that according to Shakespeare... One man in his time plays many parts. This is District Attorney Markham. The curtain call murder case opened with the finding of the body of Richard West, former Hollywood leading man currently appearing on Broadway for producer B.J. Adams. The suspects include blonde Jean Carey, West's former girlfriend, and Bob Davis, young actor who has been going with her. Philo Vance, after studying lipstick marks on a glass and cigarette in West's apartment, is quite certain that Miss Carey is not responsible for them, although he hasn't said why. He's told me he had some inquiries to make at the office of Hank Gale, the theatrical agent, and he should be there... You wanted some dope on Jean Carey, eh, Vance? Yes, please. Well, uh, I can give you some personal dope on the gal. It's, uh... You're very helpful, Mr. Gale, and I appreciate it. Oh, no trouble. Kind of like the idea of helping out Philo Vance. Maybe sometime you could uh, help me, huh? Maybe, Mr. Gale. I understand Miss Gary's been in show business since she was a kid, eh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I knew her mother pretty well. Good hoofer. One of the best. Her old man wasn't much of a guy. Good performer, but a bad boy. Did a one-man band act while the mother hopped the buck uh, before Jean was born. And after? Well, as I remember it, the father stuck around for about six or seven years and then blew. I don't know what happened to him. Jean's mother died right after that, and the kid must have had a pretty tough time before she was old enough to work on her own. I imagine she did. What kind of a fellow was this Richard West, Mr. Gale? Ah, rat. You want details? I think I get the general idea. Well, this producer, Adams, really let him have it after the show the night West was killed. Anyhow, that's what I hear, and I get around. I hear a lot of things, Vince. Really? 
That Mr. Adams' quarrel with West sounds like something I should know more about. I think I ought to go over and see Mr. Adams and find out whether a Broadway producer can produce anything interesting in this case. Is Mr. Adams in, Miss? He's in, but he ain't seen any actors today. I'm Bob Davis. I once read... Oh, I know you, Mr. Davis. I remember you were here before, a couple of months ago. I'll never forget a face. I got a photogenic mind. Good day, Mr. Davis. I've got to see Mr. Adams. I know. They all say that, only you can't. Good day, Mr. Hey, you can't go in there. No, don't bet. Mr. Adams, I've got to talk to you. What do you mean breaking into my office like this? Get out here immediately. Not until I've talked to you. Mr. Adams, my name is Bob Davis. I know you're going to reopen the play that Richard West was in, and I want the part I was promised once. Oh, you do, huh? Yes, I do. Does that give you the right to come crashing in here and telling me what you want? Get out of here before I throw you out. Mr. Adams, I've got... You're Bob Davis. You should know the police are looking for you for Richard West murder. What? Been on the radio for hours. Now get out before I call him and tell him you're here. I didn't know. Yes, Miss Jeffers. Should I call the police, Mr. Adams? I could hear that Davis guy yelling all over the place. No, don't bother, Miss Jeffers. Thank you. Oh, uh, Mr. Adams, there's a Mr. Vance outside. Philo Vance. Philo Vance, the private investigator? He sure looks good enough to be. Send him in. Hey, Davis, where are you going? If that's Vance, he may be after me. I'm getting out of here before he sees me. Hmm. Mr. Adams? Oh, come right in, sir. Glad to see you. Thank you, Mr. Adams. How are you today, sir? Very good, thank you. And yourself? Fine. Say, haven't I seen you before, Mr. Adams? I don't remember meeting you, Mr. Vance, but it's possible you've seen me at the theater. I am an inveterate first-nighter. Go to every first-night opening in town, except my own. Can't stand my own opening. It's too nerve-wracking. I can imagine. It seems to me, though, that I've seen you within the past week. And there hasn't been an opening this week. No, there hasn't. The opera, maybe. I was there last Saturday night. That must have been it. Funny how an unclarified detail sticks in your mind, isn't it? I'm sure it hasn't the slightest significance, but I did remember seeing you. Like the opera events? Generally, I liked the performance Saturday evening. All except the overture. The second violins seemed out of tune for the first few minutes. You've got a good ear, Vance. Thank you. Only it wasn't the violins. It was the violas. The stars were in great voice, I thought. Yes, the performance was quite enjoyable. However, I didn't come here to discuss opera with you, Mr. Adams. I came to talk about the late star of your show. Ah, Richard West. Naturally. Mr. Adams, was your show making money? Frankly, no. Was West in any way responsible for that? Undoubtedly. I had a contract with him. Had to pay him a lot of money every week. How long a contract did he have, Mr. Adams? Run of the play. Hmm. Of course, I could have closed the show. But then I'd have no chance of getting any of my money back. His death saved you quite a bit of money then, didn't it? Unquestionably. And I think I see what you're driving at, Vance. I'm not driving at anything in particular, Mr. Adams. Not yet, that is. People sometimes kill for money, don't they, Vance? And I did save a lot of money with West dead. Your thinking isn't unreasonable. I suppose I'm a suspect. Although I'll tell you now, I'm not a very good one. I have several good suspects already, Mr. Adams. I'd gladly discard both of them in favor of one actual murderer. Miss Carey, you'll realize why you were brought to my office. No, I don't, Mr. Markham. All I know is that Vance said I could go. Yes, he did. And you're not being officially detained. You can leave any time you like. But there is one thing I want to know more about. What's that? According to the testimony of Richard West's valet... You broke into his dressing room the night he was killed, and you threatened him with a bottle of acid. Oh, that. Oh, that. You're dismissing it rather lightly, Miss Carey. Because it's only half right. I threatened him, but not with any acid. The bottle had nothing in it but water. Oh? And what did you want with West? I wanted him to make good on his promises to me. That's what I wanted. I thought I could force him into getting me a chance in Hollywood. Hmm. You might have tried to do the same thing later that evening in his apartment, only... This time, you had a gun. I wasn't near his apartment. I told you that. I told Vance that I... Uh, excuse me, please. Markham speaking. Hello, Markham. Vance. Oh, hello, Vance. What's up? My spirits, for one thing, Markham. Will you do me a favor? Of course. What is it? I want you to reach Bob Davis and B.J. Adams and have them at my office in an hour. Can you do it? Of course I can do it, Vance. Good. You can bring Jean Carey with you if you like. She's there with you now, isn't she? Why, yes, but how did you know? I came to call for her to tell her some news that she wasn't going to like very much. And I found that a man from your office had been at her apartment. You have some news that she isn't going to like very well, Vance? Definitely, Markham. 
I'm going to prove her connection with the murder of Richard West. Please, all of you be seated comfortably. I won't Thank be very you, long Vance. getting to my point. <clears throat> Miss Carey? What is it, Vance? With whom were you in love? Bob Davis, Richard West, or your career? I wanted to be successful. That's what but I Jean, thought. But, you told me that... Not now, if you don't mind, Mr. Davis, please. Mr. Adams. Yes? How long have you been a theatrical producer? In this city? Yes. About ten years. What did you do before? Nothing much of anything, Vance. Acted, painted scenery, the usual thing. Uh, Vance, excuse my interrupting, will you? Certainly, Markham. What is it? You told me on the telephone that you could link Jean Carey with Richard West's murder. Was it through the lipstick on the glass in West's apartment? No. You put the lipstick there, didn't you, Mr. Davis? I? Yes, you hated West because he took your part in the play. You came up to his apartment with the idea of killing him and of making it look as if Miss Carey had been there. I did dirty... When you found him dead, you put lipstick on the champagne glass and on the cigarette. Why would I do a thing like that? I love Jean. I doubt that. You planted the evidence to take suspicion off yourself. You knew the police would come after you when they found West dead... So you tried to make it seem as if Miss Carey had been there. That was so Miss Carey couldn't incriminate you. Vance, you can't possibly know that Miss Carey didn't leave the lipstick on that glass and the cigarette. Even if we'd taken samples of her lipstick and they didn't match the stains we found, that wouldn't prove anything. She could have changed lipsticks. Of course she could have, Markham. But I'm reasonably certain Mr. Davis planted those lipstick marks for us to trace. Then he's the murderer, Vance? No, no, I didn't kill him. You'll never make me admit I killed him. I didn't, you hear? I didn't kill him. Nobody said you did. In fact, I know you didn't. Markham, the time for your arrest has come. Oh? You can hold one of the people in this room for murder. I'll supply you with all the information you need to complete your case. Well, it's very kind of you, Vance, but uh, whom do I arrest? Who, Markham? Why, B.J. Adams, of course. <laughs> B.J. Adams, of my own free will and volition, to hereby make this statement to District Attorney Markham and final events. I killed Richard West. Take these questions and answers down, Johnson, please. Uh, Mr. Adams, why did you kill West? As long as he was alive to appear in my show, it cost me thousands of dollars every week. Mr. Adams, what was the real reason? Hmm? What was that, Mr. Vance? What was the real reason you killed West? I killed him because of what he did to my daughter, Jean. What? Jean Carey is your daughter? I knew that when I found that Jean's father had left her when she was just a child and had been a professional musician at the time. In my first interview with Mr. Adams, he revealed a detailed knowledge of music. Well, it was too close a tie for me to ignore. So that's what put you on my trail, eh, Vance? Partly. That and your arrival in this city soon after you had left Jean and her mother. The whole thing was too coincidental. You had to be her father. I was. Maybe I didn't do the right thing by Jean when she was a kid, but I wasn't going to stand by and see her kicked her on by a heel like West. She didn't know I was her father, you see. But I knew who she was. So I came up to West's apartment the night of his death and shot him. Uh, tell me, Mr. Adams, were there two champagne glasses on an end table in the apartment? No. No? No, Markham, there weren't. Bob Davis set those up very nicely when he came to West's apartment shortly after the murder. He ran down to the drugstore, bought a lipstick and smeared one of the glasses and a cigarette stub. I've been meaning to ask this for a long time, Vance. How did you know that Miss Carey didn't make those marks? Oh, Markham, it was an orange lipstick. And Miss Carey is a blonde. Oh. No blonde ever wears orange lipstick. It's not vivid enough. Mm -hmm. Deep red, purple on occasion, but never orange. Terribly unbecoming, Markham. Hmm. And I guess I'm terribly unobserving, Vance. I'm awfully glad you're around. <laughs> I'm glad I'm around, too, when there are murder cases to be solved. <laughs> Incidentally, Bob Davis was equally unobserving when he purchased the lipstick. He just asked for a lipstick and took the first one the clerk handed him, never bothering to look at the color. I'm glad he didn't. We really would have been confused if he had. No telling how long it would have taken us to get somewhere on the West murder. You're probably right, Markham. But we know where we are now, don't we? We're at the end of the curtain call murder case.
Finally, my dear Harold, finally. In a few seconds, you will learn why this mansion is so completely burglar-proof. I saw the men working on the wall, Mr. Simmons. They were finished with the masonry two days ago. Oh, yes, they were finished with the masonry. A wall ten feet high now completely covers the front of this place of mine. And there is nothing but a cliff in back. But a mere wall and a cliff are not sufficient protection. I'm afraid I don't understand. You will, my dear Harold, you will. You are my caretaker, but your work will be relatively easy. Believe me, it will be easy. Oh, what's keeping those men? Keeping them from what, sir? From trying out the device they've installed. I can't imagine what... Ah, hear that, Harold? Harold, you hear that? What is it, Mr. Simmons? It's an electric eye system, Harold. It's completely foolproof and burglar-proof. If anyone so much as approaches within six feet of any part of those walls, that alarm goes off. Nobody can get to me here, Harold. Ha! Nobody. Mr. Simmons... You've never told me who it is you were afraid of. Who it is? It could be any of a dozen people, Harold. Weak people. People who resented the fact that in the battle of business, I was successful, and they weren't. But now I'm safe, with you to look after me 24 hours a day. You can depend on me, Mr. Simmons. Indeed I do, Harold, and indeed I will. It's true I know nothing of your background, but you strike me as satisfactory. You look me square in the eye all the time. That's important. Besides, I'm used to taking chances on people. Five years ago, when I first hired Betty Jarnis as my secretary, I knew nothing of her either. Miss Jarnis is very capable. Yes, and very lovely. And I've rewarded her, Harold. Just as I'll reward you if you are faithful to your duties. When I die, she receives a considerable fortune. I'll do my best, Mr. Simmons. Oh, Harold, just to prove to you that I'm not an old fool, I said I knew nothing about you. That is true. But just in case you were sent here by one of my friends... Mr. Simmons... Please don't think I overlooked that possibility. Just in case you were sent here by one of my friends, allow me to assure you that I have means of protecting myself at all times. See? That gun is entirely unnecessary where I'm concerned, sir. Perhaps. But it is well to have it with me all the time, regardless. I'm glad we had this little chat here. As you can see... I'm protected from strangers by the wall and its electric eye. And I'm protected from my own household by this gun. I'm completely safe. And for the first time in years, I'm at ease. Very good, sir. I'm glad. I'm an old man, Harold. And this is the freedom I've been looking forward to for years. Perhaps I don't have too long to live. But they're going to be easy years. Harold, didn't you hear what I said? Yes, sir. You said perhaps you don't have too long to live. Jim. Jim, are you there? Sis, I'm here. Why are you calling me? I had to talk to you, Jim. So much is happening, and you're a thousand miles away. Another gripe about that job of yours? Yes, it's still Mr. Simmons. He's unbearable. So why don't you quit? Why do you keep calling me up and complaining every week? Oh, no. No, I don't quit this job. Not with all that money I'm being left in Simmons' will. I'm sticking. Well, then, what's your beef? He's moved out to a place in the country. There's a wall around the house. The windows are barred. And I've got to work there and live there. What do you want me to do? I don't know. All I know is that this place is a prison. Gray stone, flat roof. Those barred windows and the wall, I feel like I'm in jail. Oh, if only something would happen to the old buzzard. Like what? Like realizing that you deserve a couple of days off a week so you can have a fling at living? That's not what I'm thinking, Jim. I was thinking that it looks like I'm going to be able to live... Only if Mr. Simmons dies. Take a letter, Miss Janice. Yes, sir. To Frank Rodney, Bank Building City. Dear Frank, in reply to your letter of even date, the answer 
is no. Sincerely. Sign my name to it. Yes, Mr. Simmons. Now then, take a letter Mr. to... Mr. Simmons, uh, could I please fix myself some lunch now? I can take the rest of the letters this afternoon. Of course not. My mail comes first. But it's three o'clock, sir, and I haven't had anything to eat since breakfast. Dissatisfied here, Miss Jonas? If you are, I might be able to make other arrangements for a secretary. Of course, there are other changes that would be made at the same time. Changes affecting my will. Mr. Simmons, will you please forget about that will? That's all I ever hear from you. After all, I just wanted a sandwich. Is that so unreasonable? It is, inasmuch as I have other things for you to do. You know, Miss Jonas, perhaps you've been with me too long. Take a letter to my attorney. Ask him to please be here tomorrow morning and to bring my will with him. Vance. Oh, Vance. Oh, just a minute. Uh, Markham, what are you doing here at this hour? Come in. Thank you, Vance. I'm sorry to have awakened you. Awakened me, my friend. No, you didn't. I haven't been to bed. I've been reading up on criminal identification through hair analysis. Very interesting. Kept me from realizing it was daylight. <laughs> Vance, don't you ever do anything that ordinary people do? Like sleep, you mean, Markham? <laughs> I'd have gone to sleep if I were tired. I wasn't, so I stayed up. How about you? District attorney's hours don't begin this early, do they? They do when there's a murder. And there's been a murder, Vance. In that case, Markham, I'll slip out of this robe and into a shower and be with you in a moment. Come along, you can tell me all about it. Right. It seems, Vance, that a millionaire named Ezra Simmons built himself a mansion out in the suburbs and installed every known method of burglar alarm. But someone got in last night and shot him to death. Really? I know about Simmons. He made a fortune stepping on people's backs. I'll hop in the shower and make this as quick as possible. Good. Of course, Vance, there's a possibility that Simmons was killed by someone in his house. His secretary, Betty Jarnis, or his caretaker, Harold Eckner. No question about that possibility. Miss Jarnis claimed she couldn't stay in the house last night and went into town, returning this morning to discover the body. And the caretaker claims he heard no one try to get in. Nor will he say he killed Simmons. Unreasonable of him, isn't it? How would you like me to tell you how Simmons might have been killed? But, man, how could you? Apparently, neither the caretaker nor Miss Jarnis killed him. That's a little too obvious. And you don't know any... And you don't know anything about any of the details of this case. All I know is what you've told me, Markham. But I won't disturb you with one of my long-range predictions. I'd suggest we get right up to the Simmons mansion. Right now, Vance? Oh, hardly. I think we ought to wait until I get dressed first. <laughs> That's it, Vance. That's the Simmons house just on top of that hill. I see it, Markham. Large, isn't it? Quite. And that wall surrounding it must be ten foot high with barbed wire at the top. Probably electrically charged wire. Mr. Simmons was well protected. Apparently not well enough protected, Vance. Somebody did get to him, remember? Yes, I most certainly do. And somebody most certainly did. Now, I guess I'd better stop here and wait for someone to... Now, what in the world is that? An electric eye system, I imagine. As soon as any object comes between the posts in front of the gate, those bells go off. Of course. Here comes someone to open the gate. Caretaker, probably. Probably. I asked Sergeant Heath to let him resume his duties around the place until we got here. Hello there. Hello. Is you Mr. Markham? Yes, and this is Philo Vance. How do you do? How do you do? Uh, where is Sergeant Heath? He's up at the house. They've taken Mr. Simmons' body away, but Sergeant Heath said for me to expect you. Very kind of the sergeant. That's quite an elaborate bell system Mr. Simmons had installed, isn't it? Yes, it is. It was necessary where you and Mr. Markham were concerned, though. I saw you two from my room, and when I saw your car, I came down to open the gate. Well, hop on the running board, Eckner, and we'll drive you to the house. Yes, sir. Just follow the road. It turns left a little way up. Right. Just a minute, Markham, if you please. What is it, Vance? Stop the car. Certainly. I want to look at the outside of this place. Eckner, can you drive the car up to the house? Yes, Mr. Vance. Do that, will you, please? Come on out, Markham. I'm with you, Vance. Uh, yeah. I'll leave the car in front of the house, Mr. Markham. Thank you. Now, Vance, what is this for? You know that Heath is holding Mr. Simmons' secretary, Betty Jarnas, up at the house. Why stop? I just thought of a way that somebody could get past that wall without sounding the alarm. 
But how, man? By tunneling under it? No, nothing quite that obvious. If there had been a tunnel, Heath would have discovered it by now. I thought if there were a lawn... But there isn't. There's nothing but rocks leading from the wall to the house. What were you thinking? Well, if the murderer were very clever, he could have gotten past that wall without sounding the alarm. By using my method. And that method was? By vaulting over the wall, using a pole. Of course, the murderer would have had to be an athlete, but that would have narrowed down our suspects. Yes. But nobody or nothing could land on these rocks. Well, I see our friend the caretaker's waiting for us at the door. Yes, he is. Oh, Eckner, where is Sergeant Heath? He's trying all the windows for clues, Mr. Markham. Will you come in, sir? Uh, Yes, we will. Thank you. Is this the library, Eckner? The living room, Mr. Vance. Uh, Miss Jarnis is in there waiting for you. Good. Come in with us, will you please? Yes, sir. Uh, This is Mr. Markham and Philo Vance, uh, Miss Jarnis. How do you do? Oh, how do you do? Hello, Miss Jarnis. I hope we haven't kept you waiting. You have. But does that matter any to you? Frankly, no. Now that your attitude is apparent. Miss Jarnis, who might have killed your employer? Almost anybody he formerly did business with. He was cordially hated by a lot of people. Including you. I hated him as much as anybody, I guess. But you continued to work for him. Oh, yes. Yes, I was a very faithful employee. Hmm. Wouldn't you be if you were being left a lot of money by an old man? How much money, Miss Jonas? I'd like to go up to my room, Mr. Vance, please. I have a headache. Of course. Thank you. By the way, Miss Jonas, how much money was Mr. Simmons leaving you? How much? Yes. A million dollars. You can say that again, Markham. Oh, Eckner. Yes, Mr. Vance? Were you in Mr. Simmons' will, too? I've only been here a week. I see. Uh, Markham, uh, walk over to the window with me, will you please? Of course, Vance. What's on your mind? I'll tell you in a moment. Keep your back to our friend, Mr. Eckner, there, and listen to this. Mr. Eckner? Mr. Eckner! He doesn't answer, Vance. I'd better turn around and see if he's still there. Yes, he is. I just wanted confirmation of a theory, Markham. This one is correct, thank goodness. You see, the late Mr. Simmons went into an involved routine to have his home wired with guns that would go off if an intruder approached. But all in vain. I still don't know what you're driving at, Vance. Don't you? Well, Eckner here, the man he depended upon to protect him in case those guns went off, happens to be stone deaf. <laughs> This is District Attorney Markham. The million-dollar murder case opened with the finding of the body of Ezra Simmons, much disliked recluse, despite all of Simmons' efforts to protect himself. Suspects include his secretary, Betty Jonas, and a caretaker, Harold Eckner, who, Vance has discovered, is stone deaf. At noon of the day following the murder, Joseph Hargrave, Simmons' lawyer, arrived at the mansion. All of us, Vance, Miss Jarnas, Eckner, and I, are gathered in the library to hear him read the will in the... Uh, Very well now, very well. Uh, Quiet, please. I must have quiet, please. You'll have it, Mr. Hargrave. Good. Now, let me see, where do I begin? Oh, yes. Uh, Miss Jarnas, you wrote me a letter asking me to be here today. Yes, I did. And to bring the will, Mr. Simmons wanted you here with it. I don't know why. I don't care why. Guarantee he didn't know he'd be dead when I came now. Did he? Or did he? Uh, Could he have committed suicide? Hardly, Mr. Hargrave, hardly. I didn't think he would. It wasn't the type. Mr. Hargrave, if you don't mind, I'm quite anxious to find out what was in the will. Uh, What are you so anxious about, Mr. Vance? Nothing in it for you. Uh, Miss Jarnas here gets a million dollars. Mr. Eckner gets 10,000. The rest goes to a home uh, for cats. He left me $10,000, but I've only been with him a week. There was a copy of the will on Mr. Simmons' desk. 
You were here long enough to see it, you know. Uh, Miss John, as you can't mean I killed Mr. Simmons. How can't I, well, though? what about you and the, and the million dollars you got? You could have killed him. I wasn't in this house when he was killed. You know that. I called to you and told you I was going out. Please, both of you, if you don't mind, I'd like to do some talking. Uh, and if you don't mind, I won't listen. I can't stand people talking. It makes me nervous. If you don't mind, I'll just go to the kitchen and make myself some coffee. <laughs> what is it you were saying, Lance? Well, first of all, I want to talk to Mr. Eckner. You are deaf, Mr. Eckner. Why didn't Miss Jarness know that? And did Mr. Simmons know it? No one here knew it. I can read lips perfectly. I was afraid to tell Mr. Simmons I was deaf. Thought maybe he wouldn't give me the job when I applied for it, and, well, I needed it. I see. Well, I imagine that's reasonable. Apparently, you were the only one here last night when the murder was committed. I know you can't hear, so I don't expect you to be able to give me much information... But can you tell me anything at all? I think so, Mr. Vance. Well, go ahead, man. We're waiting. Well, I was awake all last night, gentlemen. In my room, there's a lamp connected with the same electric eye device that sets off the gongs. Nobody could get near this house without my going out to investigate. And nobody did. <laughs> you, Jim. Betty, honey, how's my favorite sister? I've been trying for 15 minutes to get you on the phone, Jim. How soon can you get here? Oh, uh, what do you mean? Jim, Mr. Simmons has been murdered. And Philo Vance thinks I did it. You've got to get here right away. Yeah, okay, sis. I'll hop on a train in a half hour, but it'll take time. 15 or 16 hours, maybe longer, if I don't get a fast train. Fly in, Jim, please. Betty, you know I can't fly. Oh, I'm sorry, Jim. I forgot for a second. Of course you can't fly. We'll take the train, but hurry. I need somebody on my side, Jim. It's got to be you. Now, don't worry, honey. They aren't going to kick my kid sister around. I'll be there first thing in the morning. Where are you now? I'm at the Simmons house calling from the hall. Oh, hurry, Jim. Please hurry. Hang on tight, kid. I'll be there. Bye. Goodbye. Why couldn't you fly, Miss Jarnis? Oh. I didn't mean to startle you, and I certainly didn't mean to eavesdrop. But apparently I've done both, so I might as well take advantage of this situation. Why can't your brother fly here? He cracked up flying a plane about five years ago. He won't go into a plane. But what excuse does that give you to listen to my conversation? Miss Jarnis, believe me, I have no excuse. But I do have a reason. There's a man out here to see you, Mr. Rodney. He told me to tell you his name was Buck. Buck, eh? Send him in, Miss Morgan. Send him right in. Come in, Buck. Sit down. Thanks, Mr. Rodney. Don't mind if I do. Cigar? Yeah, thanks. Yeah, thanks. That's right, Buck. Sit down. You did a good job. I'm proud of you. Simmons is dead, ain't he? You sent me to see that he got dead, didn't you? I saw to it. Yep. You certainly did. And here's the money you asked for, just the way you asked for it, in small bills. Anybody see you come in here? Nope. And nobody's going to see me leave. And nobody's going to see me again in this town for two years. I'm blowing this bike just like our deal said I should. Yeah, you're a fine man for a delicate job, Buck. I don't know how you did it, and I don't care. Okay, boss. And now I got my dough, and you got your corpse. And so I'm blowing out of here to this back door. You know, Rodney, I kind of enjoy knocking off a guy. Makes me feel like I was put into this world for a reason. So long. Yes, Mr. Rodney? Miss Morgan, call police headquarters for me, will you? Police headquarters? I want to report that if the police are looking for the murderer of Ezra Simmons, they can pick up Buck Digby at the Crosstown Station in an hour. Hi, Markham. Ah, there you are, Vance. Glad you got here. Where have you been? Doing a little investigating, Markham. I knew I could leave you here at the Simmons Mansion with complete confidence that if anything turned up, you'd let me know about it. Something has turned up, Vance. Two things, in fact. One of them is that Miss Jarness' brother has arrived from out of town this morning. What's the other? How did you know? Oh, you'll have a reasonable way, I know, so let's (laughs) skip that. The other thing that turned up is that we picked up Mr. Simmons' murderer. I beg your pardon. We got a tip that Buck Digby killed Simmons and was about to leave town. We caught him at the station, and of course he denied everything, but we're pretty sure it's he. Are you, Markham? Yes. 
Has he told you how he succeeded in getting into this house despite the wall, the electric eye, and the barred windows? Well, no, he hasn't. He probably won't either, Markham, because the chances are he didn't kill Simmons despite your tip. I think I know who murdered Ezra Simmons, Markham. And believe me, it isn't Buck Digby. You haven't told me what I should do, Jim. You just sit there. I'm thinking, sis. I'm thinking. You know, I don't think so good after 15 hours in a sleeper. Now, off the record. You didn't kill Simmons? Oh, for on the record, I didn't kill him. A million dollars is a big reason, sis. There you go again. Sorry, I was just trying to make... Who's there? Lionel Vance, may I come in? Come in. Please forgive my intruding into your room, Miss Joyness. But I was anxious to meet your brother. How do you do, sir? I'm Philo Vance. Hi. What's going on here, Vance? What are they trying to do, frame my sister for that old buzzard's murder? No. Nobody's trying to frame her, Mr. Jarnis. If she's innocent, I assure you, she won't be put in jail. Until we're sure, we're keeping her in this house. Miss Jarnis, is there a room in this house that is relatively soundproof? The basement is. It's equipped with all the gongs and stuff. But you can't hear what's going on in the rest of the house, if that's what you mean. That's what I mean. I'm going to ask you and your brother to go down there. Join Mr. Markham and Harold Eckner. You're all going to see me drive down the road and out through the gate. And when you see me again, I'll be in this house without an alarm being sounded or a window bar being out. I'll get in just like the murderer got in. <laughs> Vance has been gone over an hour. I can't understand what's keeping him. I can, Mr. Markham. He just couldn't get in here without sounding those bells. How could anybody? Nobody could, Jim. I went over the plans with the company that installed the electric eye. It's impossible for anybody to get into this place without sounding the alarm. You're trying to make it look awfully bad for me, Miss Jarnis. I was the only one in the house when Mr. Simmons was killed. If it looks bad for you, that's not my fault. I didn't kill Mr. Simmons. What I'd like to know is, who did? Is that all you'd like to know, Markham? Vance! Oh, Mr. Mr. Vance. I can tell you who did. Vance, you did it. You got in. Not that there was any doubt in my mind that you would. Thank you, my friend. And I believe when I arrived just now, I said I could tell you who killed Mr. Simmons. I can. Markham, you can arrest Miss Jarnes' brother for murder. Now, this requires a lot of explanation, Vance. Let's start with Buck Digby. All right. He went to kill Simmons but he found he couldn't get in the mansion without setting off all those guns, so he gave up the idea. Then he heard on the radio that Simmons was dead, so he figured he'd collect regardless. And the man who sent him to kill Simmons, that Mr. Rodney, he tipped us off to Buck. Why would he do that? Two reasons. He was an allegedly respectable citizen. He knew that Buck would involve him if he were arrested, but he could always deny the accusation. However, if Buck remained at liberty, Rodney would be blackmailed by him for the rest of his life. And he knew it. I see. Now, tell me this. Jim Jarnas was in South City, a thousand miles from here, on the afternoon of Simmons' death. He was afraid to fly, yet you claim he was in this house at midnight in time to kill Simmons. That's right. He was afraid to fly, Markham, but he flew just the same. But he couldn't have flown a plane over the wall and landed on those rocks outside. Nothing could land on them safely. Yes, I know, Markham. But Jim flew in from South City in about four or five hours. And then he rented a helicopter from a flying field about ten miles down the road. How do you know that? I rented one there myself a little while ago. Those helicopters are wonderful. They can land on anything, including the roof of the Simmons house, which is where I landed. You know how flat the roof is. Yes. So that's how you got into the house without the alarms going off. That's right. I landed on the roof, opened the skylight, and came down as nice as you please. Oh, Vance. The man at the flying field described the man who had rented a helicopter the night of the murder, and so I knew who our murderer was. Well, I'll be darned. What about a motive, Vance? Well, Markham, wouldn't you like to have a sister, your only living relative, who had a million (laughs) dollars? Yes, yes, I would. One more thing, Vance. Everything logical pointed to the fact that this was an inside job, that Simmons was killed by either Miss Jarnas or the caretaker. Why were you so sure it wasn't? Because, Markham, we know Miss Jarnas wasn't at the mansion the night of the murder. But the caretaker didn't know that. She probably called up to him that she was leaving, but don't forget, he couldn't hear. Oh, I understand now. 
He'd never have tried to murder Simmons thinking Miss Jarnas was in the house, and he never knew she'd left. Right. That the end of your questions, my friend? The end of my questions, Vance, and the end of the million-dollar murder case. Yes, it's a goodbye, I think. Of course, the next evident is questionable. If I were you, I'd get into White Willow Refineries. They want to move that stock up five points. Hello, Mr. Ames. It's in your office, Mr. Ames. Oh, excuse me, sir. I'll call you back. Ames speaking. Stuart, this is Dawn. Oh, yes, darling. What is it? I'm quite busy. A holding its own, I'd say. White Willow is off a fraction. That's what you're really interested in, isn't it? Oh, you're what I'm really interested in, Stuart. Well, tell me about it tonight, will you, darling? I've got some people waiting to see me. I'll be up around... Well, you better name a time. Oh, I can get rid of Nate around 8.30. Play safe and be up around 9, will you? I'll be there. Goodbye, darling. Bye. Sit right down again, Ames. Uh, I want to talk to you. Oh, it's you, Mr. Leroy. How are you? I'll let you know in a little while. As soon as I close this door so we can have some privacy. Yes? What is it? Ames, three months ago you urged me to buy 10,000 shares of White Willow Refineries. I wouldn't say I urged you. I pointed out that the company was in good financial shape and had excellent possibilities. There was going to be a merger. If it gone through, the shares would have been split two for one. Yes, I know. That's what you told me. But there was no merger. And the stock is off 15 points from what I paid for it. I'm sorry, Mr. Leroy. I don't control the companies. I just recommend investments for my clients. And most times, they turn out well. You knew White Willow was a dog stock when you put me in it. I've lost $150,000, all the money I had in the world. Oh, look here, Mr. Leroy. You can't be blaming me for that. The investment must have looked good to you. Yes, it looked good because you recommended it. I mortgaged everything I own, went into debt to buy that stock. I'm broke, Ames. If I sold that stock now, I couldn't get enough money to pay my debts. I'm really sorry, Mr. Leroy, but there isn't anything I can possibly do about it. No, huh? No. Well, there's something I can do about it. You don't think I'm going to take a loss like that lying down, do you? Oh, no. Somebody's going to take it lying down, but it won't be me. You have to leave. It's after 9 o'clock. Uh, ain't it a funny thing about time, honey? 
It goes so fast sometimes and so slow other times, huh? Ha, <laughs> ha, sure. And now, come on, I'll help you with your coat. Well, what's the hurry, Dawn? What's with this Russian act? What have I got, the measles or something? Well, well what have you got, a date or something with some other guy? Oh, Nate. Now, look. I'm not the kind of a character who thinks my baby will cross me. She wouldn't do that. Would she, baby? Uh-huh. She's too smart. Ain't she, baby? Uh-huh. I'll be seeing you, baby. Mm. Bye. Oh. Dawn. Stuart, where? Heard you and Nate talking. So I came in the back way and waited until he left. Oh. Good thing he didn't catch me walking in here. It's all I'd need. What's the matter, Stuart? Something else wrong? Oh, yes, yes. The market door. Started to bend at the last hour. Afraid it's going to crack at the opening tomorrow. Is White Willow down? Two points. That's White Willow that's got me worried. George Roy says he went broke on that stock. And that it's my fault. Looked like he was desperate. Oh, forget about Leroy, darling. And listen to me. It's Nate. I have an idea he knows about you. What? How could he? Well, don't ask me. Only Nate has a way of finding things out in this town. He's got a finger in every racket and a finger man on practically every block. What makes you think he knows about me? Mm, just a couple of things he said, that's all. Nothing definite. Nate never says anything definite, just a few hints. Enough to worry me, I'll tell you that. Enough to worry you? Well, what about me? If Nate Amigan knows that I'm seeing his girl, I'm really in trouble. Oh, darling, don't you think I'm worth a little trouble? Oh, well, yes, yes, of course you are. Listen, maybe it... Maybe it'd be better if we didn't see each other for a while. Well, maybe I ought to take a little trip somewhere for my health. Oh, but your health is wonderful, darling. Yes, it is now. But there's no telling how long it'll stay that way. With George Leroy and Amico around. Sit down, Mr. Leroy. Sit down. Always like to have somebody that comes to see me sit down. Thank you, Mr. Amico. Thanks very much. Uh... It is perfectly all right with me, should you want to cut out that Mr. Miko stuff and call me Nate. I am known mostly to most people as Nate. All right, Nate. I don't want to take up too much of your time. I know you're busy. Uh, <clears throat> never too busy. I shouldn't take time out for something on which maybe I can make a buck. Hmm. Uh, what's your proposition, Mr. Leroy? Well, I don't exactly know how to begin. Okay, so I'll help you. Somebody's lost you up somewhere and you want him taken care of, right? Uh, that's approximately right, Nate. The man in this town has ruined me. Left me with hardly anything. Whatever it is I have, I'm willing to spend to see that he gets what's coming to him. Yeah, that sounds like a very reasonable proposition. I'm very glad to take the details under advisement. Uh, you should tell me what's going on. How much would it cost to kill a man, Nate? Well, you want he should be knocked off, huh? Yes. Well, that requires a little working on, Mr. Leroy. It's a pretty hot time for killings. At the A, we've got Markham. He's a rough character. Now, uh, if you want this friend of yours worked down a little, that could be different. I want him dead. Uh, I see what you mean. Well, I could get him good and scared for you. It wouldn't cost you too much scratch. I want him dead, I said. Yeah, I know, I heard you. Who, uh, who is this guy you want should be suddenly taken dead? His name is Stuart Ames. Stuart Ames, eh? Yes, he has an office I know in... all about him, Mr. Leroy. And he's the guy you want killed, him. Eh? That's right. How much will it cost me? I don't know. You see, I kind of have a reason I should kill that bum myself. Maybe this is one job I don't do for money. Maybe Ames gets knocked off uh, uh, just for the fun of it. Seventh precinct, Murphy speaking. Hello, please. There's been a murder at the Caton Apartments. Come right away. Caton Apartments, you say? Who was killed? A, a stockbroker named Stuart Ames. It only happened a couple of minutes ago. I, I was passing by his apartment. I heard a shot, and I went in and found him on the floor, dead. Eh? Yeah, no sign of the murderer? Well, he must have gotten out the back way. I grabbed the phone and called you. Hey, you did good. Wait right there. We'll we'll have some men up in five minutes. <laughs> Oh, Miss Williams, has my secretary come back from lunch yet? Oh, no, Mr. Vance. Miss Deering isn't back yet. Anything I can do? Yes, I think so. Just a second. I'll come into the outer office. Miss Williams, will you get me the files on the last case we worked on? The million-dollar murder 
murder case, Mr. Vance? I believe that's what Mr. Markham, the district attorney, called it. I have the files right here. Oh, you did a wonderful job on that case, Mr. Vance. You certainly know how to find murderers. Finding murderers, Miss Williams, consists exclusively in knowing where to look. Oh, it certainly sounds simple when you say it that way. Now, if it was me, I... Vance, I'm oh. glad I found you in. Well, Markham, my friend, we were just speaking of you. What's the excitement, or should I guess? You ever guess, Vance? I didn't think so. Let's go into your private office. I have something to tell you. Of course, Markham, after you. Thank you. A murder this morning, Markham? No. Last night, Vance. I just received word of it this morning. Apparently, Sergeant Heath tried to reach me last night, but I spent the night at a friend. Who was killed? A man named Stuart Ames, stockbroker. He was a specialist in a stock called White Willow Refineries. You know anything about it? I know nothing about it or about him. What are the details? Well, a neighbor heard the shot, rushed into Ames' apartment, found him lying there on the floor, and called the police. Any other details? Several. There was no sign of a struggle, no powder marks on the body, no disturbance at all in the room, and a cigarette was still burning in the ashtray. Only Ames didn't smoke. I see. Anything else? Yes. We have three prospective suspects and one definite clue. A clue, Markham? What is it? In the dead man's hand, Sergeant Heath found a button from a sports jacket. One of those leather buttons, you know the kind. Yes, I do. And that's your clue, Markham? Of course. I'd forget it if I were you. What? Why? The button was planted there just to throw off any investigator. Vance, what can you possibly know about... My dear Markham, if there were no signs of a struggle and no powder marks on the body, how could the killer have been near enough to the victim for Mr. Ames to yank a button from a coat? Yeah. Now that you mention it, I see what you mean. Of course, the killer might have been near enough to Mr. Ames to shoot him after a struggle, providing there was time enough for him to straighten up the apartment after firing the shot, but apparently there wasn't. No, there wasn't. The neighbor came rushing in immediately, he says. The murderer undoubtedly went out the back way. Undoubtedly. Well, it's nice to know I'm right about something. You want to know about the suspect, Vance? Please. First, there's a man named George Leroy, who lost a fortune due to the dead man's stock recommendation. Yes. Then there's a gangster named Nate Amico. Ames was fooling with his girlfriend. And last, there's the girlfriend. Who's she? Her name is Dawn Vander, former nightclub singer. She's the one who supplied Sergeant Heath with the information about the two other suspects. She's being held at the apartment now. Is she attractive, Markham? From what I understand, she is. Well, in that case, what are we doing here? (laughs) Miss Vander, if there's anything you can tell me about this case, I'd be very grateful. I can't tell you anything if I don't know anything, can I, Vance? And if I did know anything, anything more than I told the police, I'd tell you, wouldn't I? I certainly hope so. <clears throat> uh, this was Mr. Ames' living room, I imagine? That's right. Oh, I wish I could help you. I do too, Miss Vander. Uh, oh, Markham. Yes, Vance? Uh, come in, will you, please, Markham? Yes, of course. Something I can do? I think so. You can let Miss Vander go, for one what? thing. Oh, no kidding. Oh, gee, thanks, Vance. Is it all right for me to go, Mr. Markham? It is, if Van says so. But please don't leave town, Miss Vander. We may need your testimony later. Oh, I'll be around. Thanks, Mr. Markham and uh, Mr. Vance. I wish I could think of a way of thanking you. Uh, forget it, Miss Vander. So long. Markham, you mentioned to me that Mr. Ames didn't smoke. Yet there was a cigarette still burning in the ashtray when his body was found. Yes, a Menlo, king size. It was mm. smoldering. Somebody, the murderer probably, tried to put it out, but wasn't successful. You know how cigarettes sometimes keep burning? Yes, of course. No lipstick marks. <laughs> you know better. We don't often get breaks like that. Sergeant Heath, incidentally, was very disappointed when you exploded his pet clue, the leather sports jacket button. I'm sorry. I thought it might save him some time trying to track it down. It did. He has another clue he picked up near the back door, Vance. Here, take a look. Book of paper matches, eh? It's the book. The matches are all gone. But look at the edge of the cardboard, Vance. Hmm? There are several indentations, you see? Apparently hmm. made by a thumbnail. Well, that's not too unusual, Markham. Many people have the nervous habit of putting their fingernail into a paper match cover. Do it myself sometimes. Yes, I know. I've seen you. You didn't murder Stuart Ames, did you, Vance? <laughs> well, not that I remember. <laughs> but I wouldn't be too surprised if it was the murderer who discarded this match holder. Seems to me we ought to make a survey of our suspects and find which one had a habit of putting his nail into the cardboard. Good. I must remember to tell Sergeant Heath to withhold any mention of our finding this clue. I wouldn't want the newspapers to get hold of it. Wouldn't you, Markham? Why not? Well, it's perfectly plain why not. If the newspapers print it, the murderer will know we're working on that angle, and he'll be extra careful when we interview him to make sure he doesn't give himself away. That's very good logic, Markham, but I think that the newspapers ought to get the story. But, Vance, I've seen you do this very thing on other cases. You hold back some bit of evidence so that you can capitalize on it later on. Yes, I do, Markham, but those were other cases. This case is an entity in itself. 
I think another theory applies to it. Yes? Make sure the reporters get the story of the match cover, Markham. Then give me 24 hours, and I'll deliver your murderer to you. Attorney Markham. The White Willow murder case began with the finding of the body of Stuart Ames, stockbroker specialist in White Willow stock. Suspects include George Leroy, who went bankrupt following Ames' market tips, Nate Amico, gangster boyfriend of Dawn Vander, nightclub singer whom Ames is seeing, and Miss Vander herself. Idle Vance believes that a paper matchbox cover with fingernail markings is a vital clue, but hasn't said why. One of my men has reported that Miss Vander has just visited Nate Amico's apartment, but we don't have any... Oh, now, now, look, honey, you're blowing your top. Put that gun away, will Oh, you? no, Nate, it stays just where it is, and you stay right where you are. Don't make a move. Uh, and don't say anything till I tell you it's okay to talk. Well, I'm darn, baby. Shut look. up, I said. Who are you, who are you calling? The district attorney. Oh, you thought you were awful cute, didn't you, Nate? Well, I'm cuter. Oh, now, baby. Shut up and don't come near me. Uh, Mr. Markham, this is Dawn Vander. I'm in Nate Amico's apartment. Yes, I know. One of my men saw you go in. Good. Get him to come right up here, Markham. Nate killed Stuart Ames. What? I know he did. Oh, you no know, good through time and broad. Oh. Miss Vander, what was that, please? Oh. Miss Vander. You did it. I didn't get it. Didn't you, baby? Hello? You did Hello. it. Miss Markham? Oh, yes, I'm still here, Miss Vander. What happened? Don't bother sending up any men for Nate Amico, Mr. Markham. Send them up for me. I just shot and killed him. Uh, do you want me to go in with you, Vance, or do you prefer to talk to Miss Vander alone? Either way, Mark. In that case, I'll leave you here. But first, Vance, may I ask you why you're going to see Miss Vander? Certainly, Mark. There are things in this case with which I'm not satisfied. I don't understand why you can say that. It's very obvious that Amico killed Ames. And that Miss Vander killed Amico when he tried to prevent her from telling that to me on the telephone. The last part of that statement is correct, Markham. I have an idea. You have an idea. It was Miss Vander who killed Ames. Frankly, I don't have any such ideas, Markham. Oh. Just in case you did, I'd like to remind you, Vance, that Miss Vander uses a great deal of makeup. And there was no lipstick stain on the cigarette we found smoldering in Ames' apartment. I realize that that practically removes suspicion from her. Then there's the clue of the matchbox. Miss Vander certainly doesn't seem to be the nervous type, does she? No, and while we're on the subject, she doesn't seem to be the type to carry paper matches either. But I'm going to see her regardless. As you say, that, Which cell is she in? Uh, first one to the right. Mm. I'll talk to her from the outside through the bars. Thank you, my friend. I'll see you later. Right. Uh, come into Heath's office when you're through, will you, Vance? I'll do that. <laughs> Miss Vander? Oh, well, I must... I'm sorry I'm being such a baby. I'm sorry you're being held in this detention cell, Miss Vander. But you will have to stand proud, you know. Yes, yes, I know. I don't really care what happens to me at the trial of events. As soon as I found out that it was Nate who killed Stuart, my whole world fell apart. When I questioned you, why didn't you tell me it was Nate? That would have saved you a lot of trouble and a prison sentence. I know, but I was afraid of him. Later I thought it over, and when he tried to stop me from telling Mr. Markham, I shot him when he went for his gun. <laughs> Cigarette, Vance? No, thank you. Here, I'll light it. Uh, I have my own lighter, thanks. It, it was self-defense, Vance. Markham knows that. He, he could hear Nate threaten me over the telephone. Yes, I know. He told me that. Uh, having trouble with that lighter, Miss Vander? <laughs> no fluid, I guess. Allow me, please. Just hand it to me through the bars. <laughs> These Burton lighters are tricky. There. Thank you. Is there anything I can get for you while you're here, Miss Vander? Oh, no, I don't think so. Unless you can get me my compact. I'm lost without it. 
I even settle for my earrings or a cigarette holder or a couple of bobby pins. Anything so I don't look like everybody else in this cell row. I'll ask Mr. Markham to get them for you, Miss Vander. I'll send you some cigarettes. Uh, what brand are you smoking? Douglas Cork Tips. Right. Oh, thank you, Vander. Oh, no trouble, Miss Vander. After all, you did me a favor, you know. Yeah. You mean by finding Stuart Ames' murderer for you? Yes. That is, if it was Mr. Ames' murderer you killed. I beg your pardon. You're Mr. Leroy. Yes? Who are you? My name is Vance. Philo Vance. Oh, how are you, Mr. Vance? Fine, thank you. Uh, Mr. Leroy, you follow the market? I did when I had enough money to play with stocks. I don't anymore. I just come down here now to see how much money I might have made if I bought stocks of my own choosing. Instead of the ones the late Stuart Ames picked out for you. Yes, that's right. That was the information we had, Mr. Leroy. I just wanted to be sure. By the way, uh, hmm? you smoke? Well, yes, of course I do. May I see your lighter? I don't use a lighter. Ordinary paper matches are good enough for me. You want to see them? Yes, as a matter of fact, I do. Oh, here you are. Have them right in my hand. It's a habit, I guess. Mm. These nail punctures in the side, that's habit too, isn't it? Well, I I don't know. I hadn't thought much of it. I didn't realize I was doing it. No, I venture to say you didn't. Now, wait a minute, Vance. Don't build anything. The police know that dead gangster killed Ames. I didn't kill him. You've got to believe that. Do I, Leroy? Why? Well, Vance, you asked me to meet you on the corner of 5th Avenue and 57th Street. I did. Now, tell me, where are we heading? Toward the solution of the White Willow murder case, I hope, Markham. See this tobacco shop? Yes, I do, but what has it to do with our case? Come on in here with me and find out. Very well. Gentlemen, may I help you? Yes, please, if you will. If I'm not mistaken, this store is the exclusive agency for Douglas Cigarettes. That's correct, sir. We import them, Douglas cigarettes and Burton lighters. I'd like a carton of Douglas's, please. Cork tipped. Very good, sir. Thank you. I'll have them wrapped. Vance, I don't know what you're driving at. You remember, of course, that it wasn't a Douglas cigarette we found in Stuart Ames' apartment. It was a Menlo. Of course. This carton is for Miss Vander. She asked me to get her some Douglas cork tipped cigarettes. So I'm getting them. Oh, well, that's different. The cigarettes will be wrapped in a moment, sir. Is there anything else I can do? Yes. A Burton lighter was sold sometime recently, yesterday perhaps, to a very attractive young lady. I'd like to see the gentleman who waited on her. Well, if it's the young lady whose photographs are in the newspaper, sir, I'm the man. She came in and purchased a lighter and a package of Douglas's the first thing yesterday morning. Never saw her before that. That's what I thought. Dawn Vander bought a cigarette lighter yesterday morning, Vance. How did you know that? I'll explain later. Will you have her and Mr. George Leroy in your office this afternoon, Markham? I'd like to talk to them both, but I'm sure only one of them will want to listen to me. Darn. Having trouble with that cigarette lighter, Miss Vander? Yes. You want to try and make it work again, Mr. Vance? Try these matches of mine. They never fail. Thanks. Here you are. Now, Mr. Leroy... You and I had a little chat in the brokerage office this morning. You didn't tell me all I wanted to know. I'll tell you the whole truth, Vance. I offered to pay Nate Amico to kill Stuart Ames for me. But he told me that he would do it for the fun of it. Well, Vance, that just about cinches the case against the dead Nate Amico, doesn't it? Not quite, Markham. Not quite. What do you mean, not quite, Vance? I told you I knew he killed Stuart Ames. That's the reason I shot him. Now you hear this Mr. Leroy tell you Nate told him he was going to kill Stuart. What else do you want? For one thing, I want those matches I gave you, if you don't mind. What? Thank you. And now, in case you'd still like to know what I want, Miss Vander, I want Mr. Markham to hold you for the murder of Stuart Ames. Mr. 
Miss Williams, will you please read back these notes on the White Willow murder case? Oh, sure, Mr. Vance. It'll be a pleasure. Nothing like combining fun and work, Miss Williams, is there? Oh, that's right. Especially when I get to work for you, Mr. Vance. Well, here, here are the notes. To F.X. Markham, District Attorney. You have asked me why I was certain that Miss Vander was Stuart Ames' killers. And you cited the cigarette left burning in Ames' apartment when his murderer fled. Go ahead, please. Yeah. You wanted to know how a girl could have left that cigarette there and there'd be no lipstick marks on it. Very simple. Miss Vanda used a cigarette holder. It was one of the articles taken from her when she was in jail. Oh, well, that's right so far. Mm. About her murder of Nate Amico. Apparently, Mr. Amico saw her enter or leave the apartment of the dead Mr. Ames immediately after she had killed him. He reminded her of this hold he had on her, and she killed him, too. Very cleverly, inasmuch as she had you on the telephone when she did. Mm, that was quite a trick. Uh, please continue, Miss Williams. Right. Now, Mark, you will want to know why Miss Vander would kill a man while you were listening just to cover up another killing. The answer is simple. She had a perfect self-defense alibi. An alibi you would have given her, but she might have gone to the chair if Nate Miko had ever decided to talk about her killing Ace. Well, that's all there is so far, Mr. Vance. Would you... Would you please tell me how you knew it was she? Well, as I said, Miss Vander was clever. She knew about the clue of the matchbox cover with its nail impressions because she'd read about it in the papers. Uh Uh-huh. She immediately went out and bought a cigarette lighter. The Burton's a little difficult to work at first, so I knew it was new when she tried to use it while I was visiting her. Right. Another thing. She realized we knew the brand of cigarette she had left in Ames' apartment, so she switched brands. Mm. Switched to Douglas's. But the clerk said he'd never seen her in the store before she bought the lighter. Therefore, that was another lie that came back to haunt her. Oh, from what I read, Mr. Vance, that other suspect, uh, Mr. Leroy, well, he used to mark a match cover with his fingernail, just like the one that was left in Mr. Ames' apartment. Yes, he did. But he made no effort to hide that fact from me when I questioned him. He had nothing to hide, you see. Oh. Yesterday, in Mr. Markham's office, I let Miss Vander have a book of matches. And while I was questioning Mr. Leroy, she was so interested, she forgot herself and used her fingernail on the match cover. Oh. But when I saw that and added up all the other factors I knew... I was certain she was the killer. You know the reason why she killed Ames, Mr. Vance? I think so. It seems that he was about to leave town and her. It also seems that when she came up to see him the night of the murder, he refused to either take her with him or return a lot of money he had borrowed from her. That was enough reason for her to put an end to him. I guess that's right. And calling you in, Mr. Vance, was enough reason to put an end to the White Willow murder case.
Mr. Vance? Miss Williams, is Miss Deering there? No, I'm sorry, Mr. Vance. She's not. Is there anything I can do for you? Yes, please come in my private office, Miss Williams. Yes, sir. Yes, Mr. Vance? I want you to take some notes on the White Willow murder case, Miss Williams. Make a copy for me and send a copy to Mr. Markham, please. I always send a copy to the district attorney, Mr. Vance. Good. Oh, before I begin, there'll be a Miss Sarah Payton in to see me in a few minutes. Yes. She telephoned for an appointment. When she arrives, ask her to come right in, will you please? She's out in the outer office now, Mr. Vance. She said her appointment wasn't until noon, so she preferred to wait, she said. Well, ask her to come in now, will you please, Miss Williams? The notes can wait. Certainly, Mr. Vance. In a second. Uh, Miss Payton, would you come in, please? Oh, thank you very much. How do you do, Mr. Vance? I'm Sarah Payton. Oh, hello, Miss Payton. Uh, please sit down. All right, Miss Williams, please. Yes, Mr. Vance. Now, Miss Payton, what can I do for you? For one thing, Mr. Vance, you can look at me. Oh? Uh-huh. D- did you did you ever see a more ordinary-looking woman in your life? I beg your pardon? Well, I'm sensible about it, Mr. Vance. I should be. After all, I'm not a child. I'm 34 now. I don't see how... How that affects you or or how it can be important? Well, it is. Believe me, it is. I've got to tell you some facts first. Please listen. Of course. Well, when I was a child, I was just a child. I I wasn't as pretty as little girls generally are. I was just a child, a very plain child. I went to dancing school, but the boys had to be either bribed or threatened to dance with me. Go on, please. Well, it was the same in school. I I went to proms, sure, and dances, and I tried to be friendly, but the other girls were always more attractive. Boys always wanted to be with them. They never wanted to be with me. I I went through my life like that, Mr. Vance, being just one of the people everybody sees every day that nobody pays any attention to. Are you sure you wanted to see me, Miss Payton? I'm a private investigator. I know, Mr. Vance, and I'm, I'm quite sure I want to see you. About a year and a half ago, I inherited quite a bit of money, and now I believe I'm going to be murdered. Murdered, eh? You're rather calm about that, Miss Payton. If I am, it's because it doesn't matter greatly to me, Mr. Vance. You see, during the past year, I've, I've had all the happiness anyone could possibly ask for. What happens to me now it isn't terribly important. Well, that sounds like you've come to me to see that I do not prevent your murder. Well, that's partly correct. I want to pay you, Mr. Vance, not to investigate my murder if if I'm killed. I see. In other words, you don't want your murderer caught by me if he succeeds in eluding the police. That's it, exactly. He's clever, but, but you're clever too, Mr. Vance, and I, I don't want him caught. Miss Payton, this is the strangest proposition ever made to me. I'm sorry, I have to turn it down. I was afraid you would. There's no harm in trying. Who is it you think will murder you? Oh, no, Mr. Vance. After all, you wouldn't help me. Why should I help you? making will fit you. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Seems to be the right width across the shoulders. Must you do that now, Matilda? Well, I do if I ever expect to finish the sweater. I think maybe I ought to give it an extra inch or so. It might shrink. Give it two extra inches, but leave me alone. Well, I'm sorry, Samuel. I didn't mean to annoy you. Oh, it isn't you. It's that sister of mine, Sarah. What am I going to do about her? Nothing. Why should you do anything about her? She's living her life the way she wants it. She's old enough to know what she's doing. I can't sit by and let her throw herself away on that... that gigolo. How a girl can let herself be talked into... Oh, I can't understand it. I just can't understand it. That's because you're a man. I'm man enough to do something about that situation, I'll tell you that. I bet she's even left him all of her money. Wouldn't surprise me any if she changed her will and left everything to him. Oh, not everything, Samuel. You know she'll leave you something. I know. I don't know anything. 
She inherited a lot of money. She'll leave him the money. You wait and see. Seems to me that something ought to be done about him, Samuel. Don't you think? No, I don't. I think something ought to be done about my sister. Oh, say it again, Joe. Just w- once more. I love you, Sarah, darling. You're the sun, the stars, you're everything. Oh, you're lying. But it sounds so good. Sounds so wonderful. You you didn't mind my buying you that easy chair. I, I was hoping you'd like it. Mind? I never mind anything you do, Sarah Down. You know something? Hmm? I've never been so happy in my life as I've been this last year. You just made it perfect for me. I don't care what happens after this. I'm glad. You got a right to be. I guess I should be too sensible to believe that a man like you would fall in love with me. But I don't want to be sensible. (laughs) Can you understand that? I understand only you, darling. Yes, I believe you do. Well, Sarah... Let me finish. I've been sensible all my life, and all my life has been dull, miserable. The one time I forgot to be sensible, I remembered to be happy. That's when you came into my life, Joe. You've been wonderful for me. Sarah, darling, I'm delighted. What else can I say? Nothing. There's nothing I want you to say. I I have to run now. Please, please, please love me a little while longer. Forever, darling. I'll see you to the door. Tonight? Dinner in the theater. Seven o'clock, Joe, at my apartment. Of course. Goodbye, darling. Goodbye. Oh, brother. Are you kidding? Very pretty scene, Joe. You're going to be quiet on after. Oh, shut up. Please, 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 Joe. Love me a little while longer. Oh, nuts. That's supposed to be a smart dame. I'm glad I'm stupid. Will you shut up, Diane? It's tough enough making love to that gal without being reminded of it when she's not around. I don't know if you mind it as much as you say. What? I said I don't know if you mind it as much as you say. Look, you, you know I've got to make love to her. You know what kind of money we're playing for. Oh, you do it too good, Joe. You do it like you meant it. Maybe you want all that dough and you want her, too. And what happens to me if that happens? It's not going to happen. It better not. I don't have to remind you that we're a team, you and I. Do I, Joe? Look, will you shut up? Yeah, when I'm finished. Joe, you and I are a hundred-buck dance team. We never were anything else. We'll never be anything more. It was me that spotted this gal. Me that planned it. Sure it was you. So why grind? Because it looks like you're doing some planning of your own. Uh... Well, don't do it, Joe. Your mind ain't used to working. It could be unhealthy if you start using it this late in life. Remember what I say, Joe. It could be very unhealthy. Vance? Oh, Vance? In here, Markham. My private office. Come on in. I'm on the way. How are you, Vance? Very well, thank you, Markham. And very surprised at your visit. (laughs) Don't give me that, Vance. Nothing surprises you ever. Won't you sit down, my complimentary friend? Your complimentary friend happens to be a very busy district attorney at the moment. There's been a murder, Vance. A woman named Sarah Payton. Sarah Payton, eh? Well, that was to be expected. You mean you knew she was going to be murdered? No, but she did. She was in to see me to pay me not to look for her murderer. What? I won't explain it now, Markham, but that's what happened. Tell me the details. All right, I'll give them to you as far as we know them. She was found dead in her one-room apartment, shot to death. Mm -hmm. Her body was in one corner, and a man's top hat was on the studio bed in another corner of the room. Really? Yes. Sergeant Heath is checking it now. Heath's done quite a bit of investigating and found out some very important information. Such as the fact that there was a gigolo mixed up with Miss Payton? Well, well, yes, but Vance... How did I know? She practically told me, Markham. No mystery about it, believe me. Tell me what else Heath found out. Well, this gigolo, his name is Joe, is a professional dancer, part of the team of Joseph and Deanne. Small time, as I understand it. Miss Payton's brother gave us that information. Her brother? Who's he? Oh, very legitimate, Vance. Wool in business, quite substantial. Married, has been for 15 years. He told us about this Joe. Yes, so you said. And there was a top hat on the bed in the murdered woman's apartment, eh, Markham? Yes, we reason that the murderer was somebody Miss Payton knew. He came in, they quarreled, and he shot her. Then, believing the noise of the gun would attract neighbors, he fled, forgetting his high hat. Very possible, of course, Markham. Uh, what are you looking for, Vance? My hat, Markham. Just because your murderer forgot his is no reason why I should go out investigating him without mine. Good 
me a little help on these lifts, Diane. Jump when I lift you. Jump? All I gotta do is jump. Joe, I'm so jumpy now, I don't know what I'm doing. Let's stop rehearsing. I can't keep my mind on what I'm doing. Okay, that suits me. Mike, that's all for now. Okay. What's the use of rehearsing this dance act, anyhow? A couple of weeks, we'll have all the dough we need now that your girlfriend got knocked off. Maybe you got something there. How did you know about her getting killed? I forgot to ask you. I read it in the papers. It wasn't in the papers. How did you know about it? I heard it on the radio. It wasn't on the radio. Look, you want to stop this clowning and talk like you and me are supposed to talk? We're partners, remember? Sure, I remember. Only there's some things you... How do you do? I'm Philo Vance. May I come in? Who's stopping you? Thank you. You're Joseph and Diane, I imagine. I wanted to talk to both of you about the death of Miss Sarah Payton. What about it, Vance? You knew she was murdered. Sure he knew it. He told me about it. I told you. You knew it. You said you read it in the paper. Don't give me that. Excuse me, but it doesn't really matter what either of you said. How did you know about Miss Payton, Joe? I had a date with her last night. When I got to her joint, I found she'd been knocked off, so I scrammed. And you, Miss Diane? I was following Joe. I didn't trust him. I gathered that. If you didn't precede him, I don't imagine the police will be too interested in you. Of course, there's the little matter of proving whether you were there before or after your friend here, but that will be taken care of later. Okay with me. They, um, find the will yet? Yes, as a matter of fact, they did. I went to Miss Payton's apartment with the district attorney, and we found the will together. You inherit quite a lot of money, Joe. No kidding. Isn't that nice? You don't seem very excited about it. I expected it. Anything else you want with advance? We're rehearsing our act. I think you've already done quite a good act where I'm concerned, Joe, but I... Yes, I knew I'd find you here. Oh, hello, Markham. May I present the dance team of Joseph and Diane. The district attorney, Mr. F.X. Markham. Hello. How How do you do? Vance, I'm glad you're right here on the ground floor for the finish of this case. The finish? So soon? We think so. Remember the high hat we found on the bed in the murdered woman's apartment? Yes, of course. Well, Sergeant Heath has succeeded in tracing it. It belongs to Joseph here. What? Joseph, I'm arresting you for murder. What is this? It's a frame. I didn't leave my hat in that dame's apartment. Come now, Joe. We know you were friendly with the woman. We know you inherited from her. We've got quite a case against you, Joe. Have you, Markham? I doubt it. What? Vance, whose side are you on? Yours, of course, but I'd rather you didn't make any mistakes, Markham. It is quite possible, of course, that you did find Joe's hat in Miss Payton's apartment. Of course we found it there on the bed. I repeat, it's quite possible that you found it there, but I can tell you quite definitely that he didn't leave it there. This is District Attorney Markham. The high hat murder case got its name from a hat that led us to Joe, a dancer. The topper was found on the bed in the apartment of murdered Sarah Payton, a woman who had tried to pay Philo Vance at one time not to investigate her murder. Vance has asked me to release Joe and his partner, Diane. But will not clarify his remark that Joe did not leave his hat in Miss Payton's apartment. We are watching Joe's rooms. And one of my men just phoned and said that Samuel Payton, the murdered woman's brother, has just gone in to visit the dancer. He should be there. Stand up, you dirty rat. Lay off. Stand up and take what's coming to you. Relax, will you, Payton? The cops let me off. They know I have nothing to do with killing your sister. I know better. Maybe they can't prove anything on you, but I'm not going to try. I'm going to beat it out of you. You'll admit it when I'm through with you. Don't be silly, Payton. You're out of your class. You think so? What do you think now? Somebody's liable to get hurt. Sure, you. Maybe that first smack didn't do the trick, but I'll beat the hey, living daylight. Cut it out. Quit it, you dope dope, huh? We'll see. Hey, I hate to do this, but... Markham speaking. Hello, Markham. This is Joe. The dancer, you know. Yes, I know. What is it? 
That dead dame's brother, Sam Payton, just came up to visit me. I know that, too. We've got men watching your apartment. You have? Then you better have one of them come up and cart this bird away. I had to knock some sense into his head. But that ain't all. No? What is all? As he fell on the floor, something dropped out of his back pocket, Markham. A gun, pal. What? Maybe you'd better get somebody up here right away, huh? Are you ready, Smith? Yeah. Well, this is it, Vance. We're going to shoot a bullet out of the gun we took from Samuel Payton into that cotton bale. And if it matches the bullet we found in his sister, we'll know plenty. Yes, I suppose you will. Well, let's get on with this, Mark. Right. Ready to go, Smith. Right. Well, that bullet's in the bale of cotton Smith shot at, Vance. Let's get it out. I'll take the gun, Smith. Suits right. me fine, Markham. I'd like a look at it, too. Of course. The bullet will be embedded in the cotton bale, but it can be removed easily. Uh, we use cotton I know, because... Markham, because it won't destroy any markings on the bullet. <laughs> Someday I'd like to be able to tell you something you don't know, Vance. Markham, there are a lot of things that fall into that category, <laughs> believe me. I'll get that bullet out with this pocket knife of mine. Ah, there we are. I did it. Oh, ugly thing, isn't it? Yeah, it could be very beautiful if it matches the bullet that killed Sarah Payton, Vance. I mean, it would solve this case beautifully. I hope you're right, my friend. Where's the microscope, Mark? In the next room. It's all set up with a bullet from Miss Payton already under the microscope. It won't take a second, then, to find out whether we have the murder gun. And the murderer. Yes, I know. Uh, through here, Vance. Right you are. Markham, let me smell that gun that Smith just fired, will you? Of course, here it is. There'll be a strong odor of cordite, you know. There should be. And there is. There's also a suspicion of another odor. Really? Well, metal can have its own peculiar smell, I suppose. I've put this bullet under the microscope, Vance. Want to take a look? I most certainly do. Hmm. Hmm. What are you humming about, my friend? The bullet markings match, Markham. The murder bullet was undoubtedly fired from the same gun Joe reports having taken from Mr. Samuel Payton. Vance, when you have that look of concentration on your face, you're thinking, so perhaps I'd better not interrupt. But I would like to know what it is you're thinking about. To be honest, it's about this visit we're making to Mr. Samuel Payton and his wife. I could have sent Heath to arrest Payton. After all, the murder gun did drop out of his pocket after Joe had clipped him. That's Joe's story, Markham. Did you ever think that that might be an excellent way of getting rid of the murder gun? Joe may have had the gun all the time and merely told you it had fallen out of Peyton's pocket. Hey, Vance, that is possible, isn't it? It's very likely, I'd say. Well, we'll find out very shortly. This is the Peyton home. Coming, Vance? Definitely. Now, if Joe planted the murder gun so that it would seem Peyton had advanced, how does that tie up with your theory that he didn't leave his top hat on the murdered woman's bed? It doesn't. But about the hat and the bed, Mark? Joe's in show business. Show people have a superstition about hats on beds. They'd no more think of leaving their hat on a bed than they'd think of jumping out of a window. Oh, I see. Of course, it is possible that Joe knew we'd think the hat was a plant if it were found on a bed, so he put it there purposely to clear himself. But, uh, that's unlikely. Vance, nothing is unlikely. Yes? Uh, Mr. Payton, this is Philo Vance, and I'm District Attorney Markham. Oh, yes, I... I've been expecting you to come in. I'm afraid we're going to have to ask you to come with us, Mr. Payton. I've been expecting that, too. You knew we'd check the gun Joe took from you and find that it had fired the bullet that killed your sister? I thought you might. We're pretty thorough, Mr. Payton. However, to be perfectly fair about this, I'd like to know one thing. Yes? Did you bring that gun to Joe's room? Yes, I did. The gun's mine. I'm your man, Mr. Markham. I murdered my sister. Keep playing, Mike. We're paying you by the hour. Joe will show up sometime, rather. You know, it's a funny thing. It's about time you showed up, you big clown. How long... Oh, it's Vance. Hello, Diane. Isn't Joe here? No. You want him? Not particularly. There were some things I wanted to ask him, but they weren't terribly important. No, I don't imagine they were. I hear you got a confession from Mr. Payton. It's good work, Dan. Well, thank you. That is, if Mr. Payton is the murderer, which I doubt. I think I'll wait for Joe. It's okay with me. Piano bother you? Not at all. 
Very rhythmic, I'd say. You dance? Not very well. Want me to teach you? Come yeah. on, come here. It's easy. Just put your right arm around me. Mm-hmm. That's good. Now, you just think where you want me to follow, and I'll follow. See? Easy, isn't it? Twice. Twice. <laughs> What perfume is that you're wearing, Diane? It's called finesse. Like it? Very much. Always use it? All the time. Why? Why? Because if that's true, it practically absolves you from the murder of Sarah Payton. to see Mr. Peyton Vance? Why? He's confessed. Yes, I know. It sort of throws out your theory that Joe planted the gun, doesn't it? That it definitely does, Markham. I still want to talk to him, though. His cell is right down the line. Incidentally, in his confession, he gave the motive. He knew his sister had left him some money in her will, and he wanted it immediately. Simple motive, isn't it, Markham? This whole case is terribly simple. At the moment, I don't know why I bother you with it. Oh, it was no bother. But it isn't solved yet, my friend. Oh, Vance, please, not that. We don't often get a murderer to confess with so little trouble. You got a confession, all right, Markham. But was it from the murderer? This the cell? Uh, the next one. Oh, I think Mrs. Payton is with him now. That bother you any? Not at all. Hello, Payton. Hello, Vance. Markham. I've got the keys. I'll open the cell door. All right. This is my wife. Mr. Vance, Mr. Markham, Mrs. Payton. How do you do? How do you do, do, Mr. Mr. Vance, isn't there anything you can do for my husband? He isn't a murderer. I've been trying to tell that to the district attorney, Mrs. Payton. Oh, you have? Then there's hope for him? I think so. Why should there be hope for me? I killed my sister, I admit it. Oh, no, I'm sorry, Matilda, but there isn't anything. Here, take my handkerchief. I have one of my own in my bag. Delicate perfume your wife uses, Mr. Payton. What's the difference whether it's delicate or not? What do you two want here? Has she always used it, Mr. Payton? Yes, yes, always. She has it made out. She likes it. Now leave her alone. I'm sorry, but we can't. You see, I'm very certain that despite your confession, it was your wife who killed your sister. I've got to know one thing. Only one, Markham? One thing at a time, let's make that. Now, you told me that Sarah Payton came to you and asked you not to look for a murderer in the event that she was killed. Why would she do that? Because she suspected that Joe would kill her eventually, Markham. And she didn't want him caught. I don't understand that. In order to understand that, you have to understand the woman. She was a plain woman. She wasn't ugly, just nondescript. Everything about her was plain. The way she looked, the way she dressed her hair, everything. That idea about you not catching her murderer was decidedly not plain, Vance. No, it was. You see, Markham, even Miss Payton's mind was just run of the mill. She wasn't clever and she wasn't stupid. All her life, she'd either been ignored or disregarded by men. Please go on. Then she inherited a lot of money. Even that meant nothing to her. She didn't know what to do with it. Her wants was simple. Money wasn't important. You may not believe it, Markham, but it's hard to cultivate expensive habits when you're not used to them. I believe it, all right, but I also believe we're getting away from why she didn't want her murderer caught. Well, she believed that her gigolo, our friend Joe, would kill her eventually. He came on the scene soon after she inherited all that money, and he gave her what she told me was the only happiness she'd ever had in her life. She was content to pay for that happiness with her life. It was all right with her if he killed her? Yes, and she didn't want him caught after he killed her. She was quite willing that he get away with her murder. He could have killed her for the money she left him, of course, but why didn't she just give him the money? That would have saved her life. It wouldn't have been very much of a life, Markham. If she'd given him the money, she'd never have seen him again, and she knew it. Hmm. Well, that makes sense now. Women are funny creatures, Vance. There's an epic remark, my friend, that must have been made centuries ago. Man's a funny creature, too. Take Samuel Payton. He was willing to go to the chair for a murder his wife committed. How did he know she had killed his sister? The gun. She used his gun. But she carried it to Sarah Payton's apartment in her handbag. And anything a woman carries in her handbag gets the perfume of the bag on it. Yes, I've noticed that. When you found that Mrs. Payton's perfume matched the odor of the gun, you knew you'd found your killer. That's right. Despite her husband's confession, he tried to shield her, knowing she'd killed his sister for the money that was left him. She tried to cover the murder by getting Joe's high hat and leaving it at the scene of the crime. But we saw through that. 
Quite an emotional sequence, wasn't it, Markham? Quite. But like all things when you work on them, Vance, it reached a very satisfactory end. Yes, Markham, I think you can safely say that this is the end of the hi-hat murder case. Balcony, we stop the camera, we pan into you lying on the floor, right? Just go ahead and shoot the scene. I'll be where I'm supposed to be. Okay. Now, Joe, go first. How do you like that guy, Joyce? I've only been in 70 Western movies. In every one of them, there's a scene like this. I don't think Mr. Haley would tell you anything if he wasn't sure there was a reason. You are a little unreliable, you know, Art. Despite what the kids think of you and those 70 Westerns. Well, I'm with friends. I can see that. All right, cut it out, Art. We want to shoot this scene. All right. You two up in the balcony. Yeah. You start slugging, you wrestle, and both of you fall over the balcony, right? Right. All right. Quiet, everybody. Quiet. 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 All right, now. We can pick both of you guys up on a microphone, so make this good and real. All right, let's make this. Sound. Sounds ready. Quiet, everybody. Roll them. Production number one, one, two, five, four, three, six. Hey, wait. Okay, cut, cut. All right, that was good, that was great. Fine. Well, that stunt man we've got doubling for you really can take falls, can he, Art? That's what he's paid to do, isn't it? Yeah, but everyone doesn't do what he gets paid to do around here. For instance... You're paid to act. Who's writing your dialogue, Ed? Bill Moore? Very Hasn't he got enough trouble with the lines in this picture? This is the worst talk I've ever had to say. Well, I guess this is a typical Art Ingram picture, isn't it? You've griped about everything so far. Your story, your lines, your leading lady. Oh, you're not too bad. Thanks. Tell me, you do think your horse is all right? Sarcasm's catching around this place. What do you say, Ed? Let's get on with the next scene. All right, Susie. All right, places for next scene, everybody. Places. Places. I will run through it once and then shoot it. Let's try to make the first one a take. <laughs> hey, Joyce, look at the way those extras move when Ed yells at them. What a life. Yeah, what a life that double of mine leads. You realize, Joyce, that I was supposed to take that fall from the balcony. I realize it very well. You have no idea how I wish you had taken it. Maybe you wouldn't have gotten up. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
Gardner, put down that six shooter, he said. Bill? Bill, are hmm? you busy? Oh, no, no. I'm I'm just banging on this typewriter to keep my fingers limber. What's up, Joycey? Oh, I just came off the set. I've been working with Art Ingram all morning, yeah. Are you really not busy, Bill? I'm doing some last-minute rewrites on tomorrow's scene, Joyce. Art was complaining about his lines, and Ed wants to keep peace in the family, so little Billy goes to work. He can wait, though. What do you ask? I'm not complaining, Bill, but I wish you'd write me some smart lines, some things that'll give me a chance to stand out. I've got all I can do to get my face in the camera when I work with Art. That bum knows more tricks than a monkey. You're not kidding. I'll do a rewrite on your lines for you, Joyce. Glad to do it. Oh, gee, that's swell. (laughs) Apparently, you don't like him either. What do you mean, either? I don't like him, but I didn't think there was any friction between you two. Well, there is. Tell me something, Bill. What reason do you have for hating Art? You really want to know? Mm Mm-hmm. I'll tell you. I had a kid sister in college a couple of years ago. She was terrific. Pretty, had talent, was engaged to the campus hero. Had everything her own way. Mm. What college, Bill? Daniels University. Remember Joe Layton, All-American End? Well... Intercollegiate heavyweight champ, baseball and track star. Mm, I know the name. Well, that was the guy Mary was engaged to. And one day, Art Ingram went up to Daniels U to shoot some scenes for a picture, and he met my sister. She didn't have sense enough to tell me she'd met him, but she fell all over herself, falling in love with the guy. She quit school, followed him back to the coast, and six months later committed suicide. Oh, no. Oh, huh? Yes, with a capital Y. Someday Ingram and I are going to settle up about Mary. I promised myself that a long time ago. Bill, don't do anything about Art that'll get you in trouble. He isn't worth it. Believe me, he isn't. Don't worry, Joyce. When I do something about Art, it won't get me into any trouble. I guarantee that. You know the action in this scene. I'm not in the first part of it. Uh-huh. Art comes galloping up, rides in front of the camera, and then rides up. He's supposed to be chasing the bandits who have me. Fine. All right. One thing that guy can really do is ride. Mm. Quiet, everybody! Quiet! Quiet! Okay, let's make this. Sound. Sounds ready. Quiet, everybody. Roll them. Production number 11254, scene 7. Are you right? Action! What a thing to happen to me. Ingram's been thrown. Come on, George. Yeah. All right, get back. Everybody, get back. I don't touch him. Nobody touched him. Look at him. He's not moving. Come on, let us throw there. Let All us right. throw, will you? Ed. He's lying pretty still. I'll see in a minute if he's hurt. Ed. Ed. He's dead, Joyce. Looks to me like his neck's broken. Must have landed on it. Ed, look at his hand. What about it? When he rode past us a second ago, that big diamond ring of his was on his finger. I, I saw it. And so did I. You couldn't miss it. Hey, it's not there. And nobody touched the body before we got here. What happened to the ring? I don't know. All I know is what happened to Art Ingram. Like organ music, Vance? I like practically every kind of music, Markham. It's very restful. And so's your driving, by the way. For a district attorney, you drive very well. <laughs> How are a district attorney is supposed to drive? Oh, you know, full of fire and fury. <laughs> Always in a hurry to get somewhere. Out of my day off, Vance, and not when accompanied by my favorite of private investigators. Well, thank you. Come to think of it, if I do drive a little faster, we'll make my apartment by dinner time. I have an appointment with Mrs. Markham, and I don't want to be late. Late, Markham. Nothing's either late or early. Time is a convenience that we humans decided upon to facilitate appointments or to make a schedule practical. I never make appointments and I live by no schedule, so time is relatively meaningless to me. Uh-huh. Your remark comes under the same category, my friend. I we interrupt this to... organ concert to bring you a news report. Art Ingram, well-known movie cowboy, was killed in an accident this morning when his horse threw him. That's very unfortunate. Witnesses supply a fantastic angle to the accident. His director and co-star insist that when Ingram rode past the camera a few seconds before his death, a diamond ring was seen on his finger. When he was thrown, without ever being out of their sight, the ring was missing. We return you now to... 
Why turn off the radio, Vance? I thought you enjoyed the organ concert. There's one thing I enjoy more, Markham. Yes, and I know what it is. It's investigating murders. But apparently Art Ingram wasn't murdered. And if he was, you certainly have no way of knowing it. Haven't I? I think otherwise. Now, wait a minute, Vance. Don't tell me that just because that ring is missing, you think Ingram was murdered. The missing ring has nothing to do with it, Markham. They'll find the ring. It probably fell off Mr. Ingram's hand and is in the bushes somewhere. But something proves to me that man was murdered. Markham, your day off is herewith canceled. We're going to work. That's how it happened, Van. Exactly how it happened. He rode past you and the camera, Miss Payne. Yes. He was leaning over the horse's neck as if to get more speed from him. Then he fell off a few seconds later and landed on his head. And Vance, his neck was broken. That all makes sense. Not to me. Why don't you settle for being half right, Vance? They found the ring just as you said they would. It had fallen off Ingram's hand and was in the bushes at the side of the road. Why do you insist he was murdered? I'll explain that to you, Markham, but not now. Miss Payne. Yes? Did Mr. Ingram have any enemies in this troop? Why don't you ask me if he had any friends? That would be easier to answer. I see what you mean. Are you included in the camp of the enemies? Ingram didn't bother me one way or another. All I can tell you is I didn't like him. But there is somebody here who hated him. Who's that? Bill Moore. He wrote the scenario for the picture we were shooting. Believe me, Vance, he had a reason for seeing Ingram dead. That automatically gives me a reason for seeing him. Markham. Of course, Vance. Mr. Moore, please. Yes? Thank you, Mr. Moore. Come right in here, if you will. Well? Hello, Mr. Moore. Hello. I understand you and Art Ingram didn't get on very well. Who told you that, Joyce? Well, it's true, isn't it? Just because it's true doesn't mean it has to be public property. Okay, Mr. Vance, I hated Art Ingram. What are you going to do about it? Well, I don't know at the moment, young man. But if you did anything about killing him, I promise you I'll do something about that. What am I going to do? I'm going to try and finish the picture, of course. Right? No, no, no close-ups. I'll shoot all the scenes that Ingram was supposed to do with his double. That guy will have the most famous back and show business when I'm through. Right? Yeah. yeah. Okay, well, if there's any more trouble, I'll call you. So long. Mr. Haley, you're going to let me finish the picture? That's right, that's right, Wally. You're going to take Art's place. And we only need you for a couple of scenes. Oh, well, gosh, I'm not sure that I can do that, Mr. Haley. Okay, so you're not sure I am. It's very hard for me to remember more than one thing at a time, Mr. Haley. Yeah, 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 okay, now. We'll shoot the scenes in pieces. Yeah, but I would... Don't worry, will you, Wally? Haven't I got enough problems? With Vance and Markham and a couple of cops lousing up the studio and me trying to get a picture finished? Am I going to have trouble with you, too? Oh, no, 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 sir, Mr. Haley, I don't give anybody any trouble. Only I'm really a stuntman, not an actor. I know, I know. Now, will you stop worrying? Leave that to me. Uh, you'll be on a set ready to work at 9 o'clock tomorrow morning. Oh, this is great. This is fine. I start out shooting a cowboy picture and I wind up making a murder mystery. <laughs> Are you in there? Come in. Come in, Markham. I'm using the director's office for my own temporarily. I need someplace to concentrate while I'm correlating my findings on this movie murder case. And what are your findings, Vance? Well, I've questioned everybody in sight, Markham. That includes the director, Ed Haley, Ingram's co-star, Joyce Payne, the writer, Bill Moore, and Ingram's double, Wally Douglas. Uh But if I add up what I found out from all of them combined, I'd still have nothing. That Douglas interests me, though. Ingram's double? Mm Mm-hmm. Is it your idea that he killed Ingram thinking he could take the star's place? Hardly. He's no actor, and he knows it. He's an ex-pugilist, Markham. Was beaten up pretty badly in the ring, I understand. Of course, that's not unusual. Uh, Vance, let's understand each other. Both of us are working on this case. Neither of us, apparently, has made any headway. But you do know something that I don't. So let's start from there, shall we? You want to know how I knew it was murder. Is that it, Markham? It most certainly is. Well, that's reasonably simple. How many Art Ingram pictures have you seen? Oh, few, I guess. I don't know actually why. You remember the scenes where he rides horseback? Of course. He was an excellent rider. Oh, now I get it. You've built a whole murder theory on the premise that a rider as good as Ingram wouldn't slip off his horse. (laughs) Now, Vance. That reproachful tone would be used correctly if that was what I built my theory on. But it isn't, Markham. I've seen a dozen Ingram pictures. In every one of them, he rode horseback, and in every one of them, he wore gloves when he rode. That's not unusual. Most cowboy stars, maybe all of them wear gloves when they're riding. That is exactly why I knew Ingram was murdered. His director and co-star saw the ring on his finger when he rode past them, remember? Uh, if yes. the ring was seen on his finger, he couldn't have been wearing gloves. Yet he always wore gloves when he got on a horse. Now, what's the answer, Markham? Uh, oh, he didn't get on the horse. He was put on after he was dead. You're right. His killer figured out a way to make it look like an accident. 
Now I've got to think of a way to figure out the killer. District Attorney Markham. The movie murder case began when Art Ingram, cowboy star, was thrown from his horse. But Philo Vance reasoned that what looked like an accident was actually murder. Suspects include Ingram's director, his co-star, and a scriptwriter, Bill Moore, although Vance finds Wally Douglas, stuntman, an interesting character. In an effort to finish the picture, director Ed Haley is shooting an outdoor scene with Wally Douglas acting as Ingram. Vance and I are interested spectators. It is the following... Hey, George, You'll be interested in this, Markham, Vance. Now, in a scene, the hero rides right past us. He doesn't know the bridge up ahead is washed out, and he's heading for sure destruction. When the heroine, that's Joyce, the heroine rides up in back of him and lassos him. While both of them are riding at top speed? Well, in a Western movie, nobody ever rides any other way. <laughs> now, we've rehearsed this scene several times, and we're ready to shoot it. Miss Payne actually lassos Wally Douglas. Oh, yes, she's very good with the rope. You watch and see. Okay, here we go, everybody. Miss Payne, ready? Ready. Wally Douglas? Okay. All right, let's make this. Quiet, everybody. Quiet, quiet. Quiet. No sound. Quiet, everybody. Roll them. Production number one, one, two, five, four, C, seven. Take it away. Action. All right, boy, come on. Get it. Get it. Get it. Get it. Okay, Joyce, now throw that lasso. Throw it. Throw it. Ah. is very good with the rope, isn't she, Mr. Haley? Joyce, she's sensational. Terrific. Why? Yes, Vance, why? No reason. Must there be a reason for everything I say, Markham? No, but there generally is, isn't there? <laughs> Joyce? Bill, what are you doing in my dressing room? I'm here to take care of you, Joyce. That's what I'm here for. I didn't have a chance before this to really show you how I feel about you telling Vance about me and Art Ingram. He'd have found out anyhow, Billy. Vance would have found a way of... of... That's nothing of what I'm going to do to you, kid. Maybe this will teach you to keep your mouth shut. No, you don't. You don't get away with slapping me, you two-bit no talent. My hair. Let go of my hair. You would teach me where you are. I'll show you. Somebody's at the door. Let's quit this quick. Who's there? It's I, Philo Vance. May I come in? Come on. Oh, uh, hi, Vance. Joyce and I were just running over a scene. Yes, I heard part of it from outside. Scene is quite the word. You, uh, want to know what happened in here, don't you, Vance? I'd hate to think I couldn't guess. Actually, I came looking for you, Mr. Moore. I've just found out the reason you hated Art Ingram. You found out about my sister. That's right. I could have saved you a lot of trouble, Vance. After the way this guy busted in on me, believe me, I'd have told you all the details myself. Your sister was very young, very pretty, engaged to the campus hero... Four-letter man, is that right, Moore? That's right. She killed herself a few months after she left college to follow the late Mr. Ingram. You didn't want me to know about that, did you, Moore? No, but not for any reason that you think. I didn't want you to know because I didn't want that story dragged out again. Is that wrong? Not if that was the reason. I told you it was. Miss Payne. Yes? I watched you lasso Mr. Ingram's double this morning. You're quite strong. What about it? Well, somebody, whoever killed Ingram, had to boost him up to his saddle after he was dead. To tell you the truth, I didn't suspect you at first because you're a girl. Well? To continue telling you the truth, that fact doesn't continue to keep you off my list of suspects. Sit here next to me on this crane, Vance. And when we begin shooting, we'll swing up and out and come right over the action. This is very interesting, Mr. Haley. Thank you very much. What happens in this scene? Well, it's a mountain cabin, see? The hero walks in, finds one of the cattle rustlers guarding the girl, and knocks him out. We'll use Wally Douglas, of course, but he's been instructed to keep his back to the camera. I hope he can remember a simple thing like that. Douglas has approximately the same build as the late Mr. Ingram. Just about. Okay, everybody. Quiet. 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 Qui
Okay, let's make this. Sound. Sounds ready. Quiet, everybody. Roll them. The production 11254, scene 47. Anyway. Action. So. Look out, Art. He's got a gun. Uh, well, if he has, he won't get a chance to use it. I... Oh. Thank goodness you got here, darling. Please put your arms around me. You deserve it, you know. After all, you were the victim. The victor? Well, to, to the victor? Uh, victor over the verdant field. Cut! Cut! Hold it, everybody. What was wrong, Mr. Haley? You'll hear in a second, Pats. Oh, Wally. Wally Douglas. Your line is supposed to be, to the victor belongs the spoils. What happened to it, Wally? Oh, gosh... I, I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Haley. I, I, I just couldn't remember it. Oh, where'd you get the line you did remember? It? I don't know. It just came to me. Well, tell it to go away and not come around anymore. We don't want it. Yes, sir. All right. Let's make the whole scene over again. Places, everybody. Oh, Wally. Yes, Mr. Haley. Will you please remember your lines and keep your back to the camera? Okay. All right, everybody. Uh, you, Pete, get off the floor. Well, I have to take another poke in the jaw from Wally. It hits like a mule. Well, fake that punch, will you, Wally? You almost broke Pete's jaw. I'm sorry, Mr. Haley. I forget things. Yeah, yeah, I know. Places, everybody. Places, everybody. All right, let's do this again. Make it right this time. Uh, excuse me, please, Mr. Haley, but do you mind if I leave? Why, no, no, not at all. Uh, is this getting boring, Vance? On the contrary, it's very interesting. In fact, I might almost say revealing. <laughs> at least tell me what you're looking up, Vance. I will in a moment, Markham. Ah, here it is. The quotation is from Pope. Victor over the verdant field. Hmm. Whatever that means. It means a great deal to me, Markham. And it's going to mean a great deal more, I believe, after I make a long-distance phone call. Listen and listen close. Huh? I know it's 3.30 in the morning, but I couldn't call before because I've been watched. I know you killed Art Ingram, huh? but I hated him too. Hated him enough to give you a chance to get away. You see, Philo Vance knows you killed Art. Huh? Don't ask me how. He knows it, that's all. There's a train out of here at 5 o'clock that gives you an hour and a half to get packed, blow, and remember me in your dreams. Well, yeah. So long. How did I do, Vance? Very well, Miss Payne, very well. You see, I'm quite certain that you just spoke to Mr. Ingram's murderer. Now, Mr. Markham and I are going to get the proof we need. You know, I haven't been up this late or this early in years, Vance. It is almost 4.30 in the morning, isn't it, Markham? And our man hasn't shown up yet. The train should be here in a few minutes, and so should he. In fact, look. Where, Vance? It's very dark, Markham, but isn't that a shadow over there by the station platform? I don't see... Oh, yes, yes, it is. It is, Vance. It's a man. It's more than a man, Markham. It's our man. Better get in back of him in case there's trouble. Got a gun, Markham? Yes. Keep it handy. I'm going right up to him. Hello there. Huh? Going somewhere? Oh. Oh, it's you, Vance. Oh, so the tip was straight. You did know it was me, didn't you? Well, you're a sucker for trying to take me, Vance, because I'm going to... <laughs> I'm glad you did that, Markham. Very happy indeed that you knocked him out. If I hadn't, he most certainly would have knocked you out, Vance. He was just about to. And now, if I'm not too inquisitive, uh, who is he? Use your flashlight, Markham. I know you'll want to get a look at our murdering friend. I don't have my flashlight, and it's too dark to see. In that case, I'll enlighten you. The murderer of Art Ingram, Markham, was his own double, Wally Douglas. <laughs> Oh, 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 oh. 
No, Markham, I've never done anything quite like this before. You mean sitting in a private projection room and seeing yourself on the screen? That's right. I asked you to have a film and recording made of your explanation of the movie murder case so that we'd have it for our home vans. Mrs. Markham and I have a new 16-millimeter projector, and Mr. Haley practically begged to be allowed to shoot this for us. I'll know whether I'm indebted to him or not as soon as I see what I look like <laughs> and hear what I sound like. <laughs> Please don't forget I'm in the picture, too. Vance. Ready to begin any time, Mr. Vance. Well, that might as well be now. Good enough. Lights out. Here we go. Markham, you wanted to know why Wally Douglas killed Art Ingram and how I knew it was he who had done it. That's right, man. Well, to begin with, I was watching a fight scene being photographed when I saw Mr. Douglas knock out one of the actors with a powerful right hand. Oh, that's the beginning. His entire appearance indicated he had been a professional fighter, and that blow proved it. That still doesn't tie him up with the Ingram murder. No, but he made a curious speech when he had knocked out the man. He said something about the victor and verdant fields. I remember when that puzzled me. That was a very learned quotation to be used by an ex-pug. In fact, I had to look it up to find that it was written by Alexander Pope. That suggested to you, then, that Wally Douglas, the double, had been well educated. Reasonably well, at any rate. There was no question but that the beatings he had taken in the prize ring had affected his mind a bit. But it still functioned to an extent where he remembered certain incidents and lines from his past. Uh, that long-distance phone call you made. Well, that really What was it made to? Daniels University. I wanted a description of the four-letter athlete who had been the fiancé of the girl who killed herself over England. You mean the sister of Bill Moore, the writer? Correct. I got the description, Markham, and also found that the fiancé had majored in English and that Alexander Pope was one of his favorite authors. It seems that after his fiancée's death, he left college, went into the ring, and quit after absorbing terrific punishment. After that, he lived only to get revenge on the man who took the girl he loved from him. That's it, Mr. Vance. You figured out his murder scheme, Vance, just because he forgot to put gloves on Ingram's hands before boosting him onto his horse. That was the beginning of our activities, Markham. And now, this is the end of the movie murder case. Mr. Vance? Not that I can think of at the moment, Miss Williams. Let me know when Miss Deering comes in, will you please? Yes, sir. Oh, it's time for the news, Mr. Vance. Shall I turn on the radio? It's the only way I know of that I can hear the news, isn't it? <laughs> yes, sir. Here we are. Mr. Markham didn't call this morning, did he, Miss Williams? Why, no, sir. We haven't heard from the district attorney since the movie murder case, Mr. Vance. I guess he must be busy, huh? I guess so. And that's the news from Washington. On the local scene, police are baffled over a mysterious murder Mr. that occurred about midnight last night. Jane Green, daughter of wealthy merchant Eric Green, was found stabbed to death near her home. Neither her distraught parents nor her sister Penny could advance a motive for her death. Police Sergeant Heath has all available men working on the case. Although lack of clues may hinder their operation, Heath is closed. Other Please local turn that off, Miss Williams. Includes the finding of a kitten. Another murder, huh, Mr. Vance? And the radio said that the police are baffled. The police aren't the only ones, Miss Williams. I'm a little puzzled myself. 
You're sure Mr. Markham didn't phone me? I'm positive. You could call him, you know, Mr. Vance. Yes, I know, but... Oh, don't bother, Miss Williams. I'll get it. Oh. Vance speaking. Hello, Vance. Markham. Well, how are you, my friend? I rather expected this call, but I expected it earlier. What do you mean? I just heard over the radio about the mysterious murder of Jane Green. I understand there are no clues. Well, uh... Uh, yes, that's right, Vance, but some will turn up. They always do, you know. But I just called to check with you and tell you I'll be busy on this case for some time, so we won't be able to get together. Oh, Markham, don't you... Don't I want you to work on this case, Vance? I don't think so. Sergeant Heath and his men will find something. Thanks just the same, Vance. I'll be talking to you. Bye. Goodbye. What are you thinking about, Mr. Vance? Miss Williams, Mr. Markham doesn't want me on this case. He has a reason, he thinks. But I think I know what that reason is. Desk, Daniels. Joe, it's McNamara. Give me a rewrite, man. I've got something high. Give it to me, Mac. I'll take it. Get ready? Here it is. I'll give it to you fast. You can check me for spelling when I'm finished. Shoot. While police were combing the city for the mysterious slayer of 20-year-old Jane Green, the killer struck again. Penny Green, older sister of the dead girl, was murdered in the identical manner. I got it. Her body discovered by a passerby in an alley near the Green Mansion. Yeah. A singular feature of the killings, aside from the fact that a knife was used in both instances, was the fact that neither of the victims wore any makeup whatsoever. The meaning of this clue, if it is a clue, is still vague, Sergeant Heath of the Homicide Department admitted. That's all so far. I got it, Mac. You don't have to check the spelling. Better keep on the yarn. It's page one. We'll shoot whatever you give us into the later editions. Right. Okay, Joe, you know what happens if the cops turn up a killer. I know, Mac. You'll call me back. <laughs> Look, Heath, I don't want to be hard-boiled, but there must be something on those two murders that you've turned up. You've been working on them all day. Oh, I'm sorry, D.A. I've had men all over the greenhouse. I've had them checking the lives of those two girls. Something will crack. Something better, Heath. Eric Green is an important man. Have you spoken to him? Well... Have there been any threats made against him or his family? Uh, he and his wife have been under a doctor's care, but, but, but I got to him for a while. Now, nobody tried to hold the guy up for dough, and he can't give us any leads at all. Heath, we've got to find that murderer and find him fast. It looks like whoever it is wants to wipe out the entire Green family. You've got to get me some action. Well, we're working, D.A. Work harder, then. Get me some results. Look, D.A., how is it you haven't brought in your friend Philo Vance on this case? How is... Well, uh, never mind how it is. This is a police case, and you represent the police department. Well... That's all, Heath. Call me if anything breaks. Okay, Mr. Markham, but I still don't know why you didn't call in Vance. You know something, Daddy? What? I just seem to fit into your arm. Isn't that wonderful? What's wonderful about it? I tried you for size before I decided you'd be my girlfriend. Nice party? Why, uh, you throw the best parties in town, Daddy. What's with this daddy business? Am I old enough to be your old man? Oh, daddy, you're so silly. When I call you Daddy, I don't mean Daddy. I mean Daddy. Okay, so I'm Daddy. Hey, Peggy, how about a dance with the company, huh? Oh. Hey, everybody! Peggy's gonna dance. Oh, please, Daddy, not now, huh? Later. All right. It's up to you, baby. Hey, everybody. Peggy's gonna dance for you. Later. Ah, oh, thanks, Daddy, darling. I just like it here with you. It's so cozy. Cozy in a joint with 20 people? Uh-huh. I don't know how you figure that, but it's okay with me. You know, I've been wanting to ask you something, Peg. Hmm? How'd you like a job in that place I run? Me in a gambling house? But what could I do? Look pretty. Take the suckers' minds off the dough they lost. What about it? Oh, sounds good, Daddy. I'll let you know. Now, suppose you let me know something. Anything, baby. What's bothering that pretty blonde head of yours? Well, what I want to know is why you threw this party. What are we celebrating? 
What are we celebrating? We're celebrating the death of two dames, Jane and Penny Green. Mrs. Green, where are you? Over here, Jim. I'll keep the lights dim so as not to disturb Mr. Green. Come over. Thanks, Mrs. Green. How is he? He, uh, he isn't too well. The shock of what happened to Jane and Penny has done something to him, the doctor says. He's resting in the next room now. If, if we don't talk too loud, we won't disturb him. I, I just came in to see if there was something I could do, Mrs. Green. Oh, thank you, Jim, but there isn't anything. I, I know how you must feel. You were practically a member of our family. A few more months and I would have been. This awful thing hadn't happened to Jane. Yes. Two months more and we'd have been married. I can't believe all of this. I can't either. It's very hard for all of us. I love those two girls. They couldn't have been closer to me if I'd been their real mother. I know, Mrs. Green. Both of them used to say that all the time. Please ask me if there's anything you want me to do, will you? Oh, thanks, Jim. I just can't get over how this all happened. Eric and I were sitting here playing chess. We thought Jane was in her room. Then the phone rang, and it was the police telling us what had happened. I wasn't supposed to see her last night. She said she was spending the evening at home with you. I know. That's why Dad and I didn't go out at all. We were here all evening together. Oh, Jim, who could it be who was trying to wipe out our family? I don't know, Mrs. Green. But I promised myself something, though. I won't do any sleeping until the murderer of your daughters is caught. Still nothing, Heath. What are you doing, man? I'm sorry, D.A., but you told me to call in and report, so I'm calling in and reporting. But I haven't got anything new to tell you. We're checking every angle. You're not talking to the newspapers, Heath. You're talking to me. I not only want to know what you're doing, I want to know what results you're getting. Remember that. Well, how can you get results when you can't get any clues? Answer me that. I don't know, Heath. If I did, I'd be doing it myself. I wish you were doing it yourself. Okay, D.A., I'll call you back. Goodbye. How can you get results when you can't get clues? Hello, Markham. Vance. Vance, you're just the man I... Oh, uh, how are you? Well, I think I'm all right. That is, I was all right until I didn't hear from you and the Green Sisters' murders. Oh, that, Vance. Uh, we're doing pretty well with that, thank you. I just didn't think I ought to bother you. Bother me, Markham? Oh, come now. You know how I feel about murder cases, especially those that are so completely puzzling. We'll find out who killed the Green Girls, Vance. Thanks for your interest, but we'll find out for ourselves. I'm a little busy now, so... Markham, you don't mind, I... I just called the newspapers and told them that I was working on the case... You did what? You couldn't, Vance. Why not? Because that's the one thing I didn't want to happen. Well, it's happened. So I don't believe there's anything you can do about it. But, Vance, you don't know what you've done. I think I do. Markham, my friend, I appreciate what you tried to do. Somebody called you and told you that if you called me in on these killings, they'd kill me. You know that? I reasoned it. Right after the first murder, you got a phone call threatening my life. If that somebody had threatened yours, you'd have laughed at him and hung up. But you couldn't take a chance with my life. The caller pointed out that he wasn't asking me to do anything that was against my oath as a district attorney. I debated quite a while. I'm it. sure you did. That call you got was very complimentary to me. Was it a man or a woman? Well, it was hard to tell, Vance. Whoever it was used a handkerchief over the telephone mouthpiece and disguised the voice. You know, of course, I'm glad you figured out why I didn't call you. <laughs> You're not worried about that threat? Hardly. Markham, I've read up on this case and I know the important facts. That the two sisters were killed in the identical manner. That neither wore makeup that one of the sisters was engaged to a man named Jim Manning. Yes, Vance? I'll tell you this. Jane, the first girl killed, was called out of the house by somebody she trusted. Somebody who said it was urgent. The lack of makeup is that clue, Markham. Jane Green would never have left the house without taking time to put on makeup if she hadn't known the caller and he hadn't said to hurry. And the other sister, Penny, she was called out by the same person on the same urgent pretext? I'm not so sure about that. But Vance, Penny had on no makeup either. You said yourself there was no other reason you could think of except an emergency message. Yes, I did, didn't I? Well, Markham, there is one other reason. Only it applies to Penny and not Jane. If it's all right with you, I'm going up to see Mr. and Mrs. Green. I promise you some action on these two killings, Markham. And I won't be too long in keeping that promise. <laughs> City desk, Daniels. Charles Mack. Yeah? I got an ad to the Green Sisters murder case. Go ahead. Philo Vance, brilliant private investigator whose keen mind has helped the police on numerous criminal cases, has entered the Green Sisters murder case. Right. 
advance in a specially prepared statement declare that while he has no definite clue to the slayer of the two girls, he is confident that there will be a break in the case within 24 hours. I got it. District Attorney Markham, who previously had declined to the state why he had not asked his friend Vance to investigate the murder, said to this reporter, Hey, I uh, do get a byline, don't I, Joe? The byline runs for the rest of the story, Mike. Yeah, just want to be sure. District Attorney Markham said to this reporter, quote, Vance is confident that he can break the case in 24 hours. Well, that's it, Joe. Vance made a crack like that? Mm -hmm. Before he even started working on the case? That's right. It's a direct quote. But don't ask me how he expects to crack it. All I know is that if Philo Vance says he'll do it, Attorney Markham. The Green Girl's murder case opened with the finding of the body of Jane Green, daughter of wealthy Mr. and Mrs. Eric Green. The next day, Penny Green was found, murdered in the identical manner as her sister. Philo Vance entered the case this afternoon, and after a talk with me, went immediately to the Green home where he was to meet Sergeant Heath. Heath and Vance should be together about now because it is... Well, I see Mr. and Mrs. Green now, Vance. No, Sergeant Heath, not at the moment. Whose room is this? Uh, this was Penny's room. Why? I'd like to see it. Well, there's nothing in it that'll help you, except a diary. Well, come on in. There are the lights. Thank you. You think the diary will help me? Yeah. Who knows what'll help you? It is over on this dresser. Oh, yes, of course. I'd like to take a look through this. Well, help yourself. Hmm. Went shopping this morning with Jay. Lunch with Jay. Matinee. Good show. Home. Home. Hmm. That's the last entry. Made the day of her sister's murder. Yeah. She and her sister went everywhere together. Her sister's name is Jane. Yes, I know, Sergeant. Nothing else in here you think might be helpful? Not a thing. Well, I'll take your word for it. You're a very thorough police officer, Heath. Thanks, Vance. Now, where to now? I thought I might like to talk to Mrs. Green. I understand she's taking this better than her husband. Yeah, well, she's in here. It's a kind of a sitting room. Uh, you want me in with you? Not unless you want to come. Uh, just as soon not. I've questioned her till I'm blue in the face. Uh, I'll, I'll see you. Come in. Come in. Come in. Come in. How do you do, Mrs. Green? I'm Philo Vance. Oh, hello, Mr. Vance. I've been reading about you in this paper. Do you really think you can find out who killed my daughters? I'm going to try, Mrs. Green. I may need a little help, though. Well, tell me what you want to know. Thank you. To begin with, I understand your two daughters were very close. Yes, they were. Both of them favorites of their father? Both of them. What about Jane's boyfriend, the lad she was engaged to? Jim Manning? Well, uh, what do you want to know about him? He and Jane were very much in love. I see, Mrs. Green. I'm sorry if this sounds awkward, and I know it will, but where were you at the time Jane was killed? At home, here with my husband. We didn't leave the house all evening. Uh, Sergeant Heath checked that with Mr. Green and the servants. I'm going to tell you why I asked. You see, Mrs. Green, there was a possibility, a remote possibility, of course, that you might have wanted your stepdaughters dead. I, Mr. Vance? I said it was a remote possibility. <sighs> the reason might have been this. While they were alive, they would share in Mr. Green's money in the event that he died. I understand he isn't too well. With them dead, you'd get it all. I see what you mean. I'm sorry, Mr. Vance, but I'm afraid you're going to have to look elsewhere for your killer. I was at home. Five people know I was here. Six. I believe that now. Thank you. Mrs. Green, please forgive these wandering eyes of mine, but your purse is open and there's a very strange disc on top of the handkerchief in your pocketbook. What is it? Oh, that? Oh, it's a chip, a poker chip. Mr. Green and I used to have poker parties here once in a while, and, well, I needed some extra chips. I was going to have that one matched. I see. And your husband's name is Eric Green. Yes. The initials on the poker chip are M.G. Mistake, perhaps? The first initial? 
Oh, yes. I didn't mean the initial, Mrs. Green. Yeah, what is it? Well, sliding panels in the doors. This is really a gambling house, isn't it? What's it to you? My name is Vance. Philo Vance. I'd like to see the owner of this place. I understand his name is Gibson. Mike Gibson? He ain't in. Get lost. My good man, it took me two hours to find out what individual whose initials were M.G. operated a gambling house. I assure you, I won't leave until I see him. So wait. See what good it does you. Oh, it's trouble, Tommy. Guy named Vance. Philo Vance. He wants in. I don't know him. He don't get in. Them's your orders. Philo Vance? Mm. Open the door, Mike. Glad to have him with us. Okay, you're the boss. Come on in. Thank you. And thank you, Mr. Gibson, for giving your man here permission to let me in. That's all right, Vance. What's in your mind? Can we talk here? Here, out in the gambling room, in my office, any way you like. Your office, then. Right this way. Bet a quarter I know why you're here, Vance. Gambling isn't my line, Mr. Gibson. I don't generally bet either. Betting is for suckers. <laughs> I like to let them think they can beat percentages. They can't, but they get a whole lot older and a whole lot poorer before they learn. In here. Make yourself comfortable, Vance. Well, thank you. I will. Now, Vance, you're here because of some connection between this joint and the murder of those green kids. That's what you think, right? That seems a reasonable assumption. You know I don't gamble. You've read I was working on the murders. Yes, that's right, Mr. Gibson. Tell me, did the Green sisters gamble? You know, all of a sudden, I don't hear so good. Did Mrs. Green gamble? Why, hearing it a bit better. How do you count for a thing like that? What is your connection with the murder of the Green girls? Connection? I got no connection. <laughs> hey, Daddy, there's a... Oh, I'm sorry, Daddy. I didn't know you were busy. See you in a little while, Peggy. Okay, but Just I... a minute, please. Oh, you want to see me? Yes. My name is Vance. You work here? Look, Vance, Peggy doesn't know anything about this case. Of course I don't. Well, what case? Never mind. You had a message to deliver to Mr. Gibson just now, Peggy. Sure, he's supposed to call Plaza 81561. Oh, isn't that the number of the green residence, Mr. Gibson? I wouldn't know. So long, Peggy. She's not leaving. Unless you prefer I talk to her outside. Talk to her any way you like. We've got nothing to hide. Personally, i got some business to take care of. Tell him anything he wants to know, Peggy. As if you knew anything. Well? Oh, he's the nicest daddy. All right, Peggy. Let's drop the act. Huh? What's your connection with the green girl's murder case? Hey, look, Vance, don't go tying me up with any murder rap. I'm a girl just, just trying to get along. I don't mess with killing. What about Gibson? I don't mess with killers either. I know better. I don't doubt it. The trouble is, Peggy, that perhaps you don't know enough. Hello there, Vance. Hello, Markham. I hope I didn't keep you waiting long. I've just come from a very enlightening meeting with a gambler named Gibson and his girlfriend. Where's Mrs. Green? In her room next to her husband's. She rarely leaves at Vance. I told her you were coming, and she said to go right in when you came. Well, then let's go. Good evening, Mrs. Green. Oh, how do you do, Mr. Vance? Uh, hello again, Mr. Markham. Hello. Mrs. Green, I know you'll be very interested in who killed your daughter, so I thought I'd come up to tell you this in person. Is Mr. Green awake? Why, no, he's asleep in the next room. The door's open, so please don't raise your voice if you can help it. I rarely raise my voice, Mrs. Green. What I wanted you to know was this. I've just been to see a gambler named Gibson that name mean anything to you? Why, no, it doesn't. Good. The police have Mr. Gibson's telephone lines tapped. They can listen to any calls that come to him. In an hour, there'll be a cordon around the block to intercept anyone who tries to get to Mr. Gibson. You better make that two hours, Vance. There are a lot of preparations for what you want. In two hours, then. Now, Mrs. Green, I want you to do something for me. Yes? Get on the telephone and tell James' fiancé, Mr. James Manning, exactly what I told you. But add this fact that Mr. Gibson told me that if I came back this evening, he'd tell me what I want to know about the murder of your two girls. Hmm, awful weather, Vance. Awful. It's miserable. It's raining cats and dogs. Yes, it is, Sergeant Heath. We're lucky we have this doorway to shelter us. Do you mean to tell me that that little black door across the street there leads to a gambling joint, Vance? It leads to Mr. Mike Gibson's gambling house, Sergeant. 
Very swanky, too, believe me. Yeah, I'll believe you when I see who else it is you expect to drive up there. And Jim Manning was there, but he couldn't get in. How long do you expect? There's somebody, guys. Right? That car and headed right for the door. I'm an old fella. Uh, hey, that's Mr. Green. Yes, it is. Is that our suspected murder of Vince? I'll let you know in a minute, Markham. I want to see if he gets into the gambling house. He's arguing with the guy at the door. Uh, the guy just closed the slide in his face. And there goes Mr. Green back in his car. You can forget about Mr. Green, Markham. He isn't involved in those murders. Well, then who is? I think I know who is. But I'll be certain in a few minutes. Hey, what was that Green guy doing out here? He's supposed to be in bed. I can explain that, I think, later. There's another car at the door, Vance. No, oh, no, it's a cab. Hey, a woman's getting out. She just made a beeline for that door. Can't blame her much in this weather, can you, Sergeant? No, I guess not. There's that guy sliding open that peephole. Hey, he's letting her in. That's all I wanted to know. Sergeant Heath, you can arrest Mrs. Green for murder. Oh, wait a minute, Vance. When her daughter Jane was killed, we know for a fact that she was in her house. She was, Markham. But I repeat, you can arrest Mrs. Green for murder. City desk, Daniels. Mac Joe. Yeah? The Green says this case is cracked. Oh, yeah? I just came from an interview with Philo Vance. Get this and get it quick. Go ahead, Mac. Talk. I'll take it from the top. Going way back, Penny Green, that's the second sister who was killed, wanted to marry Jim Manning. That was Jane's fiance. How did Vance figure that? The initial J in Penny's diary. All along, they took it for granted that that meant Jane. But Vance figured it stood for Jimmy, and he checked. I got it. Jim told Vance he'd had a lot of trouble with Penny because apparently she was in love with him. He went shopping with Penny to buy a present for Jane. That explains the diary notation, eh? Right. The rest of this is a quote from Vance. Quote, At midnight on the murder night, Penny called her sister out of her house, saying it was urgent. Jane left, and Penny killed her. End quote. Penny killed Jane? Mm-hmm. And why did they arrest Mrs. Green? Quote from Vance. It was Mrs. Green who killed Penny. She realized what had happened, and she owed a great deal of money to Mike Gibson. She saw a way of getting rid of Penny so that she, Mrs. Green would own the entire Green estate when Eric Green died, end quote. What about Mike Gibson? Van says it was probably he who suggested that Mrs. Green kill Penny in the same way that Jane was killed to make the police think that one murderer was at work. It was he, too, who undoubtedly called Markham to keep Vance off the case, Vance thinks. What goes with old man Green? Eric Green was not asleep when Vance asked his wife to call Jim Manning earlier this evening. He heard Vance say that Mike Gibson knew who killed his daughters, so he wanted to find out who it was. Yeah? That's why he went to Gibson's place. Only couldn't get in. Which convinced Vance he hadn't been there before. You see, Vance thought it might have been he who owed Gibson the money. I see. He never was certain that it was Mrs. Green until she got in the gambling house without any trouble. Final quote from Vance. Yeah. Quote, this was all a very clever scheme on the part of Mrs. Green and Gibson. Uh-huh. Undoubtedly, they figured on doing away with Mr. Green eventually, and that would leave Mrs. Green with all the money in Gibson with his outstanding gambling debt collected. Yeah, yeah. After Penny set the stage by murdering her sister under the impression that that would induce Jim Manning to eventually marry her. End quote. Well, that's 30, Joe. Got it. Well, it was a good scheme, I guess. But it sure came to a bad end for Mrs. Green. Yeah, but it's a good end for the Green Girl's murder case.
Jamesy, what color crook? What color tie do I wear with this? Uh, with a double-breasted blue suit, Mr. Cardinal, I would suggest um, uh, this one. Maroon with blue figures. Maroon? That means red. I always thought that was some kind of a dope. <laughs> uh, that word is boron, sir. Well, what's the difference? Moron, maroon, it's the same thing. Well, I got this thing on. How does it look? Oh, precisely correct, sir. Precisely. And um, the word you were seeking to use instead of tie is um, cravat. Cravat. Okay, I'll remember that, James. And it takes a little time to make a mug like me a gent on it, huh? Generations. Eh? Oh, nothing, Mr. Cardinal, nothing at all. Now, is there anything else you wish, sir? Yeah, yeah, I wish the phone would ring so I know whether I got that date or not. Did I say that good? Oh, very well, very well, sir. Except that perhaps I would have said appointment. Appointment. Okay, thanks, James. You know, I'm glad I hired you. Thank you, sir. You know, you know, sometimes I can't get over this. Me, Tony Cardinale, ex racket boss with a dozen English cut suits and English butler. <laughs> In a couple of months, instead of dropping guys, I'll be dropping H's. <laughs> and it's pretty funny, huh? <laughs> Is it, sir? Yeah, you guys think. You guys don't have any senses of humor. James E., this is really living, ain't it? Why, well, I imagine so, sir. Yeah. It costs a lot of dough. A lot more than I thought it would, but it's worth it. Yes, sir. James E., you've got to help me do a little bookkeeping one of these days. My dough's gone too fast. Let's you and I get together. I'll get it. No, you do it. It'll sound classy. Very well, sir. Just as you say. Mr. Cardinal's residence. Is Mr. Cardinal at home? Mr. Cardinal. This is Mr. Leo speaking. Oh, just a moment, Mr. Leo. It's for you, Mr. Cardinal. It's Mr. Leo. Mr. Lolo. <laughs> Boy, that's what she is. Give me that phone. Here you are, sir. Hello, honey. Tony. Oh, I'm glad you waited for my call. I was delayed a bit. Oh, kid, I've been waiting all my life for your call. Only I didn't know it. Um, how's for tonight? I'd like to go for a drive. If you don't mind, Tony. Mind? <laughs> Who minds? We'll go driving forever if that's what you want. I'm buying a new car this afternoon. I'll get it, pick you up at about seven. Then we can go put the feedback on someplace. Uh, <coughs> I mean, uh, we'll go eat somewhere. Is that okay with you? Definitely. Swell. i see you at seven, sweetheart. Bye. Goodbye. Oh, what a dame, Jamesy. What a dame. Uh, she's the one who was here last night for dinner. Like her? Oh, uh, very much, sir. Uh, wasn't it she who seemed so concerned about uh, some individual who disliked you intensely, sir? Yeah, yeah. She meant Al Bailey. He's a skunk. Hey, who cares whether a skunk likes you or not? As so long as you keep out of his way. Mr. Bailey? You know what you have to do. I, uh, I, I think so. I, uh, I, uh, walk over to the car, start it up, drive past here where you're standing and start shooting. Right? That's right, but yeah. you start shooting at that target on the other side of the road. Yeah. We're a million miles from nowhere out here and nobody will see or hear us. And I don't want you to miss, even though this is only practice. I won't miss. When do I get to do this in person? Tonight, maybe. Yeah? Yeah. Tony Cardinale changed his name, but he didn't change his habits any. He took away my rackets, and now he's trying to take away my girl. Only I'm not going to let him. Go ahead, now. Get moving, Mike. Okay, Mr. Bailey. This, this is some good idea. Where'd you get it? From the FBI. I saw a newsreel once where they showed the FBI practicing. Okay, now. Start the car. Come on. When you get opposite me, start firing at the target. Good enough. Here I come. Well, up, boy. How did I do, Mr. Bailey? I'm just looking at the target now, Mike. 
You want to know how you did? Yeah. Well, all I can tell you is I hope you do as well on Tony Cardinale. Tony. Yeah, Lynn? I like you, Tony. Is that wrong? Yeah, sure it's wrong. It's wrong for Al Bailey and the millions of other guys in this world. But for you and me, it ain't wrong. What I started to say was, I like you, but <laughs> maybe I like Al Bailey better. Huh? Park here a minute, will you? I'm in a park? <laughs> it sounds like a routine I should be giving you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll pull over here by the right side of the road, and you and I can talk this thing over. Yeah. Now what? <sighs> now, let you and I talk. Oh, it's there to talk about. Come here, baby. Uh, oh, Tony. Oh, dough. Uh, listen, kid, don't slap me. I'm loaded with dough. I imagined you were, but Bailey has money, too. Sure, but I got class. I got ambitions. I got savvy fare. Savoir fare? Oh, that, Tony, believe me, that you don't have. So, all right, I don't have it. But I ain't missing an awful lot of other things, am I? Oh, I don't know about them. All I know is that very shortly, you may be going to be missing me. Philo Vance speaking. Vance, this is Markham. I hope I didn't disturb you. You didn't. I was just sitting around reading this evening, Markham. What is it that's happened to disturb you? A murder, Vance. The girlfriend of an ex-racket boss named Tony Cardinale, now known as Anthony Cardinal, if you please. You want to know the details? As district attorney, you wanted to know them. As a private investigator, I'd like to, too. What was the victim's name? Elaine DeLeo. Here's what happened, according to Tony. He was a witness to the murder? Definitely. But before I go into that, I may as well tell you that, of late, Tony has become very social conscious. English car, English butler, English clothes, everything very elegant. Including a very elegant murder he was a witness to, apparently. Yes, his story is that he had just bought the car and was driving with the girl and had parked on the right side of the road when another car came by. Somebody in the other car had a gun, started shooting, and that was the end of Elaine. What was Tony doing while all this was happening? He claims that when he heard a shot from the other car, he slipped to the floor of his car and didn't get a look at whoever it was that did the shooting. Well, that sounds reasonable if it were a dark road. It was dark, very. Cardinal told us that Al Bailey, a racketeer, was also a friend of Mr. Leo's and had objected to her going out with him. Well, isn't that nice? Motive and everything, eh, Markham? That's right. But you seem rather skeptical, Vance. I don't understand why. It is possible that Mr. Leo was murdered, just as Cardinal said, and for the reason he gave us. Is it, Markham? I think not. You see, Mr. Leo was killed by mistake. Unless, of course, Cardinal killed her, which is possible. Vance, you knew nothing of this case until I telephoned you just now. And yet you can make a statement like that? Yes, with great confidence that I'm correct. Where are you now, Markham? I'm with Cardinal at his apartment. Are you coming up? Of course. Don't go away, Markham, and don't let Mr. Cardinal go away either. My name is Vance. Mr. Markham phoned me. Oh, yes, sir. I am James, Mr. Cardinal's valet. Uh, please come in, Mr. Vance. Thank you. Your name is James, you said? Uh, yes, sir. James Lyons. Uh, this way, please, Mr. Vance. All right. Right through this door. Mr. Markham is with Mr. Cardinal now. Thank you. I'll go in myself, James. Very good, sir. Hello, Markham. Vance, come in. Uh, this is Tony Cardinal, Mr. Philo Vance. How do you do? How are you? I understand you were with Miss DeLeo when she was shot. Hey, now, slow down, Vance. Take it easy. This thing's got me all off place. I don't doubt that. You claim you didn't see who it was in the car that fired the shot. That's right. Were you having trouble with Miss DeLeo? Oh, we were very amical friends. Amical, eh? Yeah. Well, well, I learn new things every day. The word is amicable, Mr. Cardinal. Well, you say it your way, I say it mine. What's this got to do with the Lance murder? What about that theory of yours that you told me on the phone, Lance? Later, please, Markham. Mr. Cardinal, I have an excellent memory. Yeah? It reminds me now, for example, that you and a Mr. Al Bailey were enemies. And that a Miss Elaine DeLeo and Mr. Bailey at one time were very friendly. So what? Tony, in your racket days, if somebody didn't do what you wanted him to do, he didn't live to regret it. In fact... He didn't live, did he? Oh, not bad. At the moment, I'm trying to make up my mind whether you killed Miss DeLeo for a similar reason. You see, in the event that you didn't kill her, I am quite convinced that somebody tried to kill you. 
Come on, Markham. We're going for a drive in Mr. Cardinal's car. Where are we driving, Vance? Out to where Mr. Cardinal was parked when the shot that killed Mr. Leo was fired. It's right down the road a bit, I understand. Yes, it is. And using his car is going to prove something to me? Undoubtedly. It took me a little while to get used to this car, but it handles very nicely now. Now, let me see. He was supposed to have been parked just about here, at the right side of the road. Well, here we go. Vance, I want more than anything else to hear why you knew that the girl was killed by accident. That is, if Tony didn't kill her. You'll be able to tell me the answer to that yourself, Markham. This is an English car. The steering wheel is on the right-hand side of the car, not on the left, as in American cars. Yes, I know that. Everyone in Europe drives on the left side of the roads. That's custom. Of course. Now, if a car came in back of this one while we were parked, and if it were dark, where would he assume the driver would be? Oh, I see. He would naturally think that the driver would be nearest him, in the left-hand seat, that is. And so when the murderer fired, he fired at the figure in the left-hand seat under the impression that that was Tony Cardinal. That's right. Mm. When you mentioned an English car to me on the telephone, that's what I thought of immediately. Vance, I know you better than anyone in the world, but you continue to amaze me. <laughs> Dr. Watson, during his association with Sherlock Holmes, must have felt something like I feel right now. I kindly save those feelings for the time I accomplish something on this case, <laughs> if I accomplish anything. <laughs> well, I think the first thing that ought to be done is to find out how many people wanted Mr. Cardinal dead. Then to find which one of them killed Miss DeLeo in error. <laughs> Hurry up with that packing, Mike. we got to blow this town fast now. I'm hurrying, Mr. Billy. I'm going as fast as I can. It's going to be awful risky. I'm trying to scram with the heat on, though. Ah, no, I got a private plane all gassed up and ready to take off. As soon as you're through with those releases, we'll get going. Who's that? I don't know. But keep your gun handy, Mike. I'll see who it is. I'll be behind the door. Go ahead, open it up. Yes? Oh, I beg your pardon. Uh, my name is Lyons, James Lyons. May I come in? Why? I'm uh, Mr. Anthony Cardinal's valet. I think I might have something to say to you that's uh, quite important. My name. Well? The uh, gun in this other gentleman's hand is quite unnecessary, Mr. Bailey, believe me. Go it, Mike. Put the rod. Okay, boss. Well, now, let's have it. You're Cardinal's butler, and you're here. Why? Well, sir, my entire duties were not confined to the um, Cardinal apartment. Oh? Yes, Mr. Cardinal was quite wary of you, Mr. Bailey. And very often he sent me to, well, to spy on you. So? Well, I, I just happened to be following you and uh, this gentleman out to the country when you were practicing shooting from a car yesterday afternoon. I get it. This is a hold -up. You figure if I don't pay up, you're going to the cops. Oh, no, sir. Not the police. Never. Well, what's the pitch? Well, I thought perhaps Mr. Cardinal might like to know what you were doing yet for the afternoon. I'm quite certain you wouldn't want him to find out, would you? This is District Attorney Markham. The Cardinal murder case opened when Elaine DeLeo was shot to death while in a foreign car owned by ex-racketeer Tony Cardinal. Philo Vance believes that the girl was killed by mistake, but he insists that if she weren't, then her killer was Cardinal. Al Bailey, underworld character and former boyfriend of the murdered girl, has been under surveillance, and my men report a visit to him from Cardinal's butler, James Lyon. Following the visit, Lyons went immediately to a phone booth where he is now... Yes, Mr. Bailey? Yes, Mr. Lyons. Yes, Mr. Bailey. 
Yeah, Jamesy, what is it? What is it? Mr. Cardinal, I had to call you. It's urgent. I've got a very unpleasant duty to perform. Unpleasant in that I, I should have done it before. Go ahead, spill it, spill it. Uh, 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 Mr. Cardinal? Oh, look, never mind the English lessons now. i got to know what it is. You should have told me and didn't. Very well, sir. Your friend, Mr. Bailey, and an associate of his were practicing target shooting from a moving car yesterday afternoon. I saw them, sir. So it was Bailey who tried to get me and got a lane, huh? Thanks, Jamesy. Uh, where is Bailey now? On his way to a private airport, I believe, sir. He owns his own plane, you know, and I've, I've seen him fly several times. The airport is on Redley Drive. Thanks, Jamesy. I ain't gonna forget this. Well, the cops have let me move around the way I like, so I'm leaving this joint now. Bailey thinks he's gone somewhere, does he? Well, he don't know that the only place he's gone is where I send him. Hurry up, Mike. Come on in so I can roll this window up and we can get going. Where do you think you're going, Bailey? You can't come in here. Mike! Mike, he's dragging me out of the plane. Yeah, Bailey, I sure am. And I'm doing it myself. Me, Tony Cutler. Hey, look out what you're doing. So, Tony, you come around looking for trouble, huh? Well, you're going to get it. Uh, That's what you think. Okay, Bailey, I'm ready for you now. So you were practicing up on shooting from a car, huh? Well, I don't need no practice for this. Ah, you never saw the day you could take me in anything, Tony. Oh. Well, excellent work, Mr. Cardinal. Uh, oh, it's your pants. Where'd you come from? I followed you here. I wanted to see where you were going in such a hurry. Now I understand. Yeah? What do you understand? A lot of things. Unfortunately, one of them is not who killed Elaine DeLeo. <laughs> James, you're sure you've told me all you know about Miss DeLeo? Well, there isn't much I could have told you, Mr. Vance. I haven't been working for Mr. Cardinal very long, and, and she was here only once. Where did you come from? Well, I've been in the States for some time, sir. Uh, London before. And before that? Well, my grandfather came from Holland. Is that important, sir? At the moment, no. In fact, there's only one thing that is important, James. That is to find out who killed Miss DeLeo. Oh, yes, sir. I'm, I'm quite sure that's so, Mr. Vance. Vance. Oh, Vance, where are you? In the library, Markham. You may go, James. Thank you, sir. I'll be where you can reach me, sir. I was hoping you'd come back here, Vance. Where were you? I just watched a very excellent demonstration of street fighting. Only this street fighting was done at an airport. Really? Yes, Tony Cardinal caught up with Al Bailey and a friend named Mike and did quite a job of convincing them they ought not leave town. Where's Cardinal now? You won't have any trouble picking him up, Markham. In fact, he's probably on his way back here. But, Vance, he's still a suspect. There still is the possibility that he killed the girl in his car. No question about that possibility. But he's too smart to run away and make us believe what we only think now. You know, come to think of it, this whole thing could have been an act. What whole thing? If Tony were really smart, and he is shrewd, Markham, he might have figured I'd follow him to the airport. And he put on a very convincing display of righteous anger against Mr. Bailey. Perhaps that was done for my benefit. Uh, don't you want to know how it was that Tony found out Bailey was going to the airport? Not particularly, but if I did, I know you could tell me. How do you know that? Markham, when the butler James Lyons left the house, I knew you had somebody watching him. I know you had somebody watching Bailey's apartment, too. Oh? And when Lyons saw Bailey and then went into a phone booth, and shortly after, Tony Cardinal left his apartment, I knew you'd know how Tony knew about <laughs> Bailey. That's I give up. Oh, not now, please, Markham. <laughs> above all, not now. And why not now, above all other times, Vance? One very important reason. We're very close to the solution of the Cardinal murder case. Yes? That you, Vance? This is Cardinale. Oh, hello. Rather late for you to be calling me, isn't it, Mr. Cotton? Uh, make that Cotton Alley, Vance. Uh, I'm no gent. I was never cut out to be no gent. I got news for you, Vance. Really? Yeah. A blown town. Well, I've got news for you, my friend. I don't think you are. Huh? Tony, you've been trailed by the police ever since you left your apartment to go to the airport. Believe me, you haven't shaken them off your trail. Uh, but what was it you wanted to tell me? Just this. I ain't no rat, Vance. I don't go lousing up guys with the cops. But before I bounced out of town, I wanted you to know enough to grab Bailey. Don't let him get away with this. He was trying to kill me when he got a lane. Well, thank you for that information. 
I'm glad you called, Tony. I tried to reach you at your apartment earlier to ask you a question. Huh? What question? How did you meet Elaine DeLeo? Well, she was Bailey's girl. I used to see her around with him, and I, uh, I got to know her. And how did you happen to get James Lyons, your butler? Elaine got him. She went down to one of those swanky employment joints and got him. Why? Why? Well, Tony, after you're through talking to me and you find that there is a police officer waiting for you, as I said there'd be, ask him to bring you here to my apartment. I'm going to ask Mr. Markham over and have him bring Al Bailey and your butler, too. What's the idea? The idea is to clean up the Cardinal murder case. Pretty good idea, don't you think? I'm a little sleepy, Vance, but very interested in what's going to go on here in your place. I was sure you'd be, Markham. I think I'll get things rolling now. Tony Cardinale. Ah, about time you got started, Vance. What's going on? Tony, I was never convinced that it wasn't you who killed Elaine DeLeo. No? No. But then again, I wasn't sure you did do it either. Oh? Al Bailey. Well? You wanted Tony dead, didn't you? I'm not talking until I see my lawyer. Uh, he just came from seeing his doctor. I took care of that, huh, Van? You certainly did, Tony. <laughs> now you, James. Yes, sir? You were hired by Miss DeLeo, but you told me you had only seen her once when she came up to Tony's apartment. Why? No reason, sir. I, I just didn't think to mention that she had hired me. You also went to Mr. Bailey's place and tried to blackmail him into paying you to keep quiet about seeing him and his assistant target practicing from an automobile. Didn't you know you'd be followed to Mr. Bailey's? No, sir, I, I I didn't think of that, sir. You see, all I thought of was converting some information I had into into cash. That wasn't it at all, Lyons. You knew you were being followed. You wanted the story of Bailey's target practicing to be brought to the attention of the police. You wanted him to be arrested for murder. I, sir? Why would I want that? Why not? Inasmuch as you killed Elaine DeLeo... <laughs> All right, Miss Patterson, get ready to take this down, please. Yes, Mr. Martin. Start talking, Lyons. Yes, sir. Well, I... I intended to kill Mr. Cardinal when I followed his car the night of the murder. It was parked. I... I couldn't see very well, and I fired at a figure nearest me. The one that should have been sitting in the driver's seat. Just as you imagine, Vance. That's right. Go ahead, Lyons. Well, that's all. That's all? Why did you want to kill Cardinal? I have no intention of telling you that, sir. You don't have to, Mr. Lyons. I'll supply that information, if I may. Markham, Miss DeLeo was Lyons' daughter. Oh, daughter? How did you know that, Vance? The name DeLeo. It's Dutch, and it means the lion. Lion? Lyons. Very close. The father and daughter took different names when they came to this country? I doubt very much whether they came to this country. You are an American, aren't you, Lyons? It's your story, Mr. Vance. My part of it's true. All right, then. He's an American. If he had lived abroad at all, he would have recognized that the Cardinal was driving a foreign car and that the driver's seat was on the right. It was a new car, remember, and he'd never seen it before. But getting back to why Lyons wanted to kill Cardinal... Yes, let's get that out of the way. Lyons and his daughter were a team. She worked on important men, saw to it that her father was hired as a butler. Between them, they probably worked every racket from blackmail to robbery. You're taking this down, Miss Patterson? Yes, sir, I am. The motive for killing Cardinal was simple. Lyons here was stealing from his employer. Cardinal was beginning to become suspicious, I believe. I'll need confirmation on that, Mr. Lyons. All right, all right, that's true. Just, just the way you said it. I never meant to kill my daughter. Never. And when I found a mistake I'd made, I'd try to get enough money from Bailey to get out of town. I also wanted the police to find out that he and his assistant had been target practicing from a moving car. But what led you to me, Vance? Just tell me that. The discrepancies in your story, Lyons. Your name and Mr. Leo's. And your very obvious attempt to have the police know about Bailey. All of those things added up. I'm inclined to believe, Mr. Lyons, that you may consider your career at an end. No doubt about that, Vance. His career and the Cardinal murder case, both.
Yeah, it's awful quiet tonight, ain't it, Mike? Yeah, but I don't mind. Drive around another two hours, call into headquarters, and somebody else can have this patrol car for the next shift. Me, I'm going to bed. Nice houses on this street, huh? Well, they're big, say that for them. People live in them, got lots of dough, say that for them. Yeah. How'd you like to live with a house like that and on the corner? Yeah, not bad. Afraid Maggie wouldn't like it, though. Too many rooms to clean. Ah, she wouldn't have to worry about that servant's pal. You'd have to have a mess of servants. Yeah, uh, you don't know Maggie. She wants to do everything herself. I never saw anything like that. Hey, Eddie, it. look. Where? Coming out of that big house we just passed. Two guys. They're shoving guns in their pockets. Stop this heap. We're getting out. Right. Right with you, Mike. Get your gun out. Looks like we're in for a little action. Hey, you two, stop. Stop or we shoot. They aren't stopping. Let's let them have it. Yeah, they got the same idea first. See how they like it. They're only half a block away. We'll grab them, Eddie. Won't have to grab both of them. One of them's hit. Look, he's staggering. Yeah, but look at the other guy. He's got his gun against his buddy. Hey, don't! He shot his own pal. How I'd like this shot to get him. My turn. Yeah, we're both missed. He makes that car that's parked there was sunk. Oh, he's made it all right. And there he goes. All right, uh, let's go back and get our crate. We can chase him. Now, let's take a look at this buddy of the guy got away. He's done for. Drew. Take a look. Ever seen him before? Yep. Oh, get the people starting to come around. All right, everybody. Get back. Go out home. Go to bed. Take a look for identification, Eddie. Right. All right, look, everybody. Nothing's going on. The show's over. Go on. Get back to bed. Get back to bed, will hey, you? Hey, Mike. Yeah? We got a real mystery on our hands. First two guys stick up a place. Then one of them kills the other guy. And look what I found in the other one's pocket. A piece of paper. All it's got on it is two words. Live on. Now, uh, what's that mean? Parker, boss. Don't bother me, Larry. I don't bother people, Mr. Parker. I do just like I'm told all the time. All the time. Well, do what you're told. I told you not to bother me. He's sore at me, boss. Sore at me. Of course not, Larry. I'm just trying to work out some instructions for our next job. Matter of fact, I'm very pleased with you. Oh, thanks, you boss. You did very well last night, robbing the Hilton home and shooting Joe when the cops hit him. I'm glad you liked it, Mr. Parker. Joe would have started talking if the cops grabbed him alive. He was hit in the leg and couldn't keep going, so I knocked him off. I done right. You most certainly did. Now, just hold everything momentarily, Larry. I'm not sending you on the next job. I've got other friends, you know. Oh, sure, sure, I know. I know, but... Ain't the cops got your phone tapped? That's what you said. Well, they suspect I'm in the back of these private home holdups, Larry, but they can't prove anything. And while they can tap this phone, they can't trace whoever it is I'm calling. That's impossible on a dial phone. Yeah. The message for tonight is hole pin. Hole pin. That's right. Take care of things just like we planned, will you? Don't give it another thought. So long. Goodbye, my friend. Good luck to you. Hey, Jay, boss, you're smart. Really smart, I mean. Well, thank you, Larry. Thank you very much. But I have help. A great deal of help. And from the most unexpected places and people. And then, Mr. Vance, the paper goes on to say that the robber who killed his accomplice is being sought by the police. Who expect to make an arrest shortly. Oh, that's right, Mr. Vance. How did you know? Oh, I'm smart, Miss Williams. Didn't you know? Oh, gosh, Mr. Vance, I've only been working for you for three months. You, you can't expect a girl to know everything in three months. No, I guess not. I think, though, hello, that... Miss Williams, Vance. Oh, hello, Well, Mr. hello, Markham. I've rather been expecting you... Miss Williams was just telling me about the mysterious message found in the dead hold-up man's pocket. That's why I'm here, Vance. I could talk to you about the whole thing, if I may. Well, come right into my private office, Markham. Can't have the district attorney of our fair city flaunting a furrowed forehead to the world at large. <laughs> Gives the town a bad name. In here, please. Thank you, but I'm not worrying about this town getting a bad name. I'm worrying about someone giving me a rather bad time. 
Sit down, Martin, please. And let's have your problem. Right, Vance. As you must know, there have been quite a few holdups of fashionable parties in the past few months. Yes, I've read about them. In fact, you and I have discussed them from time to time. Casually, of course. But you mentioned the police suspect of Mr. Edward Parker. We do, but Parker's clever. He has two or three stooges he sends out on the jobs. But let's take that robbery last night up on 58th Street. The one where one of the thieves shot his buddy after the police had wounded him. What about it, Markham? We found a slip of paper in the dead man's pocket, Vance. It said just two words. Live on. Then we intercepted the message Ed Parker was telephoning to someone. That message said, Hole pin. Those words have some kind of meaning, I'm sure. They most certainly have, Markham. A very definite meaning. Not to me. I just want a second to make sure of what I'm saying. That robbery last night on 58th Street, was it at number 4360? Yes, but the papers all carry that. I didn't remember it from the papers, believe me. Now I think I can tell you where the next robbery will take place. Oh, no, Vance. Yes, my friend. Of course, I'm not sure exactly when it will take place. But after I make a phone call, I think I'll be able to give you that information, too. But, Vance, what you're saying is ridiculous. You can't possibly know that. No. Well, I think I can. Just have the police at 2540 138th Street and see what happens. Yes, Markham, that's where the next hold-up attempt will be made. I'm so happy you're having a good time, Mr. Davis. I'm so glad you're enjoying yourself. Incidentally, there's young Alice Morton over at the refreshment table. Oh. Wouldn't you like to join us? Uh-huh. Definitely, Mrs. Blake. <laughs> I thought you would. Everybody, can I have your attention, please? <laughs> at some particular time at every party, the hostess feels it has solemn duty to make an announcement. At the moment, duty calls. <laughs> I think you'll all be glad to hear that we have with us that distinguished pianist, Dmitri Raboff, who has consented to play a few selections. Mr. Raboff. Uh, for his first number, Mr. Raboff plays the Rachmaninoff Prelude in G minor. Oh, Nobody move. There's a stick up. Uh, lock the door, Jimmy. Cut that out, lady. Cut it out, or you'll never do no screaming no more. And don't none of you guys get brave all of a sudden. All of you got too much jewelry on. My friend here's got a big bag. He's going to put in the center of the floor. Go ahead, Jimmy. Out. Now. That's it. All you guys and dames, one at a time, starting from my left, dump your rocks into that bag. And don't hold out, or I'll come get them myself. Hey, you. You fat dame. You start it off. That's a go. Open up the door. Open it up. This is the police. Here's the cops. Come on, Jimmy. Out them French windows and stuff, all right? Stop them, somebody! Don't let nobody try it. That's what they get if they do. All right, bust through them French windows, Jimmy. Let's get going. Open the door, somebody. Let the police in. There they are. Which way they go? Out the French windows. They might still be in the garden. Okay, lady. Come on, Eddie. Let's get after them. They're around anywhere. We'll get them. Yes? How do you do? I'm Philo Vance. You're Mrs. Blake? Yes, I am. Please come in, both of them. This is District Attorney Markham, Mrs. Blake. How do you do? How do you do? Won't you gentlemen come in and sit down? We're not going to stay very long, Mrs. Blake. We just wanted to speak to you about the party in your house last night. It was terrible. If the police hadn't arrived, every one of my guests would have been robbed. If Mr. Vance hadn't told us that there'd be a robbery attempt at this address, the police wouldn't have arrived so conveniently, Mrs. Blake. But we'd like a description of the men who held up your guests. Let's see. They were both average height. The one with the gun had a long, thin nose and a cut under his right eye. Uh Uh-huh. The other was, well, just an ordinary-looking person. I see. Mrs. Blake, I understand your position in the social world, and I imagine that this was rather embarrassing to you. Well, it would have been under ordinary circumstances. But there have been several attempted hold-ups at parties recently, so I don't feel too badly. What we want to know is whether you recognized either of the two men, Mrs. Blake. Had you ever seen either one of them before? I'm quite sure I didn't. 
They both wore masks, but from their general appearance, I'm certain I'd never seen either one. We thought that perhaps they might have been servants employed either by you or some of your friends who were victims of previous robberies, Mrs. Blake. I doubt that very much. Is there anything else, gentlemen? I think not, Mrs. Blake. Thank you so much for your kindness. It's quite all right. Please drop in again if you like. Only let's make it a less formal visit. Well, thank you. We may do that, Mrs. Blake. At least one of us might do that. That one of us being me. I'd be glad to see you at any time, Mr. Vance. Goodbye. Goodbye, Mrs. Blake. What's getting into you, Emily? You gone crazy? No. I don't think so, Ed. Why? Why? He gave Vance and Markham a perfect description of one of my boys. You blow this racket about sky high before we really get started. You're such an alarmist, Ed. I didn't tell them anything they couldn't have gotten from any of the guests who were here last night. What do you want me to do? Give them a false description so that the trail would lead directly to me? Mm. I'm sorry, Emily. I guess I didn't think of that. Now, let's get back to what we were talking about before Vance and Markham got here. I think we'd better talk about what happened when Vance and Markham got here. We can't use that code anymore, Ed. Vance has already broken it. How do you know? Markham said that Vance knew the holdup was to be here. They've tapped your wire, Ed. Heard you give instructions in cipher and broke the code. That Vance is too smart. Maybe I ought to take care of him. Maybe you shouldn't have started with him. How'd I know he'd be called in on this case? There weren't supposed to be any murders, you know that. Larry killed Joe and the cop's bullet got him, but we didn't plan on that. No. But in order to be successful at anything, Ed, it's well to be prepared for emergencies. Nothing ever goes entirely according to plan. Well, our next job or two. Where's it going to be? Let me see. I have the invitation right here in my desk. Mr. and Mrs. Cornelius Worthington. Request for pleasure. Let me see. Tomorrow night. Uh I said tomorrow night at the Worthington home. And if I know Celia Worthington, she'll have everybody who means anything in this town at her house. Good. This time we don't fool around with codes or with anything else. This time I do the job myself. Larry and I. I like that. That means there'll be only three ways to split. You and Larry and me. Two and a half ways. We'll cut Larry's piece down to a half of what he's supposed to get. He never knows what he's going to get. You know, Ed, I think we ought to give a little thought to follow Vance. He might give us trouble. Him? I don't think so. Let him interfere with this, and he won't know what he's going to get either. Attorney Markham. The Cypher murder case opened with the shooting of a holdup man by his own accomplice. In the dead man's pocket was found a code message which Vance succeeded in breaking down. To such an extent that when I told him we had tapped the telephone wire of a Mr. Ed Parker and heard him say, Hole pin, Vance immediately gave the address of the next holdup attempt. We were able to thwart that effort as a consequence, but had no idea whether the gang intended to strike again. It is for this reason that I'm calling on Vance, whom I expect to find. Vance, where are you? In my private office, Markham. Come right in. I'm on the way. How are you today, Vance? Very well, which apparently is more than I can say for you. What's bothering you, Markham? This cipher case, Vance. We've continued to tap Ed Parker's phone, but we've gotten nothing from him that even resembles a code. I didn't imagine you would. You think he knows we've succeeded in figuring out his code? I'm reasonably certain of that. Just because the police broke up that holdup at Mrs. Blake's the other night? That's only one reason, Markham. But the others aren't to be discussed right now. Vance, you know the police broke that code Parker used. It took them some time. Yet you figured it in less than a minute. I'll explain that to you, Markham, but not now. Right now, I'm wondering where that holdup mob will hit next. And how I can find out. Well, they seem to be concentrating on gatherings of the elite. Strictly social stuff. Really? Well, then the chances are that Mrs. Emily Blake would be invited to the next affair. And she did invite me to call on her, remember, Martin? Yes. I think I'll accept that invitation, my friend. I see. You intend to get her to tell you when the next big social event would take place and perhaps ask you to accompany her. (laughs) That's 
You're a very resourceful man. <laughs> that isn't the only reason I'm doing it, Markham. Don't forget, Mrs. Blake is a very charming woman. <laughs> Julia, hurry with my hair. I don't have all night, you know. I know, Mrs. Blake. I won't be a moment. I've laid out all your jewelry on the dressing table. You can be ready in a moment after I get finished. Well, then hurry up and Wait. get finished, why don't you? I, I'll get that myself. You stand in back of me and finish my hair while I'm talking. Very well, madam. Hello? Emily, this is Cornelius Worthington. Cornelius. Don't tell me I'm that late that you called to find out what was delaying me. No, not quite. Uh, Emily, dear, there's a change in plans about the party tonight. Oh? Yes, one of the children's ill, and they've quarantined our house. Oh, how dreadful, Corny. We called the Applebee's, and they're going to have our party at their house. Come there, won't you? I've got a dozen people to call, so I've got to cut this short. The Applebee's are at 651. 651? 131st Street. 131st Street. You don't mind, Emily? Oh, it's perfectly all right, Corny. I understand. Toodaloo. Oh, I'm finished, Mrs. Blake. Oh, Good. Now, hand me that telephone. Oh, yes, sir. Oh, wait. There's someone at the door. Here, call this number and just give them this message. The message is Bop Pip. Bop Pip? Yes, do it right away, will you? I'll get that door myself. I'll do it, but I don't know what I'm doing. Coming! Good evening. Mm-hmm. Please come in. Good evening, Mrs. Blake. Why, oh, you're staring at me. Is there anything wrong? Is it the white tie or the topper? It isn't Arthur, Mr. Vance. Only you seem to look as if you belonged in a white tie. That's rather strange attire for a private investigator, isn't it? Yes, but at the moment I'm not working at my chosen profession. You did invite me to call, didn't you? Why, yes. But I'm going out tonight. I thought you might be, hence these evening clothes. May I go with you? Well, well, why not? Thank you. By the way, Mrs. Blake, you look quite charming. Thank you. My rat fan sits over by the chair. Of course. Here you are. Beautiful shoulders, Mrs. Blake. Beautiful. I'm going to run out of thank you. But I warn you, it'll be long after you run out of compliments. Perhaps. Where are we going, or shouldn't I ask? We're going to a party. Oh. It was supposed to be held at the Worthington, but it's over at the Appleby. That won't bother you any. We're still going. Of course. It won't bother me any. Shall we go? Vance, I think you're the most charming man I've ever known. That, Mrs. Blake, speaks eloquently for my conceit and very badly for the other men with whom you've been. Are all social parties this dull? No. Only the ones I've been to. (laughs) Score one for the distaff side of the combination. You know, I think we're getting along rather well. I'm glad to hear that. We were, as far as I was concerned. But I'll have you know that when you walked into this room, every woman in the place turned to stare at you. I didn't notice. Used to that sort of attention, then? Immune to it. Tell me, who is everybody here? Well, let's see. That's Appleby Jr. over there. His dad owns mills or something. And next to him... Mrs. Appleby? (laughs) Don't be naive. That's Celia Worthington. Oh. Mrs. Appleby is over by the piano with Cornelius Worthington. Cozy, isn't it? What happens when it comes time to go home? See that light switch next to you? Yes. At midnight, somebody turns that out, and everybody rejoins the partner he came here with. (laughs) No wonder people are looking so strangely at us. Tell me more about the others. Well, uh, there's Montgomery Todd over there. Mr. Todd is the tall man looking vaguely around the room. And Mrs. Todd? Well, she's the one Montgomery is looking vaguely around the room for. Mm -hmm. She's the thin woman over by the palms at the other end of the room. Very wealthy. Isn't everybody here? Mm, Practically. Okay, everybody. Don't anybody do anything except what I tell them and nobody will be hurt. Another robbery. All right, quiet. It's an epidemic lately, isn't it? Now, look, over here, you've all got jewels. They're probably all insured. Now, we want them and we don't want any trouble getting them. Want all the men to turn their backs? The lights, what happened to the lights? Hey, boss, boss, there's a trap. Let's get out of here fast. Hey, come on, let's go. I guess I can turn the lights on now, don't you think, Mrs. Blake? Hey, you acted very quickly, then. Congratulations. Congratulations to you, too, Mrs. Blake. Perhaps you didn't act as quickly, but your acting was very good just the same. <laughs> Markham speaking. Markham, 
Mrs. Vance. I've just left Mrs. Blake. The party we were going to switched to dresses at the last moment. Yes, I know. My men found only servants' home when they went to cover the Worthington house. Two men just tried to hold up the guests at this party, Martin. I slipped away to call you and report. Oh, glad you did. Sergeant Heath found out where the party was. He just called in to say he picked up two men who were fleeing from the Appleby Mansion. Come on down here, Vance. I'll have them here in a few moments. Sir. I'll be there, Markham, and I'll bring Mrs. Blake with me. I'm quite sure she can supply all the identification we need. Right in here, Mrs. Blake, if you will. This is District Attorney Markham's office. This is all very distasteful to me, Vance. I'm sorry, but it has to be done. Please come in. All right. Uh, just a moment, please. Just a moment. Uh, hello, Vance. Glad you're here. Good evening, Mrs. Blake. Hello, Mr. Markham. Mrs. Blake, we picked up these two men as they were running from the Appleby house an hour ago. Can you identify them as the men who tried to hold up the guests at the party? Well, no. No, I can't. They're the men who tried to hold up tonight's party, Markham. I recognize them. Thank you, Vance. I guess that's all we need. We can take them in and break up the mob that's been praying at society functions. Do you have all of the mob members, Markham? We have Parker here. He's the one whose phone we had tapped. And Larry Dayton, that's the short individual in the corner there. We think he's Parker's number one helper. There may be one or two others, but we'll get them. I'm quite sure you will. You might as well have everyone connected with the thefts, Markham. For instance, you might take this very important member of the gang, <laughs> Mrs. Emily Blake. What's... I? Mr. Vance, you can't mean Are that. Are you sure, Vance? Quite. And I can mean that, Mrs. Blake. I can do more than mean it. I can prove it. <laughs> I'd like nothing better than to relax at the end of a case, Vance, but we've gotten confessions from Mrs. Blake and Ed Parker, and I'm still not relaxed. Well, Markham, what's the trouble? You know, I told you the police broke that code that Parker was using, but never explained it to me. I want to know first how you broke it, and so quickly. Oh, that? Well, let me see. The original code message found on the dead man was, Live On, right? Yes. And the robbery the dead man was fleeing from took place at 4360 58th Street. Yes. The letters in the words, Live On became the numbers 4360 and 58, Mark. By use of a code word, each letter becomes a number. That's why when you intercepted Parker's message about hole pin, I was able to tell you the address of the next attempted stick-up. Well, how could you have broken the code so quickly? The minute I saw it, I knew it as well as I knew my own name. In fact, it was my own name. Your own name? What? Philo Vance. The P was 1, the H2, the I3, the L4, and so on. Well, I'll be darned. They picked your name. I wonder why. Two reasons. One, it was known to everybody involved. Two, they never thought I'd be called in on a mere series of robberies. Hmm. Well, that brings me up to the question of Mrs. Blake's guilt, Vance. That. Well, it started because I believe there had to be somebody on the inside tipping off the gang as to where these parties were being held. Uh -huh. I didn't suspect Mrs. Blake until after the robbery at her house when, in an effort to divert suspicion from herself, she described one of the masked thieves too well. Well, how do you mean, too well? She said he had a cut under his eye. Now, if he had worn a mask, and we know he did, she couldn't have seen the cut. That got me to thinking. And then I learned that Cornelius Worthington was giving a party. I went to him and got him to switch his party to the Applebee's house. Why? Well, Worthington was to wait at his home and escort every other guest to the Applebee's personally. There, the guests were to be told the phone was out of order. But Worthington was to call Mrs. Blake... Tell her about the change in plan for the party. Oh, I see now. Then when the party was held up, it was only Mrs. Blake who could have been in touch with Ed Parker to tell him the new address. Exactly. Uh -huh. Anything else, Martin? I think not, Vance. I do think that lack of funds and a desire to maintain her social position must have put Mrs. Blake in the middle of this situation. I imagine so. But let's forget her in the middle of this situation. Let's realize we've reached the end of the Cypher murder case. <laughs> Thank you.
I don't have to stand here on a street corner and talk to you. Nobody pays me to do it. Okay, then what are you doing? Because I'm a citizen. I'm a citizen the same as all of you, and I want you to know the same things I know about Jonathan Graves and his political gang who is trying to steal your votes. They're crooked men, completely crooked. They're in politics for their own personal good, not the good of the community. That's right. Now, be sure you remember that when you go to the polls election day. That's all I've got to say. Thanks for listening. Wait a minute, Masters. I want to talk to you. Oh, you, Graves. What could you have to say to me? That was quite a speech you made. Thank you. You seem to be able to influence people very nicely. Well, I read that book you've heard about. Don't get cute, Masters. You're a very honest, upstanding young fellow, and I'm sure we could use you in our organization. What you mean is you could use me so that I don't fight against your organization. That's your interpretation. Of course, there is an element of logic in it. The truth is that if you keep up these street corner talks, you're going to get a lot of people disliking us. That's the best news I've had all day. So long. Uh, Wait a minute, young fellow. Don't be in such a hurry to get away. It might be very valuable to you to stick around and listen a few minutes. I doubt it. The only thing I'd consider valuable would be if you and your crooked colleagues withdrew from the election. No, we can't do that, my boy. You know that. We've got too much at stake. It's cost us a lot of money to build up our candidates. We can't just withdraw them just like that. In that case, we have nothing to talk about. Oh. Oh, but we have. We have something to talk about that should be very near and dear to you. You. What about me? You have your choice at the moment, Masters. A choice of being a quite wealthy, silent young man. Or? Or a very definitely dead one. Give the guy room to die. Okay. You want all the water in this pool for yourself? Hello, boy. Welcome to Poolville, Eddie, old pal. I'll race you to the end. No, No, Bill, I'd just as soon splash around a little. Relaxes me better. A little tightened up from those street corner talks you've been making, huh? No, not particularly. And incidentally, I'm getting results from him. Old man Graves is a little worried about my activities. He heard my speech this morning. Well, don't stop, Eddie. This town will go on the rocks if Graves and his gang get in. No, I know it. I mean, that isn't what's really bothering me. What? What is? You remember Joe Cates? Yeah, vaguely. Why? I'm worried about Joe. He doesn't like me. He doesn't like you because his girl does. That's nothing, Eddie. Lots of guys have fallen in love with another guy's girl. Come on. Let's make the end of the pool. What? I'll give you a couple of yards start. Well, I'll swim there with you, but let's not race. Okay. I'd rather talk. Look, talking and swimming aren't for me. Let's sit up the edge of the pool if you want to gab. Good enough. Okay. What's with this Joe Gates business? Well, he came to see me last night, Bill, and he... Warned me to stay away from Dorothy, or else. You think he was serious? Yes, he certainly sounded it. I don't scare easily, Bill. We wound up in quite a battle. I finally had to clip him. Went that far, huh? Further. In fact, it went so far that I sat down and wrote the district attorney a letter saying that if anything happened to me, they ought to grab Joe Cates right away. Where's the letter? In my desk. I told Joe I was going to write it, but I didn't tell him where I'd put it. Naturally... Well, I hope this thing's only in your imagination, Eddie. I do, too, but I'm afraid it's not. Well, I'm going to hop in for a swim now. Getting that thing off my chest kind of made me feel better. All right, now I'll race you to the end of the pool and back, and then we'll get dressed, okay? You got it, Eddie. Here we go. Look at it come Bad. down, Eddie. Bad. I guess old Jupe Pluvius didn't think we got wet enough in the pool. <laughs> Probably. Lucky I don't live very far. Wait with me out here and I'll get a cab and drop you off. No, by the time you get a cab, I'll be home in bed. All I have to do is walk to the corner, turn it, and I'm practically on my front doorstep. <laughs> Lucky you. Yeah. Okay, Eddie, I'll be seeing you. And don't worry about Joe Cates. I'll try not to. Hope you get that cab in a hurry. Thanks. Night. Night. 
Oh, good evening, officer. Well, Awful night, isn't it? It ain't good. Waiting for a taxi? That's right. My friend is lucky. He lives just around the corner. That's him walking down the street now. Well, he doesn't seem to be too much in a hurry. He's got a lot on his mind. Hey, officer, look. What is it? That fellow with a slouch hat and his coat collar turned up. Came out of a doorway and followed Eddie around the corner. I don't like that. Come on. What the... That was a shot, officer. Hurry. I knew it was a shot, and I'm hurrying as fast as I can. Who was this, Eddie? Eddie Masters. Guy I've known for years. We were swimming together just now, and he was worried about... Here's the corner. Let's see if he had something to worry about. Uh, He sure did. Is that him on the ground over there? Sure is, and that guy bending over him. Grab him, officer. He's starting to run. He ain't going to get very far. Stop you! Stop or I'll shoot! No, 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 don't shoot, don't. Eddie. Okay, you! Eddie, what happened? I saw you throw your gun away just now. You're coming to headquarters with me. No, no, officer, no, I didn't Eddie, do it. I didn't shoot him. No, huh? Well, you just happen to be out for a stroll in this lovely weather, huh? Eddie, Come on, back with me. No, no, I'll go pick I... up your gun and take you downtown. I, I didn't Eddie. do it, officer. I swear I didn't. Why'd you run away when you saw us coming around the corner? I, I was going to chase the guy who did shoot him. That's all I was going to do, honest. Stop your lying. Let's see if your victim's friend knows who you are. How is he, my boy? He's, uh... He's dead, officer. That's what I thought. Recognize this guy I grabbed? Hold her head up, you. Sure, sure I recognize him. He's the guy I saw sneaking around the corner after Eddie. He's the fellow Eddie was afraid would kill him, and he did. He's Joe Cates. Hello, Miss Morgan. Mr. Vance, please come in. Thank you. Is Mr. Markham in? Oh, uh, he's in his private office. He's been trying to reach you. Yes, I know. I phoned my office and they gave me the message. Is that I you, wonder... Vance? That's right, Markham. Please come in here, will you, Vance? Well, the command of the district attorney permits no pleasantries between you and me, Miss Morgan. Excuse me. Of course. Hello, Markham. How are you, Vance? Fine. Fine, thank you. And you? I'm not sure. Uh, sit down, won't you, Vance? Yes, thanks. I have something on my mind, something important. Of course. Does it have anything to do with the trial you're conducting? Everything. Vance, I left that courtroom today knowing definitely I can get a conviction in the state's case against Joe Cates. And that bothers you? Yes. Every bit of evidence points to Cates being the killer. Yet when we adjourn today, for the first time in my life, I was sorry that I'm the district attorney. Well, this sounds serious, Markham. Tell me about it. I'll tell you as much as I know. Joe Cates was picked up near the spot where Edward Masters was murdered, and we rushed the case to trial, as you know. Tell me the things I don't know, Markham. Perhaps that would be easier. All right. A witness, Bill Miller, saw this Joe Cates follow the victim around the corner. Then Miller and a policeman heard a shot and found Cates bending over Masters' body. The newspapers say Cates threw away his gun and started to run, but the policeman overtook and overpowered him. That's the way it happened, isn't it, Markham? Yes, and despite a letter in which Masters wrote he feared Cates... I'll tell you something, Vance. Cates denies shooting Masters, and I don't entirely disbelieve him. No? No, despite this letter the victim wrote naming Cates as the man who had threatened him. Seems there's rather a complete case against Mr. Cates, but you say you don't entirely disbelieve Cates' claim that he didn't kill Masters. Why? I don't know why. Call it a sixth sense, call it anything you like, but I don't think he did it. Everything points to him, and I'm sure I'll get a conviction when the case goes to the jury. But I don't believe he did it. Well, perhaps he didn't. Perhaps someone else did murder Mr. Masters. He had political enemies, I believe. Yes, but Vance, it's the ballistics report on the gun that the police officer picked up that proved our conclusive evidence against Cates. The officer saw him throw it away. And it's the murder gun, all right. A pearl-handled automatic, a forty-five. I know why you tried to reach me. As the district attorney, there isn't anything you can do to prevent Joe Cates from being convicted. But as a man, I'm sure he didn't murder Masters. And tomorrow I've got to put him on the stand and convince the jury that he's guilty. I know how you feel. Let me see. There are three reasons why Cates is believed guilty. The witness who saw him trail Masters around the corner. The letter written by Masters and indicting Cates. And Cates' gun, which the officer saw him throw away, and which has been proved to be the murder weapon. That's right. Combined, they form irrefutable testimony against Cates. But you're not too happy about the certain proof you have that Cates is a murderer. Definitely not. Only there isn't anything I can do about it. I don't like to see you unhappy, Markham. Maybe there's something I can do about it. I'll be at the trial tomorrow. Quiet. 
quiet in the courtroom, please. Continue with your interrogation of the witness, Mr. Defense Attorney. Thank you, Your Honor. First, I'd like him to identify this photograph. Excuse me. May I... Pardon, pardon me, please. I'll please. take the seat for you, Mr. Vance, here. Thank you, Miss Morgan. Does this well, here indicate... how is Mr. Markham doing? Wonderfully. He can't miss getting a conviction. The defense attorney is questioning the main witness now, but it won't mean a thing. Listen. Now, the photograph you just looked at, Mr. Miller, shows the scene of the crime, Blake and Daggett Street, and includes the spot where you were standing. Is that correct? That's right. Now, you say you saw a figure whom you identified as Joe Cates turning the corner after the victim, Mr. Masters, had passed. That's right. Do you mean to say that you could definitely identify a figure in a pouring rain late at night, a figure with his coat collar up and his hat pulled down at so great a distance? Yes, I do. I'm positive it was Joe Cates. The street lights were bright enough for me to see him. I even knew what color suit he was wearing under his coat. I could see the color of his trousers. That's how bright it was. That's all. Your witness, Mr. Markham. No questions. See what I mean, Mr. Vance? Mr. Markham has a cinch in his teeth. So it appears. Your Honor, I wish to call back upon the stand my client, Mr. Gates. Very well. Mr. Gates, please. Will you take the stand? Yeah. Yeah, I'll do it. Okay, now what? Mr. Gates. The state declares that a police officer seized you a short distance from where Mr. Master's body was found lying on the ground. Well? A witness, Mr. Miller, says he saw you turn the corner shortly after Mr. Master's had passed. That's right, I did turn the corner. I was following Master's to protect him. From what? I knew he was in danger. I knew I'd be blamed. I was following him to see that nothing happened to him. Mr. Cates, a police officer says he saw you throw your gun away. Is that true? Yes, I did throw my gun away. I didn't want to be caught with it on me. The state says that gun the officer picked up, the one you threw away, killed Edward Masters. I know, I know. I've heard it a dozen times, only I can't help what the state says. All I know is I didn't do it. District Attorney Markham. The Masters murder case began with the finding of Edward Masters' body, with Joe Cates discovered bending over the body seconds later. Cates had thrown away his gun when the officer approached, and later it was found to be the murder weapon. Cates is on trial, and I'm prosecuting him, but I have a strong feeling that despite the evidence, he is not the killer. Because of my misgivings, Hello, Vance is in the courtroom as the trial continues with the defense attorney questioning the prisoner. Mr. Cates, I want you to tell the court. Now, you admit throwing your gun away when the policeman approached. Uh, tell the court, where did you get that gun? Down at Henry's pawn shop. I paid $20 for it. Now, how many times had you fired that gun, Mr. Cates? I never fired it. Never in my life. Quiet. Quiet in the court. Thank you, Your Honor. You never fired it? No, I tell you, never. Once when I was cleaning it at my place right after I got it, it went off accidentally, but I never fired it at anybody. The police established definitely that it was the gun you threw away that fired the shot that killed Mr. Masters. Now, how do you explain that? I'll tell you how. I'm being framed, that's how. I, I never fired that gun. I never aimed it at anybody, and I never murdered Edward Masters, but it, it doesn't look to me like anybody's going to believe that. <laughs> This is Henry's pawn shop, Vance. Do I go in with you? No, Markham, please. I want to do this alone, if you don't mind. Wait for me, will you? Of course. After the trial this afternoon, I don't mind being alone, believe me. The trial isn't over yet, Markham. Tomorrow's another day. And by tomorrow, we may have some hope for Kate's. I hope so, Vance. I won't be long. Yes? Yes? What can I do for you, sir? I'm not sure. Can anyone hear us? There is no one here, sir. Nobody but the two of us. What is it you want? A gun. I'm sorry, sir. Guns do not sell. If you have something to pawn, I'll gladly look at it. If you wish to purchase something, I'll gladly sell it. 
Except guns. Guns I do not sell. I've got a lot of money. Money wouldn't help me if I went to jail. A lot of money, you say? That's what I said. What kind of a gun? How much do you want for a forty-five automatic, pearl-handled? With a pearl handle, it'll cost you a hundred dollars. Without, it's less. Mm, how much less? I have a foreign pistol for twenty dollars. I have them for any price over that. Thank you. That's what I wanted to know. I'll be back. When they say they'll be back, they never come back. Plenty of your money, huh? Good day, sir. Well, Vance, what'd you find out? Nothing definite, Markham, but something that insists that I continue on this case. I don't know how I'm going to prove it at the moment, but I think that I can blast the most incriminating evidence against Joe Cates, possession of the murder gun. Yes, Miss Burke? Yes, Mr. Aikens to see you, sir. Who? Mr. Aikens? I don't know any Mr. Aikens. You sure he wants to see me? He said he wanted to see you, Mr. Graves. He asked if you were the political leader, and I told him yes, and then he said he had something very private and personal to discuss with you. What could that be? I'm sure I don't know, sir. Well, send him in. Then if you like, you can leave. Oh, thanks, Mr. Graves. Private and personal. What could that be? Mr. Graves. Come in, Mr. Aikens. What can I do for you? I rather think it's something you can do for yourself. Yes, Mr. Graves. That's exactly what I'd rather think. And what does that mean? Mr. Graves, I live at the corner of Blake and Daggett Street, uh, above the drugstore. Well? Remember that rainy night when that fellow, uh, what's his name? Uh, oh, yes, Eddie Masters was shot. Yes? What about it? Well, I was standing at the window looking out. I, I like to look out when it rains. I think streets are prettiest when it's raining. Forget the streets. What's on your mind? Well, my windows face the corner where Masters was shot. And I saw who shot him. I rather think it was you, Mr. Graves. I've seen your pictures in the papers often. <laughs> yes, I, I rather think it was you. Oh, you do, huh? Oh, yes. I was going to mention it to my wife, but I said to myself, no, I said, I'm going to see Mr. Graves himself. I'm sure he'll give me something for not saying anything about this to anybody. <laughs> you, you see, I was rather sure you would. You were. You were sure you were going to get something to keep your mouth closed. I was rather certain of it. You're going to get something to keep it closed, all right. Keep it closed for good. Oh, no. Oh, please do. Oh. This, Markham, will prove something to us or nothing must be done. Granted, it must be, if you say so. But what is it, Vance? This is Joe Cates' apartment. He told the court from the witness stand that he had a gun that fired a bullet from it accidentally the other day. Yes. The bullet apparently entered into the woodwork about here. I'm getting it out. And what do you want with that bullet, Vance? Support of a theory of mine, for one thing, Martin. Should we answer that, Vance? Why not? It's for you. For me? <laughs> the phone rings in Joe Cates' apartment and you know it's for me. Vance, how is that possible? Relatively simple. It can't be for Cates. Everybody knows he's in jail. And I did call your office and leave word you'd be here. Well, it could also be a wrong number. Don't forget that. <laughs> Hello. Mr. Markham, Riley. Riley? <laughs> Vance was right again. Right? Uh, nothing, Riley, nothing. Uh, what is it? There's been another murder, Mr. Markham. Quiet fellow named Akins, George Aiken. Yes? Lived at the corner of Blake and Daggett Street. We picked his body out of a lot. Uh -huh. Shot through the head. Now, where are you calling from? The morgue. Aiken's widow just identified the body. Thought I'd let you know. Well, I'm glad you did. Thanks, Roddick. Bye. Well, Vance, just to make matters worse, there's been another murder. A fellow named Aikens lived at the corner of Blake and Daggett Streets. Shot through the head. Well, rather unfortunate for Mr. Aikens. But it doesn't make matters worse for us. Why not? It's just another murder the police will have to solve. Perhaps. Where did the murder of Edward Masters take place, Markham? The corner of Blake and Daggett. Vance. You see what I mean, Markham? I think perhaps our Mr. Aikens might have seen the master's murder, tried to shake down, and got himself killed for his efforts. Sounds reasonable, doesn't it? Well, it can't be coincidence. That's the way I feel about it, too. Now, Markham, there's something I want you to do for me. I want to be present when the bullet taken from Aikens is compared with this bullet I just took out of the wall in Kate's apartment. All right, Vance, but why? Because the answer to that question is the answer to the master's murder, Markham. <laughs> Mr. Vance, 
Lance. I've looked no doubt about it. The two bullets are identical. Thanks, Riley. Satisfied, Markham? I'm completely satisfied that the bullet we took out of the wall in Kate's apartment came from the same gun as the bullet that killed Aikens. But what does that prove? Everything. Everything to my satisfaction. I'm convinced now that Kate's did not kill Masters. Satisfied beyond the shadow of a doubt. And I understand that Masters was particularly active against a political organization trying to get into power. That's right. He made street corner speeches against the organization every day. The head of that party is a Mr. Jonathan Graves, I believe. Yes. Get him in your office, Markham. I'm going to see Aiken's widow. With half a break, we'll clear up this case in an hour. I'm a busy man, Mark. I'm a very busy man. What's the idea of getting me down here to your office? Well, to tell you the truth, Mr. Graves, it's Philo Vance's idea. Vance? Well, if it's his idea, where is he? On the way here, I hope. He went to see the widow of that fellow Aikens, the one whose body the police picked up a little while ago. What's that got to do with me? I'm afraid Vance will have to tell you that when he gets... I'm here to tell Mr. Graves right now. Thank you, Markham, for getting him here. If you're Vance, don't thank him for getting me here. Thank me for coming. My thanks to both of you. Mr. Graves, I've just come from seeing the widow of George Aikens. So Markham was telling me. She told me a rather strange thing. She said that her husband was going to see you just before he was shot. Maybe he was. He never got to my office, though. That's still stranger. The young lady in your office told me that she showed Aikens in to see you. That's the reason I was delayed, Markham. I saw both Mrs. Aikens and Mr. Graves' office assistant. Okay, so he was in to see me. What about it? He left. I never saw him again. Mr. Graves, you made a terrible error, leaving your gun in your desk drawer. You don't trick me, Vince. I didn't leave it in any drawer. I've got it with me right here. Thank you. I'll just take it if you don't mind. Come now, Mr. Graves. You have no reason for not giving it to me, have you? No. No, of course I haven't. No, I won't do it. I won't give it to you. Oh, yes, you will. I'm taking it for you. Stop it, you bleed. There, you've got it now. Uh. What do you want it for? For a wonderful reason, Mr. Graves. It's undoubtedly the gun that killed Mr. Aikens, for one thing. You think my gun killed Aikens? No, but this is not your gun. I think your gun killed Edward Masters. It was Joe Kate's gun that killed Aikens. But you fired both guns, Mr. Graves. Markham, when Kate's trial is resumed tomorrow, ask that the charge against him be dismissed and that Mr. Graves be held for Masters' murder. <laughs> Would you explain to me about the murder gun? That's what's been bothering me. It will bother you no longer, Markham. The gun that killed Masters was a pearl-handled automatic, right? That's right. Kate's gun, the one that he bought from the pawnbroker, was a foreign pistol. Kate's told me he paid $20 for his gun. You can't buy a pearl-handled automatic for $20. Oh, I see now. The police officer picked up the murder gun, all right, but it wasn't the gun Kate's threw away. That, the murderer himself came back to find after the crowd had dispersed. Uh, Give me that slowly, will you, Vance? Certainly. Kate threw his gun away when the policeman arrived. Yes. The murderer, Graves, saw him do it. Uh Uh-huh. Graves had previously thrown his gun away when he was running with Kate's after him. Oh, I see now. Graves came back to pick up Kate's gun and keep it. Keep it until he had to use it to kill Mr. Aikens. Uh Uh-huh. Apparently, my idea as to why Aikens was killed was correct. He saw Graves kill Masters. I don't see why Graves didn't get rid of Kate's gun after he picked it up. No reason for him to, Markham. That gun hadn't killed anyone until he himself used it on Aikens. Then he didn't dare get rid of it because if it were ever proven that it was Kate's gun, Kate's would be absolved of the murder of Masters and the real murderer sought. (laughs) This has really been a beauty, hasn't it, Vance? Every possible element seemed to point to Kate's as Masters' killer. But you, you found a way of breaking all of them down. Well, Markham, I was glad to do it for a number of reasons. One of them is that all this publicity after Graves' indictment will mean that his crooked political machine will be at an end. (laughs) That's quite a coincidence, Vance. Yes, the end of the machine and, of course, the end of the master's murder case.
wants to see me, does she? Yes, she does. What's the matter? Isn't she contented just to live here? Must she intrude even when I'm trying to read? She say for me to tell you this. I tell you, that is all I know. All right, Dora, let her come in. But you are to do something for me. Yes, Mr. Benton, whatever it is, I do it. You are to listen outside the door when Irene comes in. Listen, and remember everything she says. Many years I worked for you, Mr. Benton. Never do you ask me to do something like that. Never mind whether you ever did it before. Do it now. And get her in here right away. Do you hear me? Right away. Yes, 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 Mr. Benton. I hear you right away. Uh, Miss Benton, go, go in here, please. Thank you, Dora. Well, uh, well, what is it, Irene? Uncle Walter, You I... what? Confounded girl, what is it? Uncle Walter, I want to leave this house. I'm going away. Good, goodbye. I've come to ask you a favor. I'll need some money. Just enough to get started in another city. Just until I get a job. You'll need some money, will you? And you think I'll give it to you? Haven't I done enough for you? Haven't you lived here with me for ten years ever since your father died? Yes, that's true. Well, what's the matter? Isn't this house good enough for you? Does everybody starve you? You work too hard around here? Uncle Walter, you don't want me here. You've only kept me with you so you could have me near enough to hurt every time you wanted to. You hated my father, and you've never done anything but make me pay for the way you felt about him. No, I'm cruel, am I? You're the meanest man in the world. I can't stay here any longer. I've become a good textile designer. I can get a job, but I don't want it to be anywhere near you. I'm afraid of being near you. Afraid, are you? You're afraid of what I might do to you? No, Uncle Walter, it isn't that. I'm afraid of what I might do to you. Thomas, what is it? Uh, Mr. Benton is still waiting to see you, Mr. French. All right, send him in. French, what's the idea of keeping me waiting? Sit down, Benton, and don't scream at me. I don't scare easily. Oh, you don't, huh? Good. French, you put in a bid for the Cooperated Industries construction job. Lowest bid they got. You're going to get the order. Well, what about it? You're going to get the order, but you're not going to take it. Oh, I'm not, eh? And why not? Because my firm made the second lowest bid, and when you tell Cooperated you won't take the order, it'll go to me, and I want it. What makes you think I'm going to tell Cooperated that? A little information I happen to have about you and what you were before you came to this city. I said I don't scare easily, Benton, but I want to add to that. I don't bluff easily either. Bluff? I'm not bluffing, French. I never bluff. Let me read you a report. A report I assure you I'd have no hesitancy in reading to Mrs. French and your children if you force me to. I'm listening. <clears throat> Washington, D.C., December 1918. This is a clipping from a Washington paper, French. Listen. Washington, D.C., December 1918. The State Department today released a list of men who were wanted for draft evasion in the World War. Men who so far have not been apprehended. Among Wait a minute. Wait a minute, Benton. How'd you get that clipping? A friend of mine got it for me. I had to pay him a lot to trace your background, but he did, and he got me this. And, French, I intend to do just what I said I would. If you don't... Get out of here, Benton. Get out. Get out? Sure, I'll get out. I'll get out when you tell me you aren't accepting the cooperated order. I've got to take it, Benton. I put every dime I could lay my hands on into a plant that could handle that assignment. I can't give it up. No? Well, I'm not an unreasonable man. I'll give you until tomorrow morning to decide which it is you can't stand. Bankruptcy or disgrace. You mean that, don't you? Of course I mean it. You know me well enough to know I mean it. Yes. Yes, I know. There's one thing I don't know. How a man like you is allowed to live. I don't know one other thing either. And that is, why don't I do something about it? Well... You can put your shirt on, Mr. Benton. The examination's over. I know it's over. And I know I can put my shirt on if I want to. I know what's wrong with me. Am I improving? That's what I want to know. I'm not sure. You're a doctor, aren't you? What do you mean you're not sure? I need some time to check some laboratory reports. Can't tell you anything definite right now. Can't tell me anything definite? 
What kind of a doctor are you? I was a good one. Till I accepted you as a patient. Now, I'm not so sure. You're not sure about anything, are you? Aren't you forgetting a little conversation we had when I first came to you? Very well, then. Stop stalling. I want to know how I'm getting on and how long I have to live. You really want to know? Yes. Well, Mr. Benton, in my opinion, you may not live until morning. But your death may not be from natural causes. Kind of quiet here at the station, eh, Sergeant? Yeah, Kelly, but I'm not complaining. When would you go out in your beat? Oh, I got another 10, 12 minutes yet, Sergeant. Want me to run out and get some coffee? No, no, thanks. Just the same. Here, Kelly, take a look at my book. All that's happened since I came on duty is one woman who lost her husband, one woman who lost her dog, and two traffic accidents. Slowest night I can remember. Hey. Look at that guy who just came in. Look at the way he's walking. That's a man. Hey, you. What's the matter? You in trouble? Yeah. Yes, officer. I am Walter Benton. I want to report a murder. Murder? Who's dead? I am. Where did Mrs. Markham say she'd meet us, Markham? She said she'd come from the theater, and if we got through at the club early, we were to meet her on this corner, Vance. That sounds to me like she really didn't think you'd make it. My, my, such doubts for a wife to have about this city's rising young district attorney. Oh, she doesn't doubt me, Vance. She knows that when you and I start talking, neither of us realizes the time. Markham, you're my most loyal adherent and staunchest ally. <laughs> Was kind of good to get away from crime for one evening, wasn't it? Excellent. That is, if you hadn't treated a chess game the way you treat a murder... I don't think I know what you mean. Don't you? Vance, when I play chess with you, I'm the murderer. Everything I do or intend to do, you seem to know. And furthermore, you know how to check me. Murder of Richard and Walter Benton found dead. Hear that, Markham? I certainly did. Hey, boy, I'll take a paper. Right, Mac, here you are. Gee, thanks. Extra, extra, read all about it. Murder of Richard and Murder, eh? Funny that you weren't notified at the club, Markham. Uh, I can't understand it. I can now. I left word that I wasn't to be disturbed, and so the club attendant figured that meant you weren't to be given any calls either. Yeah, it must be. Read this with me, Vance. The most unusual murder in police history took place tonight when a man identified as Walter Benton, wealthy head of the Benton Construction Company, staggered into the West 80th Street station, announced that he had been murdered, and fell dead at the feet of Sergeant Michael Hoskins, patrolman Gustav Kelly. Well, the rest is to tell. Unimportant, I'd say, at a rough glance. Well, Vance? I'm afraid Mrs. Markham is going to miss us on this corner, Markham. But then she didn't really expect we'd be here, I suppose. No, she didn't. I'm going to headquarters right now, Vance. You'd like to come? I think not. I think I'm going to visit Walter Benton's house. Perhaps murder, like charity, begins at home. <laughs> Police, they will hear you are more police? No, my name is Philo Vance. I'm a private investigator. I'd like to ask you some questions. No, you ask me nothing. I do not know anything, so you ask me nothing. You know how long you've worked for Mr. Benton, don't you? Twelve years. Twelve years I've been here. But I don't do anything. The police, they ask me many questions, but I don't do anything. I can tell them nothing. Who else lived here? You must know that. Who else lived here? I've... I'd, I live I'd, here, Mr. Vance. I heard you questioning Dora. I know. You were standing outside the door, and your shadow was very evident across the threshold. I was just wondering how long it would be before you announced yourself. You may go, Dora. Oh, oh go? Oh, yes. Yes, I go. I go. I, I'll fix some soup for you, Miss Irene. Thanks, Dora. Miss Irene. Irene what? Benton. Walter Benton was my uncle. His father and mine were brothers. You live here? Yes. I have since my father died. You don't seem particularly concerned about your uncle's death? My uncle was the meanest man in the world. He deserved to die. I hardly think that's your decision to make. Or was it? Excuse me, Mr. Vance. Hello? Hello. I believe Mr. Philo Vance is there. May I talk to him, please? This is Mr. Markham. Uh, Just a minute. Uh, For you, Mr. Vance. Mr. Markham. Thank you. 
Hello, Markham. Lance, we've just discovered the cause of death in the Benton case. He'd been poisoned, loaded with poison, the medical examiner says. I just thought you'd like to know. Thank you, Markham. What kind of poison was it? Carborium chloride. Any developments on your advance? Not yet. I'll be in touch with you, Markham. Good enough. Yes. Goodbye. Miss Goodbye. Nice chicken broth I made you come, come have it while it's hot. Uh, thank you, Dora, but I think I'll go up to my room. I hope you'll excuse me, Mr. Vance. I really don't have any choice, do I? Oh, Dora. Yes? Don't you leave me. I'm not quite through in this house, and I'd rather not be alone. Well, what is it you want? I might be interested in some of that chicken broth you made. That is for Miss Irene, not for you. <laughs> what is this great power I have over the opposite sex? Dora, what was that? Sound like bottle break. Sounded like that to me, too. Where is Miss Irene's room? At the top of stairs. Thank you very much. Where you go, Mr. Vance? Where you go? Miss Benton. Oh, in there, eh? Well, what have we here? Besides a couple of broken bottles. Been pouring the contents of them down the drain, haven't you? What about it? Supposing I have. The bottles are broken, but the labels are intact. Well, let's see now. Mm, carborium chloride. You have excellent hearing, Miss Benton. I don't know what you mean. I think you do. I think you overheard Mr. Markham telling me on the phone just now that your uncle died of poisoning and that carborium chloride was the poison used. Yes? Yes. You knew that you had carborium chloride in your room, so you ran up to dispose of it before I'd find it. I see by the designing equipment in this room that you had a use for the carborium. Handy in textile dyeing, wasn't it? So what if it was? And what if I did try to get rid of it just now? Do you think that that proves I killed my uncle? You did overhear what Mr. Markham told me. Yes, I did. I heard him say that carborium chloride killed my uncle. And you did catch me trying to get rid of that carborium I had here. But do you think that that proves I killed him? No. No, Miss Benton, I don't think it proves that at all. In fact, I think it proves you didn't. No, Markham, I'm in my own office. I'm quite sure we won't be overheard, so don't worry. But, Vance... I'll something... listen to what you have to tell me in a moment. But it's important. So Vance. is what I have to tell you. Listen, Markham, I know for a fact that Irene Benton can be removed from our suspect list. She didn't poison her uncle, despite the fact that she broke several bottles of carborium chloride that were in her room. How do you know she didn't? She tried to destroy them after you told me it was carborium that caused Walter Benton's death, Markham. If she had poisoned her uncle, she'd have known what killed him and would have destroyed the poison long before I got to the house. Uh, Vance, that's the most logical explanation of a completely contradictory act I ever heard. She tried to destroy the poison because she believed that if we found it, we would suspect her. That's right. Uh-huh. Now, Markham, now that I've removed one suspect from this case, tell me your news. I have a suspect to replace the one you took away. In a secret pocket in Walter Benton's clothes, Sergeant Heath found a clipping from a Washington, D.C. newspaper. A clipping dated December 1918. Yes? It named a group of men wanted for draft evasion in World War I. And one of the men is in this city now. And what's more, he was a business rival of Walter Benton's. His name is Martin French. And apparently, Benton was using the clipping to blackmail him. Apparently. You know, Markham, Irene Benton told me that her uncle was the meanest man in the world. I'm beginning to think she was right. But we've still got to find out who killed him. This is District Attorney Markham. The meanest man murder case began when Walter Benton announced he'd been murdered and then fell dead in police headquarters. Benton lived with his niece, Irene, and a housekeeper, Dora. But neither has been of any help to either Philo Vance or the police in establishing who poisoned Benton. However, we have uncovered a suspect in Martin French, an industrial rival of Benton's, whom we suspect Benton was blackmailing. The man we have watching French has reported to us that he was last seen entering the office of Philo Vance. We don't know what he's doing there, but we do know... Mr. Vance, this is a strictly business proposition. I'm a businessman. I want to pay you to establish my innocence in the death of Walter Benton. If you're guilty, you couldn't pay me, Mr. French. If you're innocent, you won't have to. Oh, don't beat around the bush, Vance. I'm a prize suspect, and I know it. Now, Benton knew something about me I didn't want known. Now that he's dead, it'll come out. I know it will. And I'm not prepared to face going on trial for Benton's death. I didn't kill him. 
You've got to help me prove that. I'm not an attorney, you know, Mr. French. Yes, I know, I know. You're a private investigator, the best in the business. And, and I want to hire you to prove I didn't kill Benton. Hire you to prove who did. Put it that way. Maybe that'll sound better to you. You don't have to hire me for that. I'm trying right now to find Benton's killer. By the way, did you see Benton the day of his death? Why, yes. He was in my office. You didn't have lunch with him? He didn't drink any water in your office? No, no. All he did was threaten me. Threaten me and left. I see. Well, Mr. French, it's only fair to tell you that the police do know about your past. Uh, Benton found a way of letting them know even after he was dead. It's just like the man. Just like him. From what I've heard of him, it certainly was. But you've given me an idea, French. The dead man told one tale... Maybe he'll also indicate who killed him. Coming. Coming. Oh, Dr. Larkin, I'm so glad you've come. It's Dora. She's lying on the bed in her room and she's hysterical. I'm glad you called me, Miss Benton. I'll go see her right away. Which room is her? The room right next to the library. You remember the library. Certainly. I used to examine your uncle there. This should be Dora's room right here. That's right. Shall I go in with you? No, that won't be necessary. I'll go in myself. I'll call you if I need anything. Mr. Very well, Doctor. I'll be where you can find me. Dora. Dora, stop crying, please. This is Dr. Lyon. I'm going to help you. Go away. Nobody can help me. Go away. You've got to stop that crying, Dora. Stop it. You're making yourself sick. Sick, sick. I'm not sick. Doctor, I am too well. But he is dead, Doctor. He's dead. Mr. Benton? Yes, Dora? But he's been dead a whole day now. You weren't like this when you heard the news of his death. Oh, what difference, Doctor? It takes time, maybe, before I realize no more he's here. I wanted to come back, Doctor. I wanted to come back. You can bring him back, Doctor. Nobody can bring him back, Dora. Somebody poisoned him. You know who poisoned him, Doctor? You know who did this? The police are trying to find out. I know who did it, Doctor. I know. You do, Dora? I know. Doctor, you know, too. Only the, the two of us know. And... and the two of us, we don't talk ever. Do we, Doctor? Passengers from flight 87 leaving at gate 4. Passengers. Going somewhere, Mr. French? Well, thanks. I imagined you'd be surprised to see me. Actually, I was surprised to see where you were heading when I started to follow you. I, I have a business trip, Vance. Only a day or so. Really? With all the luggage I saw you check? Uh, why not? Uh, uh, may as well tell you. I was running away. I have to get away, Vance. I don't think you do. If you were wanted, you'd be picked up no matter where you went. Don't you realize that? Running away won't solve anything. What am I going to do? Go back to your house. There are some developments pending in the meanest man murder case that I don't believe you'll want to miss. In fact, I wouldn't want you to miss them. Dr. Larkin speaking. Dr. Larkin, this is Philo Vance. Walter Benton was a patient of yours, was he not? Yes, he was, Vance, for many years. Many years. What was the matter with him? He was a sick man. His case history is here, if you care to look at it. Not right at the moment. In fact, I didn't find out you were his doctor until a few minutes ago when I called the Benton home. Miss Benton referred me to you. Is there anything else I can do for you? Yes, if you will, doctor. If Mr. Benton hadn't been poisoned, how long would he have lived? That's hard to say. As I told you, he was a pretty sick man. Did he know that? There wasn't anything that man didn't know, Vance. Have you or the police any idea who murdered him? I don't know about the police, but I have a pretty good idea, I think. If you want to know how good, meet me in my office in about an hour. I'm going to have a Mr. French, Miss Benton, and the maid Dora there. And I'm sure Mr. Markham will be on hand. I see. But I'm particularly anxious to have you. So you'll be there, won't you? Mark 
Markham, this is one of the strangest cases we've ever come across. There are four people in my office who wanted to see Walter Benton dead. Yes, Martin French, Irene Benton, Dora the Maid, and Dr. Larkin. But why Dr. Larkin? Benton had an uncanny faculty for making enemies, Markham. When you called this case the meanest man murder case, you weren't far from wrong. No, I think I was quite accurate in that. I wouldn't say quite that. There's a startling inaccuracy in that title, but we won't go into that right now. My private office, Martin. I see. That is something we're going to right now, eh? Mm -hmm. I'm with you, Vance. Right. Thank you, all of you, for being so patient, for waiting for us. All right, Mr. Vance. Dora, I understand you had a nervous breakdown yesterday. You collapsed. I do not know anything. I do not say anything. You don't have to now. Dora, according to what you told Dr. Larkin when he visited you yesterday, you knew who killed Mr. Benton. And you indicated that he knew, too. Who tell you this? I told him, Dora. But I also told him you were hysterical and couldn't be responsible for what you said. I loved Mr. Benton very much. So I imagined from your reaction to his death. You cooked for him, Dora. You, one of the only people in this world who cared for him, could have poisoned him most easily. The only one who could have poisoned him. I do not poison him. Shall I take her in, Vance? Not yet, Markham. Dora, you're fond of Miss Benton. Miss Irene? She's like my child. My child, I bring her up. I figured that, too. Mr. French, Miss Benton, Dr. Larkin. You all had reasons, I imagine, for wanting to see Mr. Benton dead. But none of you killed him. What are you... Well, that Vance, what are we waiting for? You say that Dora could have poisoned Benton very easily. That's right. She had the opportunity while cooking for him. The poison in Irene Benton's room was available to her, and she had a motive. He was being even more cruel than usual to Miss Benton. That's right, isn't it, Miss Benton? He does not have to answer. I tell you. Yes, he was even more cruel than usual to my Miss Irene. This I cannot stand. I love him, yes, but I love her, too. Even more than I love him. I go to her room. I get bottle marked poison. I poison him. I do it. I do it. Apparently, Vance, I'll take her downtown. We'll close up shop on this one. I wouldn't if I were you, Markham. There's no question but that she fed Mr. Benton the carborium chloride, but she didn't murder him. What? Well, if she didn't, who did? Nobody murdered him, Markham. Carborium chloride was the one poison that couldn't kill Walter Benton. It was a little unkind of you to make me wait an hour before you'd clear up this meanest man murder case, Vance, but it was worth waiting for. Now, what was this all about? Here are the facts, Markham. Benton knew ten years ago he was going to die someday from an incurable illness that he had. Dr. Larkin is my authority for that statement. I'm not questioning it, Vance. Very well. Benton, however, was too mean to just plain die. He wanted his death to look like murder, and he wanted his niece to appear to be the murderess. But why, Vance? A grudge he held against her father for some reason or other. That's not important. But this is... Dr. Larkin told me that his laboratory tests indicate that ten years ago, he started taking carborium chloride in small doses, increasing the dose every week. His body thus became immune to it. Immune to poison? That's right. I checked it thoroughly. There are two kinds of poison, Markham. Cumulative and non-cumulative. In one of the classifications, the human body can build up an immunity if subjected to the poison in tiny doses at the beginning. Later on, the dose can be increased without danger to the subject. It's right here in a book on toxicology, if you'd care to read it. Uh, I'll take your word for it. Oh, thank you. Anyhow, Markham, when your medical examiner found a quantity of carborium chloride in the dead man, he made the very natural assumption that it was the poison that caused death. What happened was this. Benton felt himself dying. Uh, excuse me for interrupting, but how is that? Again, Dr. Larkin is my authority. Dr. Larkin told me he had told Benton that death in his case would be preceded by a sharp pain, a sort of warning a few hours before death was to occur. I see. Then Benton did know he was about to die. Right. And knowing that, and knowing that he had a quantity of carborium chloride in him, he made the dramatic entrance and exit from this world at the police station. He knew then that he was accusing his niece of murder without ever indicting her. Why the niece particularly? Because she used carborium chloride in her work in textile designing. 
Benton's used a lot for dyes. In fact, Benton used Irene's own chemicals when he began systematically building up a resistance to the carborium. It was quite a clever plan. We're lucky it didn't work. We most certainly are. You were the reason it didn't work, Vance. You were the only way we'd ever have known that the meanest man murder case wasn't a murder case at all. say, wait a minute, you wait a minute. Well, what is it? What's with that speech you just made? What's with insulting the customers in my place? Did you hear the hand I got when I finished singing? Sounded like one guy in the whole joint was swatting a fly. What do they know about singing? They don't have to know about no music, Josie. All they got to know is to pay their checks. You crack to the suckers once more like you just did and you're through. Don't make me laugh. I ain't trying to be funny. You don't have to try. Why don't you get smart, Joe? You know you can't fire me. I got enough to put you away for 50 years, any time I like. Uh, wait a minute. Wait right here. I'll make it fast. Uh, oh, hello, Mr. Turner, boss. What are you listening at the door for, Angel? Me, boss, listening? <laughs> Not me. I'm your head waiter. I work. I don't listen. Uh, Excuse me, Mr. Turner, boss. Somebody wants You're having trouble with everybody, ain't you, Joe? I'm not through with you, Josie. You ain't kidding, you ain't. We were just talking about that before you spotted Angel snooping. You were going to fire me, remember? Oh, I didn't say that. What I said was that if you cracked to the suckers once more, you'd be through. That don't mean fired, Josie. That means through. For good. Josie, please, you've got to listen to me. Who says I gotta? You? Why don't you get lost, friend? 
I gotta get in my dressing room so I can change my clothes. Do you realize what you're doing? You're ruining me, and for no reason, now, give me back my letter. Not right now. Makes me feel good to see the big shot, Colton DeWitt, in the spot. We're on Breeze out of here, DeWitt. And leave me a couple of hundred bucks for spending money. Scram, I gotta go in and dress. All right. Here's your money. Thanks. Hey. I hope you live to spend it, Miss Josie Daniel. Oh, um. Hey. What are you doing in my dressing room? I want to see you, Miss Daniel. The gentleman you just left outside with my husband. Well, that's your problem, my friend. It's got nothing to do with me. So you're Mrs. DeWitt, hmm? Yes. I know all about you and my husband, Miss Daniels. I know that he was infatuated with you. Know that he wrote you some letters. But that's all over now. That it is. Except for the payoff. When I decide how much I want for the letters he wrote, I'll let him know. Goodbye, Mrs. DeWitt. Listen to me, Miss Daniels. My husband has no idea I know about him and you. But I saw the change in him. Saw him turn from a wonderful man to a broken wreck living in fear of what you might do with the letters he wrote you. I'll give you $10,000 for those letters. Don't be funny. That wouldn't even buy the envelopes. Very well, Miss Daniels. But I'm telling you now, I'm going to get those letters, even if I have to get you first. I'm looking for Philo Vance. I'm Vance. Please come in. I was just about to lock up. The office is closed today, Mrs. Uh... I'm Mrs. Colton DeWitt. Mr. Vance, please listen to me. It's, it's terribly important. By all means. What is it, Mrs. DeWitt? You've heard of my husband. I know his position in the business world. Sit down, won't you? Thank you. Mr. Vance... I've come to see you on a very delicate matter. As a private investigator, that is by no means a novelty to me. I didn't imagine it was, but it is new to me, Mr. Vance. Telling a relative stranger something that is so personal. It, it's my husband, Mr. Vance. He's in trouble. Oh? Financial or female? What do you mean? It couldn't be anything else, could it, Mrs. Dewitt? No. And it isn't anything else. It's a woman, Mr. Vance. A singer... Her name is Josie Daniels. She's known as the Broadway Butterfly, and she works at the Cat's Paw Club. What about her? She's blackmailing my husband, Mr. Vance, bleeding him. And he's paying her because she threatens to show me some letters he's written. But you know all about it. Yes, but I, I can't let my husband know that I know about it. His pride would be gone. Things would never be the same between us if he thought I knew. I want you to buy back those letters or get them any way you like. But I want them. Mr. Vance, here's my bank book. You'll see that I have a little over $10,000 deposited. It's my money, all the money I have in the world. Here's a blank signed check. Use what you have to, to get those letters. All right, Mrs. DeWitt. I'll do it. Thank you very much, Mr. Vance. When will I hear from you? I don't know. I'll go down to the Cat's Paw nightclub this evening to see Miss Josie Daniels. Where will you be later? I'll be available, Mr. Vance. I'll be close by. Very close by. The cat's poor, you said, huh, Mac? It's nine o'clock. Not much doing there at this hour. There may very possibly be after I arrive. How much further is it? Worried about the meter? Maybe another nickel tops. Hey, Mac, your uh, your face has been bothering me. Where have I seen it before? Well, to the best of my knowledge, it's always been just where it is now, right on top of me. I got your name on the tip of my tongue. I know that face. I've seen it in the pit. Hey! You're that famous private detective, Philo Vance. I'm a private investigator, but the rest of the identification is correct. Oh, so you're the guy, eh? Yes, I'm the, uh, guy. Well, uh, what do you know? Never can tell who you ride when you're pushing a hack. Know who I ride the other night? I'm not that good a private investigator. Who was it? Uh, 
So I got the name on the tip of my tongue. Well, this is it, Mr. Vance. The Cat's Paw Club. Only it's a little early, like I told you. I don't think the joint is even open yet. I'll find out in a moment. Well, there seems to be somebody else trying to get in and somebody trying to stop him. Here's your money, driver. Keep the change. Thanks, Mr. Vance. I sure wish I could think who it was I drove the other night. I got the name on the tip of my tongue, too. Seems to be a little crowded there. Good night. Good night. Hey, those two guys over the door seem to be battling. Want me to hang around just in case? No, thank you. Good night. Let me find you. Let me find you. Come in. The joint ain't over. But I've got to get in. I must see Miss Daniels. Now, look, Mr. DeWitt. Chances are Josie ain't in there either, and the club ain't open yet. Nobody comes in until after I open up. Now, well, what do you want? I beg your pardon. My name is Philo Vance. What about it? What do you want? Same as this gentleman, apparently. I want to see Miss Daniels. Now, look, both of you. I just got here myself to open up this joint. Chances are Josie ain't in yet yet. Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. That's her. That's Josie singing. I recognize her voice, and I'm getting in to see Josie now, and nothing's going to stop me. So get out of my way. Get out. Get out. Don't get, get out, out of my way. way. I said, and stay out. I'm going inside, I said. And I said you weren't. Now don't get, get out, out of my way, I said. Get away. Okay, get away. That's me. the way you want it. No. No. Well, he, he begged for that sock, Vance. You seen him try to force his way into my club? I'm more interested in his condition at the moment. You seem to have knocked him out. We'd better get him inside. Now, we'd better get him to a hospital. My car's right here, Vance. I'll go with you. Very well. I'll take his head. You said this was your club. That means you own it? Yeah. The name's Turner. Joe Turner. Yeah. Think this guy's okay, Vance? Oh, I think he will be. Oh, I hope so. You know, something if this happened inside my club... If I sucked him inside the joint, they could take away my license. Mr. Turner, if Mr. DeWitt were inside your club, there'd have been no reason for him to provoke a fight with you. Remember? Philo Vance speaking. This is Markham Vance. Where have you been? I've been calling you home for an hour. You sound like you're after me for a murder, Markham. Sorry, Vance, I didn't mean to give you that district attorney treatment, but I did want to talk to you. About what? There has been a murder, Vance. A nightclub singer named Josie Daniels, known as the Broadway Butterfly. She was strangled sometime between 8 and 10 this evening. We're not exactly sure of the time. I'm reasonably sure of it. I'd say it was between 9 and 10. What? Sorry, Markham, I didn't mean to appear like a genius, but it so happens I was down to see Miss Daniels at 9 o'clock tonight and heard her singing. Oh, I see. Well, Vance, I know you like to get on a murder case as soon as it happens, so I've been trying to contact you. And, incidentally, we have a suspect, Joe Turner, the club owner. Really? I met the gentleman tonight, Markham. In fact, I spent about an hour and a half with him. The hour and a half between 9 and 10.30. 9 and 10.30? And you heard Miss Daniels sing when you were down at the club at 9? Yes. But I was wrong. We don't have a suspect. No, unless Mr. Turner's a very clever man. How do we find that out? I'm not sure. I've got to pay a visit to a music shop to know whether I know what I'm talking about or not. Hiya, friend. Hiya, hiya. Come in, come in, come in. What can I do for you, friend? My name is Vance. I've just telephoned a number of record companies, and they told me that That we you... got the largest selection of records in the business, and they were right, friend. They were absolutely right. You want hot records? Well... We got them gone all the way back to Bunny Berrigan, Eddie Lang, the Mound City Blue Blowers, the Memphis Five, the original Dixieland Jazz Band. I wasn't thinking of hot records. You want I wanted. Sweet. We got every sweet band from 1920 up to now with the Bar Harbor Society Orchestra, Ray Miller, Whiteman, Lopez, Coon Sanders. What we... I wanted was a vocal record. Vocals, One by... take Take your pick, friend. Take your pick. You remember Lee Morse? We yes, had all of hers. Eileen Stanley, Lee Wiley, Helen Kane, the first of the Ethel Waters records. What's on your mind, friend? Which one do you want? Well, I was told that a girl named Josie Daniels made some recordings a year or so ago and that this was the one shop which might have some. Daniels? Josie Daniels, the gal who got knocked off? That's why, right. sure, we got records of hers. She only made two sides of one record, but we got it in stock. She made a thing called Stormy Weather, right, friend? Yes, I believe that's right. Got it in the back, friend. I got to get it for you. Don't get much call for the record. Now, look, if you want jazz, we got no, Artie I... Shaw, Mr. B.G., got some original Dorsey Brothers, anything you like. All I want is one record, if you don't mind. Okay, friend, if that's all you want, that's all you get. We don't high-pressure nobody into buying nothing around here. I'll get you the Josie Daniels record, friend. Thank Only you. I'm telling you, it ain't much good. And from what I understand, neither was she. <laughs> A 
Uh, sit down, Vance. Please sit down and tell me what you found out on the Josie Daniels murder. I found out for one thing, Markham, that it's possible she did die at 8 o'clock and not necessarily after 9, as I said. I don't think I understand. Well, it might have been a phonograph record I heard playing outside the club the night she was murdered. She did make a record of the song I heard sung while I was outside at 9 o'clock. Oh? What that means, of course, is that the club owner, Joe Turner, no longer has an alibi. And for that matter, neither does Mr. Colton DeWitt, whom Turner knocked out in front of the club. Because chances are the girl was already dead when the fight took place. That's right. Uh Uh-huh. And you know, Markham, I have... Oh, uh, just a minute, please, Vance. District Attorney Markham speaking. Mr. Markham, this is a friend of Philo Vance's. They told me at his office that I could reach him at yours. Is he there? Why, yes, just a minute. For you, Vance, a mysterious female friend of yours. Every female is mysterious, Markham, or so they'd like you to believe. (laughs) (laughs) I'll take it. Thanks. (laughs) Hello? Mr. Vance, this is Mrs. DeWitt. I didn't want to tell the district attorney my name. Can he hear us? I doubt whether he can hear you. Good. Mr. Vance, this is terribly important. Of course, I know the Daniels girl is dead. It's all over the papers. But I want to know whether you got those letters. No, I haven't, as yet. They mustn't turn up now, Mr. Vance. They mustn't. I'll double the figure I told you. I'll pay $20,000 for the letters my husband wrote that woman. Will you, Mrs. DeWitt? I'm sorry you said that. Sorry? Why? Because it proves to me that you must have seen Miss Daniels after you saw me which means just before she was murdered. This is District Attorney Markham. The Butterfly Murder Case opened with the finding of the body of Josie Daniels, nightclub singer known as the Broadway Butterfly. Final Vance, who is working on the case, has revealed that a Mrs. DeWitt, wife of a man Miss Daniels was blackmailing, had been to see him. And while he was in my office, he had received a phone call from her telling him that she would pay $20,000 for the return of letters her husband had written. It is shortly after the phone call, and Vance is still in my office, but has been silent for several weeks. What are you thinking about, Vance? This case. Yes, yeah, so am I. I'm also thinking of that remark you made to Mrs. DeWitt on the telephone. You want to know how I knew she'd seen the murdered girl just before her death? Yes. Well, Margaret, it's pretty simple. You see, Mrs. DeWitt came to me and offered me $10,000 to get back some letters her husband had written Josie Daniels. Yes, you told me that. At the time, Mrs. DeWitt showed me her bank book. 10000 was all the money she had in the world. On the phone just now, she offered me $20,000. Well, she managed to get the extra $10,000 somewhere. No, I hardly think so. I think she got the letters she wanted to pay me to get. She could then offer me twenty, thirty, or even fifty thousand to get them, knowing they weren't to be gotten. Uh. <laughs> Vance, you have no idea how glad I am that you're on our side. What's our next move? The normal thing to do would be for me to see Mrs. DeWitt, don't you think? Yes, but I doubt whether you're going to do it because it is the normal thing. Thank you. You're so right. You see, I know what I want to know about her, but I'm a little vague about her husband. He's the one I want to see, and he's the one I'm going to see. You, you don't want to see me, Mr. Vance? Not especially, Mrs. DeWitt. What I would like to know is this. Is your husband at home? He's upstairs. Shall I call him? No, he'll be down. May I use your phonograph to play this record I brought? Of course. Only I don't understand. You will, believe me. Uh, how does this machine work? The last button on the right-hand side starts the phonograph. Oh, yes, of course. Well, here we are. a nice voice, isn't it, Mr. Vance? Very. By the way, Mrs. DeWitt, what did you do with the letters you took from Josie Daniels just before she was found dead? Oh, I, I made a mistake in offering you the $20,000. I knew it right after I'd done it, but I wanted to cover up the fact that I'd seen I realize that. That but wasn't very smart. That record! Who put that record on? Who put it on? Colton! I never want to hear that voice again! Never! never. All right, now, what is this? What kind of game are you two playing? Mr. Colton, Mr. Vance just asked if he could I play... I know what he asked, and I know why he asked it. That was Josie Daniels' voice. That was Josie singing. I was supposed to hear the voice and confess I killed her. That was it, wasn't it, Vance? That's what you expected me to do. Really, Mr. Well, Vance. I'm not going to do it. 
she's dead and this record is smashed, I'll smash every record she ever made. I'll buy them and I'll smash them. Every one of them. Oh, yes, I'll smash every dear. one of them. Please, please, you're upset. You're all excited. Excited? Of course I'm excited. This was a trick, I tell you. A trick of fancies to make me break down and admit I killed her. I wanted to. I would have if I'd had the chance, but I didn't do it. You hear me, Vance? Your trick didn't work. I didn't do it. Hear me? I didn't do it. I hear you all right, Mr. Wade. I didn't do it. But that doesn't necessarily mean I believe you. Hiya, friend. Hiya, hiya. I remember you. You were in yesterday to pick up a Josie Daniels recording. That's right. Sure, sure, I know. I got a great memory for faces. Yes. How do you want something else like the record player now? That's Hank Byrne. Best seller we got the piano. Of course we got Frankie Carl, Lopez, that Lombardo record of humorous with the two piano team going. If you what you want is piano we Well, can... it isn't exactly what no? I really want. I know, I know. Sure. Long hair stuff. Good, good. That's just what you want. Boston Pops, Bill Monica, got the Eterby record of Claire de Lune, right? That's what you want, ain't it, friend? Classic? No, no, not right at the moment. Uh, you mentioned before that you had a good memory. <laughs> I got a great memory. I can rattle off names of people who made records that you never even heard of. I'm sure. Bessie Smith, Queen of the Blues, Empire City Four, Billy Wilson, and his Blue Five. Excuse this... my interrupting you, please, but I really have business with you. Did you ever hear of Philo Vance? Who'd he record for? Nobody. Oh, I'm Philo Vance. I'm a private investigator. Philo Vance? Why, I know who you are. You're the private investigator. Yes. Glad to meet you, friend. Glad to meet you. Now, what can I do for you? You remember I told you yesterday that the company for which Josie Daniels recorded said that this was the only shop where her records could be bought. <laughs> sure, they were right. We got records by everybody. George... Never mind. I'm sure you have. Now, this is what I want to know. You say you have an excellent memory. I want you to tell me if anybody bought a record by Miss Daniels in the past few days besides me. Why, sure, sure, I can tell you that. Now, let me think. By all means, do. Let's see. He was, uh... Oh, was it the lady? I think maybe... No? Oh, that's... That's a funny thing, Mr. Vance. I can't remember. Sorry I can't help you solve your problem, friend. Problem? What you didn't help me solve was a murder, friend. <laughs> Yeah, who is it? Uh, Mr. Turner, boss, it's me. Angel, your head waiter. Could I come in? Come on. What do you want? Uh, Mr. Turner, boss, I just came in to tell you I'm leaving. I got another job. No kidding. No kidding, Mr. Turner, boss. I got a good job in another joint. I'm leaving Saturday. What makes you think so? I don't know. God just offered me a job and it took it, that's all. You're not going anywhere. You're staying right here with me where I can keep an eye on you, Angel. I don't get you, Mr. Turner, boss. No? Well, maybe you'll get this. Don't think I don't know you were around here the night Josie Daniels was killed. Don't think I'm going to let you go somewhere where you can open your yap about what you think you know. Don't think that, Angel, you hear? Yeah, Mr. Turner, boss. I guess I'd better go now. And where do you think you're going? Out into the club. I gotta get things fixed up for tonight's business. See if everything's okay as long as I'm gonna be here permanent. I'll see you later, Mr. Turner, boss. <laughs> yeah, Joe Turner talking. This is District Attorney Markham, Mr. Turner. Could you come down to my office? Well, sure, DA. I guess I could. What's up? Well, Philo Vance will be here, and he's bringing Mr. and Mrs. DeWitt. You want to know what's up? Yeah. It might conceivably be your number. Sit down, Mr. Turner, sit down. You know Mr. Vance here? Uh, just enough to say goodbye to what goes on here. What'd you get me down here for, Vance? Mr. Turner, what did Josie Daniels have on you? Have on me? Nothing. She worked for me, that's all. I spoke to your head waiter, a man named Angel, right after I left a record shop this afternoon. He told me you couldn't fire her, that she could have stayed there as long as she liked. Angel told you that... No wonder that punk wanted to quit. Well, Vance, whatever he told you ain't true. My word against his, right? I hardly think so. He'd have no reason to lie. Mr. Turner, when I came along the other night, the night Miss Daniels was killed, you were keeping Mr. DeWitt out of your nightclub. Yeah, sure. Josie was rehearsing and the club wasn't open. Josie wasn't rehearsing. She was dead. Don't give me that. You know she was in there. Then you heard her start to sing after a while. I heard a record playing. But more of that later. Markham, please ask Mr. and Mrs. DeWitt to come in here now. Certainly, Vance. 
Mr. and Mrs. DeWitt, will you come in? Yes, of course. Thank you, Markham. Mr. DeWitt, I was just pointing out to Mr. Turner here that the night Josie Daniels was killed, the night I found you trying to get into his nightclub, we didn't hear Miss Daniels singing. Well, but we did. She was inside the club. That was a phonograph record planted as an alibi. You see, if Miss Daniels were alive then, Turner couldn't have murdered her. Or you either, for that matter. Vance, there was no record playing when the police broke into the club. I know. Somebody took the record off. And DeWitt and Turner were with me. That leaves only Mrs. DeWitt. No. Uh, no, I know nothing about it. One moment, Mrs. DeWitt. Angel. Yes, sir, Mr. Vance? Come in. Yes, sir, Mr. Vance? Angel, you were paid by somebody in this room to put a record on the phonograph in the Cat's Paw nightclub at 9 o'clock the night Josie Daniels was murdered and to later take it off. That's right, Mr. Vance. I want you to point out the person in this room who paid you. The person? Why, sure. That's the person. <laughs> yes, Mrs. DeWitt. Markham, you can arrest her husband, Colton DeWitt, for murder. <laughs> Daniel's dead when you went in her dressing room and got those letters? Yes. Yes, she was, Mr. Vance. But I had no idea my husband killed her. I couldn't admit I was there. You understand, Ben. Perfectly. Well, Markham, that clears up Mrs. DeWitt's part in the murder case. Anything else you'd like to know? Yes. What was your lead to Colton DeWitt? The phonograph record, of course. DeWitt had to get that record somewhere. And there was only one store in the city that sold it. I went there, but the clerk wouldn't describe a man who had purchased a recording by Miss Daniels several days before. Then how did you know it was DeWitt? I knew somebody had to start playing the record inside the club, Markham. Somebody had to start it, and somebody had to take it off the phonograph. I found Mr. Turner's head waiter, Angel, and persuaded him to tell me who had paid him to do that. It was DeWitt, who killed Josie in her dressing room, and then came out to the front of the club to establish an alibi. Oh, my poor husband. He should have known that Josie Daniels would cause him trouble. Right from the beginning, he should have known. Perhaps. Only we weren't concerned with the beginning. All we were concerned with was the end of the butterfly murder case. no good. Everybody knows he's no good. I don't need a nursemaid, and if I did, it wouldn't be you. Laura, don't you see? I happen to like Eddie Mills. I like him very much, and I'm going to see him as much and as often as I want to, and I'm telling you right now, that's going to be an awful lot. Laura, be reasonable. Reasonable? (laughs) What makes you think you're reasonable? What right have you to dictate to me? John, I've got to look out for myself. All right, you love me, so you say. I do. Laura, listen. All right, all right, you love me, you want to marry me. 
How much do you make as a chemist? Three thousand a year, but I've been promised... Three thousand a year, but you've been promised a raise. Well, that's fine. That's great. Eddie Mills makes three thousand a month. But he isn't for you, Laura. Can I make you see that? Don't you realize he... Oh, stop the lecture for a minute. Hello? Hi. This is Eddie. Oh, Eddie. Hello, honey. What's going on that I should know about, Laurie? I can't tell you. It'll... Well, it'll flatter you too much. Take a chance. Come on, tell me. Mm-mm. Can't. Somebody there? That's right. That jealous boyfriend of yours? <laughs> the first part's right. But you've taken over the second part. Well, thanks. Say, so what's he look like, this chemistry genius? <laughs> I'll tell you when I see you. He uh, wanted to know the same thing about you. Get off that phone. Maybe I can meet him someday. Oh, shut up, John. Um, I'll see you later, Eddie, and I'll talk to you then. Okay? Sure, sure, baby. Anything you say. I'll be over the usual time. Bye. Bye. Laura, listen. Oh. I don't want to fight with you. All I want to do is show you how wrong you are about Eddie Mills. Yeah. He's not serious. You're just another girl in his life. You think so? Of course. He'll throw you over as soon as a new girl comes along. I don't believe it. But he better not. He knows what's good for him. He better not. If you know what's good for you, you'll stay out of my affairs. I'm not interested in what's good for me. I only care about what's good for you, and it's not Eddie Mills. And I'm going to do something about it. job, I get paid, and I get things done. That's why I sent for you. I want something done. But I want it done carefully. If I wasn't careful, Mr. Mills, I'd be in jail long ago. I'm careful, I'm quick, and I'm expensive. How much? How much is it worth you? Let's not go into that kind of routine. How much do you want to do a big job for me? How important is the guy? Very important. The guy is me. You want me to kill you? No, not exactly. I want you to see that nobody else does. I got a lot of enemies. I'm hiring you as a bodyguard. Oh, I get it now. I'm to be with you all the time. Huh? That's right. Except for the times when I'm out for a social evening. Like tonight when I'm going to see a girlfriend of mine named Laura Waite. Okay. You got a deal, Mr. Mills. Only when you're fooling around with dames, that's the time you need a bodyguard most. Evening to you, Tony. Good evening. Are you worth it, Pat? You want to turn into crank and this all going to mine for a while? Uh-huh, no. No, thank you. I've got my own job to do, Tony. The only difference between you and me is that your arm gets tired and my legs get tired from standing out in front of this apartment house. You keep them busy tonight, Pat? Ah. Uh, don't think I'd call three taxis for people all night. 200 apartments in this building, but very few people going in or out this evening. Uh, it looks like it's going to be a mean night, Tony. Hey, the stormers are coming up, Pat. You hear that? Yeah. The stormers are coming up as sure as I'm talking to you. That's uh, more than a summer storm that's giving me this creepy feeling, Tony. It's like something closing in on the street. So hot and close. That's all right. Can't tell exactly what it is. Well, I wouldn't worry about it too much, Pat. I guess I just uh, waited this uh, hidey gritty man down at the block a little. Uh, see you on the way back. Uh, see you later, Tony. Oh, evening, sir. 
Get your cab? Not right now. Whew. Close out tonight, isn't it? Uh, it is that. Say, uh, you're Mr. Mills, aren't you? That's right. You got a good memory. Sure, sure. I've I've seen you call on Miss Waite lots of times. <laughs> I always remember names and faces. How is Miss Waite? Haven't seen her tonight. Uh, she was all right when I left her just now. Go smoke a cigar. You got a match? Sure. Uh, right. uh, never mind. I got some of my own. Pretty sure I have. I forgot for a minute. You know, the funny thing about tonight, Tony, that, that's the fellow with the hoardy... Oh! Get a doctor! Somebody get a doctor! Help! I've been shot! I... Uh, Ready to continue with the notes on the butterfly murder case? Not at the moment. I've been asked to write a paper on trapping criminals from the private investigator's viewpoint. Think I ought to do it? I don't know why not. Good publicity. Perhaps. But in citing case histories, I might give someone with a criminal mind a good idea of what to avoid if he wants to get away with murder. Hmm. That sounds logical, Van. On the <laughs> other hand, if I point out how the most carefully planned crimes have been exploded by deduction and reasoning, it might serve as a warning. Look, man, stop twitching logic on me. You're making it impossible for me to agree with you. <laughs> I'm sorry, Miss Deering. However, I didn't hire you as my secretary assistant to agree with me. I rather thought... <laughs> well, hello, Markham. Come on in. Hi, Mr. Markham. Right, you're in, Vance. Hello, Miss Deering. How are you? Fine, I think. I'll have to ask Vance to make sure. How am I, Mr. Vance? You are excellent. I am excellent. <laughs> good, good. <laughs> Vance, may I talk to you for a moment? I don't have much time. District attorneys are always in a hurry. What's on your mind, Markham? A murder, Vance, a mysterious murder. A gangster named Eddie Mills was killed last night. The story will be in the afternoon papers. Let me have it now. I'd rather listen than read. All right. He was coming out of the Darling Apartments. It was a dark night, you remember, and as I understand it, the street lights were out. Lightning had hit the power. Well? Mills came out, spoke to the doorman a moment, lit a match to apply it to his cigar, and a shot rang out from somewhere and killed him. I see. The light from the match showed Mill's face and the killer shot. That's the normal explanation of what happened then. But our police experts have figured that the killer stood far down the block, too far for him to recognize Mill's features. Oh? Well, then there's the possibility that Mills was killed by mistake. That's rather a remote possibility. Too many people wanted him dead. In addition to his underworld enemies, we happen to know that he was seeing a girl named Laura Waite, much to the displeasure of her boyfriend, Johnny Martin. As I understand it, there was no way for the killer to know it was Eddie Mills that was lighting his cigar. None whatsoever. Unless the doorman signaled somebody. The doorman was standing next to Mills when he was shot. You can forget that. The doorman wouldn't be fool enough to risk being hit by a bullet that you say was fired from down the block. If he had identified, or rather put the finger on Mills, he'd have gone inside the lobby or out of range in any event. Yeah, well, that's true, of course, now that you mention it. Uh, one other angle, Vance. And then I'm through with information. A hurdy-gurdy man had just passed the apartment door and was standing down the street a bit when the shot was fired. You have a description of him? They have down at headquarters, but I was in such a hurry to come over here, I just glanced at him. About 45, dark, and his name is Tony. Well, that will do with the start of Markham. Thanks for letting me in on the case. Oh, Miss Deering. Uh, yes, Mr. Vance. I'm going out. Have you anything to do while I'm gone? That all depends. How long will you be gone? Until I find the killer in the hurdy-gurdy murder case. <laughs> Look at that cute little monkey the organ grinder has. Wait a minute, I want to drop a coin in his cup. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, look, look, Bill. Look at the way the cute little monkey lifts his cap. I'm going to give him another job. You would have <laughs>
Look, Miss Wade, I've come to your apartment because I'm convinced you can help us. There have been two murders in the last 24 hours, and you are the key to both of them. I'm sorry, Mr. Markham. I know Eddie Milt had a lot of enemies, but that poor organ grinder. I've never seen him, and I don't know why anybody should have wanted to kill him. Let's get down to cases. Maybe we can get something that way. Are you quarreled with your friend Johnny Martin about Eddie Mills? That's right. Yes. We're looking for Martin now, but I want to establish one fact first. Did Martin know what Mills looked like? No, they'd never seen each other. Johnny asked me for a description of Eddie, but, but I wouldn't give it to him. You wouldn't tell him what Mills looked like because you were afraid of what Johnny Martin might do? Yes. Ah. Johnny insisted that Eddie was no good for me, and how right he was. Uh, what do you mean? Eddie Milk came to see me the night he was murdered to tell me that he couldn't see me for a while. That he was going to be too busy. Oh. Mm-hmm. Um, is there a back exit to this apartment? Yes. Yes, there is. It's through the kitchen. And you might have gone out the back way, slipped down the stairs, and... Oh, hello, Vance. Hello, Markham. And this is Miss Laura Waite, I imagine. That's right. I'm Philo Vance, Miss Waite. Uh-huh. I heard your voice in here, Markham, so I came right in. It's all right, Vance. It's all right. While the police are looking for John Martin, I decided to question Miss Waite again. Only to find she claims to know nothing about the murder of either Eddie Mills or the hurdy-gurdy man so far. I'm inclined to believe that when we pick up Martin, we'll start getting some results. Perhaps. But I'll tell you where Martin is right now if you want to know. Want to know? Of course I want to know. Where is he? At headquarters. Oh? I was at headquarters in the fingerprint department when they brought Martin in. I guess they didn't know where to reach you. Well, that's a relief. I was afraid for a moment that was going to be another of your long-range predictions. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, no, Martin. As I understand it, they picked Martin up as he was leaving his chemistry shop. I was more interested in whether any fingerprints were found on the knife that killed Tony, the organ grinder. Don't tell me there were. Uh, were there, Mr. Vance? No. But that may mean something just the same. Right now, I'd like to know this. Granted that Eddie Mills was not shot by mistake, how could a killer know it was he who stood outside this apartment building? He uh, might have had a description of Mills. It would do no good at the distance the killer stood when he fired. No, it was something else. When I find what that something else is, I'll know better what my next step is. Uh, What interests me is why the organ grinder was killed. Anyone could have done it. There was a crowd around him, and anyone could have slipped a knife into him without being seen. But why? Why kill the organ grinder? That seems quite simple on the surface, Markham. He was on the street when the killer fired the shot that murdered Eddie Mills. The organ grinder was removed because the killer believed the organ grinder had seen him. But that's impossible, Vance. Is it? I don't see how. The organ grinder couldn't possibly have seen the murderer the night before. Because the night was black and the street lights were out? No, Vance. Because the hurdy-gurdy man was totally blind. This is District Attorney Markham. The hurdy-gurdy murder case opened with the shooting of Eddie Mills, racket chief. Mills, we have learned, had incurred the enmity of Johnny Martin, sweetheart of Laura Waite, when he took Laura away from Johnny. But then, according to Laura herself, decided he'd be too busy to see her for a while. Mills was killed from a distance on a dark street on a dark night, just as he attempted to light a cigar. And an organ grinder on the same street was murdered the next day. I have left Vance with Laura Waite while I've gone to investigate a report that a hired killer was gunning for Mills. What am I supposed to do, Van? Break down and confess just because you sit there staring at me? No. Mm-hmm. And although I'd like to compliment you, Miss Waite, I wasn't staring at you. I was thinking... Oh, you would like to compliment me, though. Hmm? Well, that's something. I imagine there's quite a good deal, I could say. Your color scheme, for one thing, very admirable. Oh? You like green? When it isn't overdone. Excellent contrast to your black hair, Miss Waite. I don't think you'd notice anything personal about me. Please, Miss Waite, let's understand something. I was a man long before I was a private investigator. (laughs) You're very attractive. That's funny. You know, I was thinking the same thing about you. Maybe uh, you and I ought to do something about that, Vance. Any suggestions? What's on your mind, Vance? Right at the moment, 
my mind is being completely uncomplimentary. Oh? It wants to know whether you knew the organ grinder who was murdered. No, I never saw him in my life. I, um, liked the subject we were discussing much better than the new one, then. Couldn't we just... Oh. Johnny. Johnny, I thought you were at police headquarters. I'm out on bail. I had nothing to hold me on. I came straight here, Laura. Oh, this is Mr. Philo Vance, Johnny. John Martin, Philo Vance. How do you do? Oh, I... You're quite tall, Miss Waite. I've been meaning to comment on that. How tall are you? Oh, um, five ten. Almost as tall as Johnny. Hmm, he's about six two, I imagine. And I also imagine you'd like to know what that has to do with the solution of the hurdy-gurdy murder case. That's not our business. It's yours and the police's. Tony the organ grinder was a big man, too. I should say he was at least six feet tall. Well, what about it? Nothing. Nothing right at the moment. Miss Wade, I have to apologize again for this mind of mine. It goes off on tangents with little or no provocation. <laughs> Anytime it goes off on a tangent that includes me, Mr. Van, come back. I'll, uh... Be delighted to see you. Well, Vance, we got one break on this case anyhow. That's the reason I phoned for you to come right down here. What happened, Markham? You know that Eddie Mills had a lot of enemies, underworld enemies. In fact, he'd been threatened, we understand. Now, we've picked up a high-net killer named Joe Egan, and we're holding him inside. Really? How tall is this Egan? Oh, I don't know. Five foot at five or so. Well, in that case, I don't believe he had anything to do with our murders, Markham. I don't understand. I'm positive that whoever killed Eddie Mills killed the organ grinder. A knife was used on the organ grinder. It was found slanted downward, high on his back, between the shoulder blades. You think only a tall person could have stabbed him? Uh, suppose he was bending over. Ever see the handle on a hurdy-gurdy, Markham? It's placed so that the right hand can turn it when the operator is in an upright position. No, Tony wasn't bending over when he was stabbed. Uh, tell me one thing, and I'll wait until you're ready to explain the rest. Why was Tony murdered? Because the murderer didn't know he was blind. The killer thought Tony might have seen the shooting of Eddie Mills. That's what I thought, but I just wanted to make sure. Well, what's our next move, Vance? I'll tell you what I want you to do, Markham. As soon as it gets dark, meet me in front of Laura Waite's apartment house. You'd rather I didn't ask why, of course. Not at all. I'm going to prove something to you. I'm going to prove how a murderer recognized Eddie Mills when he couldn't possibly see his face. <laughs> Uh, Johnny, you busy in the laboratory? A little bit. Why? A fellow named Father Vance out here. He wants to see him. Oh, let him come in. Thanks. You can go in, Mr. Vance. Thank you very much. Hello, Mr. Martin. Vance? Tracking down the wild chemist in his native haunts? Something like that. Quite a laboratory you have here. It belongs to the firm. I only work here. How can I help you? I want you to check some facts. Are you familiar with salt of barium nitrate? Reasonably. Why? What would happen if it were placed in combination with red phosphorus, SB2, S3, and a combustible like potassium chloride? You're a clever man, Van. What can you prove now that you know? Nothing yet, Mr. Martin. But you said I was a clever man. So you wouldn't want to wager I won't be able to prove it, would you? <laughs> Sir, Mr. Markham, I've been at the door here all evening like always, and I ain't seen a sign of Mr. Van. That's odd, Pat. He said he'd see me here as soon as it got dark, and that's been over a half hour. I guess he'll be along soon, though. I guess so. Yeah. Ever get bored standing here at night, Pat? Oh, sometimes. Sometimes some of the tenants come along and we talk. Sometimes visitors stop to chat a while. Tony, the hurdy-gurdy man, he and I used to talk quite a bit evening. Ah, uh, he sure was a nice fella. Favorite around here? No, oh, with everybody that knew him. Take that Miss Laura Wade's boyfriend. Uh, what's his name? You that... mean John Martin? Ah, oh, that's the fellow. Yes. He used to talk to Tony a couple of minutes every time he saw him. But I sure hope you find out who killed Tony, Mr. Martin. I... Hey, there's a cab stopping out front. I'll go open the door. That's Vance and his secretary, Mr. Jerry. Oh, Vance. Hello, Marker. Finally got here, eh? Sorry I'm late. Hi, Mr. Markham. We're both sorry. All right. I had to see John Martin at his laboratory and then go back to my apartment to do some elementary chemistry. Miss Deering will demonstrate. Now? That's right. You go up to the doorway of the Darling Apartments. Yes. Stand there, wait 50 seconds, and then do as I told you. Right, Dad. Now, Markham, come with me, and we'll take care of the elementary part of the hurdy-gurdy murder case. All right. In other words, I'll show you how a killer recognized Eddie Mills without seeing him. <laughs> 
I have the street lights out, just as you asked. So I noticed. The situation is the same as it was the murder night. We're walking to approximately the same spot where the police experts believe the murderer stood. Yes, it's not much further down the street. I know. As soon as we get there, we're both going to watch the doorway where Miss Deering is standing. Although we can't see her now because of the darkness. Yes, I know. Oh, Vance, Pat, the doorman was telling me what a favorite the dead organ grinder was with everybody, including John Martin. Really? That's very interesting. Well, now, let's see. This is about the spot where Eddie Mills' killer must have stood. Uh... I'd say so, yes. And it's just about 50 seconds since Miss Deering walked through the door. Watch, Martin. All right, but I don't see... Vance, a match was just struck at the doorway. Notice anything peculiar about it? Yes, it, it burned with a green flame. What is that? That is the way the killer knew it was Eddie Mills who stood outside the doorway, Markham. That green flame. I only want to know one more thing before I turn our murderer over to you. Just one more thing. And Joe Egan, the hired gunman, can tell me that. Let's go see him. Questions, questions. All I have is questions. Five hours now, and cops just ask me questions. They get the same answers to the same questions, but they ask them over and over again. And you're no better than them, Mark. How, oh, Joe? You ask the same ones they did. Maybe I'll ask some different ones. Yeah, you're no better than the cops, man. You and your reputation. Joe, Mr. Markham has your record. You're wanted in three different cities. So? You're going to be sent back to one of them. All I'm asking is this. Were you ever in Miss Waite's apartment? That I'll answer. No. I never was, and that's no kidding. That's what I thought. Now, Markham, one more visit to the girl's apartment, and you can have your killer. And the proof you'll need for a conviction. <laughs> Wait, you quarreled with Eddie Mills, didn't you? What if I did, Van? Just asking in passing, that's all. Oh. And you, Mr. Martin, you had strong reason for disliking Mills. Well, all right, go on. Don't be belligerent, Mr. Martin. I'm merely being factual. I'm making no accusations. Yet. I want to describe why and how Tony, the hurdy-gurdy man, was killed. And in so doing, prove who our double murderer is. Go on, Matt. Well, Tony was a tall man, about six foot. Yet a knife was plunged high in his back between the shoulder blades. You're tall, Mr. Martin. Six two, you once told me. That's right. You were a chemist. You knew you had mixed a curious combination of combustibles for the matches in Miss Waite's apartment. You knew they burned with a green flame so that it would flatter her coloring. She probably asked you to do that. Well, what if I did? What does that prove? Nothing, except that anybody using those matches outside of this apartment would reveal himself as having been inside this apartment. In order to get the match, of course. Exactly, Markham. Yes. When Eddie Mills lit a match outside the door downstairs, the killer saw the green flame and fired. Then, lest the organ grinder had seen the shooting, it was necessary to dispose of him the next day. But the organ grinder couldn't have seen the shooting. He was blind. We found that out after the murders, Markham. And so did the murderer. That's why our killer has to be Miss Laura Waite. I'm not as puzzled as I generally am when you wind up a case, Vance, because I went through most of it with you, but there are some things I'd like to know. What, for instance? Well, I realized that Laura Waite was the only person concerned in the murders who didn't know Tony was blind. That's what you said. But don't forget that Joe Egan, the hired killer, couldn't have known that either. Egan had never been in Miss Waite's apartment. I believed him when he told me that. If he'd never been there, he couldn't have known about the green flame on the matches, could he? In fact, the only other person who could have known about the matches was John Martin. And, of course, it was I who told you that Martin used to talk to the organ grinder the night he came to visit Miss Waite, so he knew Tony was blind. You helped me a great deal with that information, Markham. All the facts pointed to one big fact, that the killer was Laura Waite, who was tall enough and strong enough to have put the knife in Tony's back. Yes, her confession proves you were right, Vance. She's reached the end of her murdering string now. She's reached the end of her string, and we've reached the end of the hurdy-gurdy murder case. (laughs) 